How this book can work miracles in your life. I have seen miracles happen to men and women in all walks of life all over the world. Miracles will happen to you, too, when you begin using the magic power of your subconscious mind. This book is designed to teach you that your habitual thinking and imagery mold, fashion, and create your destiny. For as a man thinketh in his subconscious mind, so is he. Do you know the answers? Why is one man sad and another man happy? Why is one man joyous and prosperous and another man poor and miserable? Why is one man fearful and anxious and another full of faith and confidence? Why does one man have a beautiful, luxurious home while another man lives out a meager existence in a slum? Why is one man a great success and another an abject failure? Why is one speaker outstanding and immensely popular and another mediocre and unpopular? Why is one man a genius in his work or profession while the other man toils and moils all his life without doing or accomplishing anything worthwhile? Why is one man healed of a so-called incurable disease and another isn't? Why is it so many good, kind, religious people suffer the tortures of the damned in their mind and body? Why is it many immoral and irreligious people succeed and prosper and enjoy radiant health? Why is one woman happily married and her sister very unhappy and frustrated? Is there an answer to these questions in the workings of your conscious and subconscious minds? There most certainly is. Reason for writing this book. It is for the express purpose of answering and clarifying the above questions and many others of a similar nature that motivated me to write this book. I have endeavored to explain the great fundamental truths of your mind in the simplest language possible. I believe that it is perfectly possible to explain the basic, foundational, and fundamental laws of life and of your mind in ordinary, everyday language. You will find that the language of this book is that used in your daily papers, current periodicals, in your business offices, in your home, and in the daily workshop. I urge you to study this book and apply the techniques outlined therein. And as you do, I feel absolutely convinced that you will lay hold of a miracle working power that will lift you up from confusion, misery, melancholy, and failure, and guide you to your true place, solve your difficulties, sever you from emotional and physical bondage, and place you on the royal road to freedom, happiness, and peace of mind. This miracle working power of your subconscious mind can heal you of your sickness, make you vital and strong again. In learning how to use your inner powers, you will open the prison door of fear and enter into a life described by Paul as the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Releasing the Miracle Working Power A personal healing will ever be the most convincing evidence of our subconscious powers. Over 42 years ago, I resolved a malignancy. In medical terminology, it was called sarcoma. By using the healing power of my subconscious mind, which created me and still maintains and governs all my vital functions. The technique I applied is elaborated on in this book, and I feel sure that it will help others to trust the same infinite healing presence lodged in the subconscious depths of all men. Through the kindly offices of my doctor friend, I suddenly realized that it was natural to assume that the creative intelligence which made all my organs, fashioned my body, and started my heart could heal its own handiwork. The ancient proverb says, the doctor dresses the wound and God heals it. Wonders happen when you pray effectively. Scientific prayer is the harmonious interaction of the conscious and subconscious levels of mind scientifically directed for a specific purpose. This book will teach you the scientific way to tap the realm of infinite power within you, enabling you to get what you really want in life. You desire a happier, fuller, and richer life. Begin to use this miracle working power and smooth your way in daily affairs, solve business problems, and bring harmony in family relationships. Be sure that you read this book several times. The many chapters will show you how this wonderful power works and how you can draw out the hidden inspiration and wisdom that is within you. Learn the simple techniques of impressing the subconscious mind. Follow the new scientific way in tapping the infinite storehouse. Read this book carefully, earnestly, and lovingly. Prove to yourself the amazing way it can help you. 
It could be, and I believe it will be, the turning point of your life. Everybody prays. Do you know how to pray effectively? How long is it since you prayed as part of your everyday activities? In an emergency, in time of danger or trouble, in illness, and when death lurks, prayers pour forth, your own and friends. Just read any daily newspaper. It is reported that prayers are being offered up all over the nation for a child stricken with a so-called incurable ailment, for peace among nations, for a group of miners trapped in a flooded mine. Later, it is reported that when rescued, the miner said that they prayed while waiting for rescue. An airplane pilot says that he prayed as he made a successful emergency landing. Certainly, prayer is an ever-present help in time of trouble. But you do not have to wait for trouble to make prayer an integral and constructive part of your life. The dramatic answers to prayer make headlines and are the subject of testimonies to the effectiveness of prayer. What of the many humble prayers of children? the simple thanksgiving of grace at the table daily, the faithful devotions wherein the individual seeks only communion with God. My work with people has made it necessary for me to study the various approaches to prayer. I have experienced the power of prayer in my own life, and I have talked and worked with many people who also have enjoyed the help of prayer. The problem usually is how to tell others how to pray. People who are in trouble have difficulty in thinking and acting reasonably. They need an easy formula to follow, an obvious working pattern that is simple and specific. Often they must be led to approach the emergency. Unique feature of this book. The unique feature of this book is its down-to-earth practicality. Here you are presented with simple, usable techniques and formulas which you can easily apply in your workaday world. I have taught these simple processes to men and women all over the world, and recently over a thousand men and women of all religious affiliations attended a special class in Los Angeles where I presented the highlights of what is offered in the pages of this book. Many came from distances of 200 miles for each class lesson. The special features of this book will appeal to you because they show you why oftentimes you get the opposite of what you prayed for and reveal to you the reasons why. People have asked me in all parts of the world and thousands of times, why is it I have prayed and prayed and got no answer? In this book, you will find the reasons for this common complaint. The many ways of impressing the subconscious mind and getting the right answers make this an extraordinarily valuable book and an ever-present help in time of trouble. What do you believe? It is not the thing believed in that which brings an answer to man's prayer. The answer to prayer results when the individual's subconscious mind responds to the mental picture or thought in his mind. This law of belief is operating in all religions of the world and is the reason why they are psychologically true. The Buddhist, the Christian, the Muslim, and the Hebrew all may get answers to their prayers, not because of the particular creed, religion, affiliation, ritual, ceremony, formula, liturgy, incantation, sacrifices, or offerings, but solely because of belief or mental acceptance and receptivity about that for which they pray. The law of life is the law of belief, and belief could be summed up briefly as a thought in your mind. As a man thinks, feels, and believes, so is the condition of his mind, body, and circumstances. A technique, a methodology based on an understanding of what you are doing and why you are doing it will help you bring about a subconscious embodiment of all the good things of life. Essentially, answered prayer is the realization of your heart's desire. Desire is prayer. Everyone desires health, happiness, security, peace of mind, true expression, but many fail to achieve clearly defined results. A university professor admitted to me recently, I know that if I changed my mental pattern and redirected my emotional life, my ulcers would not recur. But I do not have any technique, process, or modus operandi. My mind wanders back and forth on my many problems, and I feel frustrated, defeated, and unhappy. This professor had a desire for perfect health. He needed knowledge of the way his mind worked, which would enable him to fulfill his desire. By practicing the healing methods outlined in this book, he became whole and perfect. There is one mind common to all individual men, Emerson. The miracle working powers of your subconscious mind existed before you and I were born. 
before any church or world existed. The great eternal truths and principles of life antedate all religions. It is with these thoughts in mind that I urge you in the following chapters to lay hold of this wonderful, magical, transforming power, which will bind up mental and physical wounds, proclaim liberty to the fear-ridden mind, and liberate you completely from the limitations of poverty, failure, misery, lack, and frustration. All you have to do is unite mentally and emotionally with the good you wish to embody and the creative powers of your subconscious mind will respond accordingly. Begin now today. Let wonders happen in your life. Keep on, keeping on until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. Chapter 1 The Treasure House Within You Infinite riches are all around you if you will open your mental eyes and behold the treasure house of infinity within you. There is a gold mine within you from which you can extract everything you need to live life gloriously, joyously, and abundantly. Many are sound asleep because they do not know about this gold mine of infinite intelligence and boundless love within themselves. Whatever you want, you can draw forth. A magnetized piece of steel will lift about 12 times its own weight. And if you demagnetize this same piece of metal, it will not even lift a feather. Similarly, there are two types of men. There is the magnetized man who is full of confidence and faith. He knows that he is born to win and to succeed. Then there is the type of man who is demagnetized. He is full of fears and doubts. Opportunities come and he says, I might fail. I might lose my money. People will laugh at me. This type of man will not get very far in life because if he is afraid to go forward, he will simply stay where he is. Become a magnetized man and discover the master secret of the ages. The master secret of the ages. What, in your opinion, is the master secret of the ages? The secret of atomic energy, thermonuclear energy, the neutron bomb, interplanetary travel. No, not any of these. Then what is the master secret? Where can one find it and how can it be contacted and brought into action? The answer is extraordinarily simple. This secret is the marvelous, miracle working power found in your own subconscious mind. The last place that most people would seek it. The marvelous power of your subconscious. You can bring into your life more power, more wealth, more health, more happiness, and more joy by learning to contact and release the hidden power of your subconscious mind. You need not acquire this power. You already possess it. But you want to learn how to use it. You want to understand it so that you can apply it in all departments of your life. As you follow the simple techniques and processes set forth in this book, you can gain the necessary knowledge and understanding. A new light can inspire you, and you can generate a new force enabling you to realize your hopes and make all your dreams come true. Decide now to make your life grander, greater, richer, and nobler than ever before. Within your subconscious depths lie infinite wisdom, infinite power, and infinite supply of all that is necessary, which is waiting for development and expression. Begin now to recognize these potentialities of your deeper mind, and they will take form in the world without. The infinite intelligence within your subconscious mind can reveal to you everything you need to know at every moment of time and point of space provided you are open-minded and receptive. You can receive new thoughts and ideas enabling you to bring forth new inventions, make new discoveries, or write books and plays. Moreover, the infinite intelligence in your subconscious can impart to you wonderful kinds of knowledge of an ordinary nature. It can reveal to you and open the way for perfect expression and true place in your life. Through the wisdom of your subconscious mind, you can attract the ideal companion as well as the right business associate or partner. It can find the right buyer for your home and provide you with all the money you need and the financial freedom to be do and go as your heart desires. It is your right to discover this inner world of thought, feeling, and power, of light, love, and beauty. Though invisible, its forces are mighty. Within your subconscious mind, you will find the solution for every problem and the cause for every effect. 
because you can draw out the hidden powers, you come into actual possession of the power and wisdom necessary to move forward in abundance, security, joy, and dominion. I have seen the power of the subconscious lift people up out of crippled states, making them whole, vital, and strong once more, and free to go out into the world to experience happiness, health, and joyous expression. There is a miraculous healing power in your subconscious that can heal the troubled mind and the broken heart. It can open the prison door of the mind and liberate you. It can free you from all kinds of material and physical bondage. Necessity of a working basis. Substantial progress in any field of endeavor is impossible in the absence of a working basis, which is universal in its application. You can become skilled in the operation of your subconscious mind. You can practice its powers with a certainty of results in exact proportion to your knowledge of its principles and to your application of them for definite specific purposes and goals you wish to achieve. Being a former chemist, I would like to point out that if you combine hydrogen and oxygen in the proportions of two atoms of the former to one of the latter, water would be the result. You are very familiar with the fact that one atom of oxygen and one atom of carbon will produce carbon monoxide, a poisonous gas. But if you add another atom of oxygen, you will get carbon dioxide, a harmless gas, and so on throughout the vast realm of chemical compounds. You must not think that the principles of chemistry, physics, and mathematics differ from the principles of your subconscious mind. Let us consider a generally accepted principle. Water seeks its own level. This is a universal principle which is applicable to water everywhere. Consider another principle. Matter expands when heated. This is true anywhere at any time and under all circumstances. You can heat a piece of steel and it will expand regardless whether the steel is found in China, England, or India. It is a universal truth that matter expands when heated. It is also a universal truth that whatever you impress on your subconscious mind is expressed on the screen of space as condition, experience, and event. Your prayer is answered because your subconscious mind is principle, and by principle I mean the way a thing works. For example, the principle of electricity is that it works from a higher to a lower potential. If you do not change the principle of electricity when you use it, but by cooperating with nature, you can bring forth marvelous inventions and discoveries which bless humanity in countless ways. Your subconscious mind is principal and works according to the law of belief. You must know what belief is, why it works, and how it works. The law of your mind is the law of belief. This means to believe in the way your mind works, to believe in belief itself. The belief of your mind is the thought of your mind. That is simple. Just that and nothing else. All your experiences, events, conditions, and acts are the reactions of your subconscious mind to your thoughts. Remember, it is not the thing believed in, but the belief in your own mind which brings about the result. Cease believing in the false beliefs, opinions, superstitions, and fears of mankind. Begin to believe in the eternal verities and truths of life which never change. Then you will move onward, upward, and Godward. Whoever reads this book and applies the principles of the subconscious mind herein set forth will be able to pray scientifically and effectively for himself and for others. Your prayer is answered according to the universal law of action and reaction. Thought is incipient action. The reaction is the response from your subconscious mind which corresponds with the nature of your thought. Busy your mind with the concepts of harmony, health, peace, and goodwill, and wonders will happen in your life. The Duality of Mind You have only one mind, but your mind possesses two distinctive characteristics. The line of demarcation between the two is well known to all thinking men and women today. The two functions of your mind are essentially unlike. Each is endowed with separate and distinct attributes and powers. The nomenclature generally used to distinguish the two functions of your mind is as follows. The objective and subjective mind. The conscious and subconscious mind. The waking and sleeping mind. The surface self and the deep self. The voluntary mind and the involuntary mind. 
the male and the female, and many other terms. You will find the terms conscious and subconscious used to represent the dual nature of your mind throughout this book. The conscious and subconscious minds. An excellent way to get acquainted with the two functions of your mind is to look upon your own mind as a garden. You are a gardener and you are planting seeds, thoughts in your subconscious mind all day long based on your habitual thinking. As you sow in your subconscious mind, so shall you reap in your body and environment. Begin now to sow thoughts of peace, happiness, right action, goodwill, and prosperity. Think quietly and with interest on these qualities and accept them fully in your conscious reasoning mind. Continue to plant these wonderful seeds, thoughts, in your garden of your mind, and you will reap a glorious harvest. Your subconscious mind may be likened to the soil, which will grow all kinds of seeds, good or bad. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Every thought is, therefore, a cause, and every condition is an effect. For this reason, it is essential that you take charge of your thoughts so as to bring forth only desirable conditions. When your mind thinks correctly, when you understand the truth, when the thoughts deposited in your subconscious mind are constructive, harmonious, and peaceful, the magic working power of your subconscious will respond and bring about harmonious conditions, agreeable surroundings, and the best of everything. When you begin to control your thought processes, you can apply the powers of your subconscious to any problem or difficulty. In other words, you will actually be consciously cooperating with the infinite power and omnipotent law which governs all things. Look around you wherever you live and you will notice that the vast majority of mankind lives in the world without. The more enlightened men are intensely interested in the world within. Remember, it is the world within, namely, your thoughts, feelings, and imagery that makes your world without. It is, therefore, the only creative power and everything which you find in your world of expression has been created by you in the inner world of your mind consciously or unconsciously. Knowledge of the interaction of your conscious and subconscious minds will enable you to transform your whole life. In order to change external conditions, you must change the cause. Most men try to change conditions and circumstances by working with conditions and circumstances. To remove discord, confusion, lack, and limitation, you must remove the cause. And the cause is the way you are using your conscious mind. In other words, the way you are thinking and picturing in your mind. You are living in a fathomless sea of infinite riches. Your subconscious is very sensitive to your thoughts. Your thoughts form the mold or matrix through which the infinite intelligence, wisdom, vital forces, and energies of your subconscious flow. The practical application of the laws of your mind as illustrated in each chapter of this book will cause you to experience abundance for poverty, wisdom for superstition and ignorance, peace for pain, joy for sadness, light for darkness, harmony for discord, faith and confidence for fear, success for failure, and freedom from the law of averages. Certainly there can be no more wonderful blessing than these from a mental, emotional, and material standpoint. Most of the great scientists, artists, poets, singers, writers, and inventors have a deep understanding of the workings of the conscious and subconscious minds. One time Caruso, the great operatic tenor, was struck with stage fright. He said his throat was paralyzed due to spasms caused by intense fear, which constricted the muscles of his throat. Perspiration poured copiously down his face. He was ashamed, because in a few minutes he had to go out on the stage, yet he was shaking with fear and trepidation. He said, they will laugh at me, I can't sing. Then he shouted in the presence of those behind the stage, the little me wants to strangle the big me within. He said to the little me, get out of here, the big me wants to sing through me. By the big me, he meant the limitless power and wisdom of his subconscious mind, and he began to shout, get out, get out, the big me is going to sing. His subconscious mind responded, releasing the vital forces within him. When the call came, he walked out on the stage and sang gloriously and majestically, enthralling the audience. It is obvious to you now that Caruso must have understood the two levels of the mind, the conscious or rational and the subconscious or irrational level.
Your subconscious mind is reactive and responds to the nature of your thoughts. When your conscious mind, the little me, is full of fear, worry, and anxiety, the negative emotions engendered in your subconscious mind, the big me, are released and flood the conscious mind with a sense of panic, foreboding, and despair. When this happens, you can, like Caruso, speak affirmatively and with a deep sense of authority to the irrational emotions generated in your deeper mind as follows. Be still. Be quiet. I am in control. You must obey me. You are subject to my command. You cannot intrude where you do not belong. It is fascinating and intensely interesting to observe how you can speak authoritatively and with conviction to the irrational movement of your deeper self bringing silence, harmony, and peace to your mind. The subconscious is subject to the conscious mind, and that is why it is called subconscious or subjective. Outstanding Differences and Modes of Operation You will perceive the main differences by the following illustrations. The conscious mind is like the navigator or a captain at the bridge of a ship. He directs the ship and signals orders to men in the engine room, who in turn control all the boilers, instruments, gauges, etc. The men in the engine room do not know where they are going. They follow orders. They would go on the rocks if the man on the bridge issued faulty or wrong instructions based on his findings with the compass, sextant, or other instruments. The men in the engine room obey him because he is in charge and issues orders, which are automatically obeyed. Members of the crew do not talk back to the captain. They simply carry out orders. The captain is the master of his ship, and his decrees are carried out. Likewise, your conscious mind is the captain and the master of your ship, which represents your body, environment, and all your affairs. Your subconscious mind takes the orders you give it based upon what your conscious mind believes and accepts as true. When you repeatedly say to people, I can't afford it, then your subconscious mind takes you at your word and sees to it that you will not be in a position to purchase what you want. As long as you persist in saying, I can't afford that car, that trip to Europe, that home, that fur coat or ermine wrap, you can rest assured that your subconscious mind will follow your orders and you will go through life experiencing the lack of all these things. Last Christmas Eve, a beautiful young university student looked at an attractive and rather expensive traveling bag in a store window. She was going home to Buffalo, New York for the holidays. She was about to say, I can't afford that bag, when she recalled something she had heard at one of my lectures, which was, never finish a negative statement. Reverse it immediately, and wonders will happen in your life. She said, that bag is mine. It is for sale. I accept it mentally, and my subconscious sees to it that I receive it. At 8 o'clock Christmas Eve, her fiancé presented her with a bag exactly the same as the one she had looked at and mentally identified herself with at 10 o'clock the same morning. She had filled her mind with the thought of expectancy and released the whole thing to her deeper mind, which has the know-how of accomplishment. This young girl, a student of the University of Southern California, said to me, I didn't have the money to buy that bag, but now I know where to find money and all the things I need and that is in the treasure house of eternity within me. Another simple illustration is this. When you say, I do not like mushrooms, and the occasion subsequently comes that you are served mushrooms in sauces or salads, you will get indigestion because your subconscious mind says to you, the boss, your conscious mind, does not like mushrooms. This is an amusing example of the outstanding differences and modes of operation of your conscious and subconscious minds. A woman may say, I wake up at 3 o'clock if I drink coffee at night. Whenever she drinks coffee, her subconscious mind nudges her as if to say, the boss wants you to stay awake tonight. Your subconscious mind works 24 hours a day and makes provisions for your benefit, pouring all the fruit of your habitual thinking into your lap. How her subconscious mind responded. A woman wrote me a few months ago as follows. I am 75 years old, a widow with a grown family. I was living alone and on a pension. I heard your lectures on the powers of the subconscious mind, wherein you said that ideas could be conveyed to the subconscious mind by repetition, faith, and expectancy. I began to repeat frequently with feeling, I am wanted. I am happily married to a kind, loving, and spiritual-minded man. I am secure. I kept on doing this many times a day for about two weeks, and one day at the corner drugstore, I was introduced to a retired pharmacist 
I found him to be kind, understanding, and very religious. He was the perfect answer to my prayer. Within a week, he proposed to me, and now we are on our honeymoon in Europe. I know that the intelligence within my subconscious mind brought both of us together in divine order. This woman discovered that the treasure house was within her. Her prayer was felt as true in her heart, and her affirmation sank down by osmosis into her subconscious mind, which is the creative medium. The moment she succeeded in bringing about a subjective embodiment, her subconscious mind brought about the answer through the law of attraction. Her deeper mind, full of wisdom and intelligence, brought both of them together in divine order. Be sure that you think on whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Chapter 2 How Your Own Mind Works You have a mind and you should learn how to use it. There are two levels of your mind, the conscious or rational level and the subconscious or irrational level. You think with your conscious mind and whatever you habitually think sinks down into your subconscious mind, which creates according to the nature of your thoughts. Your subconscious mind is the seat of your emotions and is the creative mind. If you think good, good will follow. If you think evil, evil will follow. This is the way your mind works. The main point to remember is once the subconscious mind accepts an idea, it begins to execute it. It is an interesting and subtle truth that the law of the subconscious mind works for good and bad ideas alike. This law, when applied in a negative way, is the cause of failure, frustration, and unhappiness. However, when your habitual thinking is harmonious and constructive, you experience perfect health, success, and prosperity. Peace of mind and a healthy body are inevitable when you begin to think and feel in the right way. Whatever you claim mentally and feel as true, your subconscious mind will accept and bring forth into your experience. The only thing necessary for you to do is to get your subconscious mind to accept your idea and the law of your own subconscious mind will bring forth the health, peace, or the position you desire. You give the command or decree, and your subconscious will faithfully reproduce the idea impressed upon it. The law of your mind is this. You will get a reaction or a response from your subconscious mind according to the nature of the thought or idea you hold in your conscious mind. Psychologists and psychiatrists point out that when thoughts are conveyed to your subconscious mind, impressions are made in the brain cells. As soon as your subconscious accepts any idea, it proceeds to put it into effect immediately. It works by association of ideas and uses every bit of knowledge that you have gathered in your lifetime to bring about its purpose. It draws on the infinite power, energy, and wisdom within you. It lines up all the laws of nature to get its way. Sometimes it seems to bring about an immediate solution to your difficulties, but at other times it takes days, weeks, or longer. Its ways are past finding out. Conscious and subconscious terms differentiated. You must remember that these are not two minds. They are merely two spheres of activity within one mind. Your conscious mind is the reasoning mind. It is that phase of mind which chooses. For example, you choose your books, your home, and your partner in life. You make all your decisions with your conscious mind. On the other hand, without any conscious choice on your part, your heart is kept functioning automatically, and the process of digestion, circulation, and breathing are carried on by your subconscious mind through processes independent of your conscious control. Your subconscious mind accepts what is impressed upon it or what you consciously believe. It does not reason things out like your conscious mind, and it does not argue with you controversially. Your subconscious mind is like the soil, which accepts any kind of seed, good or bad. Your thoughts are active and might be likened unto seeds. Negative, destructive thoughts continue to work negatively in your subconscious mind, and in due time will come forth into outer experience which corresponds with them. Remember, your subconscious mind does not engage in proving whether your thoughts are good or bad, true or false, but it responds according to the nature of your thoughts or suggestions. 
For example, if you consciously assume something is true, even though it may be false, your subconscious mind will accept it as true and proceed to bring about results, which must necessarily follow, because you consciously assumed it to be true. Experiments by Psychologists Innumerable experiments by psychologists and others on persons in the hypnotic state have shown that the subconscious mind is incapable of making selections and comparisons which are necessary for a reasoning process. They have shown repeatedly that your subconscious mind will accept any suggestions, however false. Having once accepted any suggestion, it responds according to the nature of the suggestion given. To illustrate the amenability of your subconscious mind to suggestion, if a practiced hypnotist suggests to one of his subjects that he is Napoleon Bonaparte, or even a cat or a dog, he will act out the part with imitable accuracy. His personality becomes changed for the time being. He believes himself to be whatever the operator tells him he is. A skilled hypnotist may suggest to one of his students in the hypnotic state that his back itches, to another that his nose is bleeding, to another that he is a marble statue, to another that he is freezing and the temperature is below zero. Each one will follow out the line of his particular suggestion, totally obvious to all his surroundings, which do not pertain to his idea. These simple illustrations portray clearly the difference between your conscious reasoning mind and your subconscious mind, which is impersonal, non-selective, and accepts as true whatever your conscious mind believes to be true. Hence, the importance of selecting thoughts, ideas, and premises which bless, heal, inspire, and fill your soul with joy. The terms objective and subjective mind clarified. Your conscious mind is sometimes referred to as your objective mind because it deals with outward objects. The objective mind takes cognizance of the objective world. Its media of observation are your five physical senses. Your objective mind is your guide and director in your contact with your environment. You gain knowledge through your five senses. Your objective mind learns through observation, experience, and education. As previously pointed out, the greatest function of the objective mind is that of reasoning. Suppose you are one of the thousands of tourists who come to Los Angeles annually. You would come to the conclusion that it is a beautiful city based upon your observation of the parks, pretty gardens, majestic buildings, and lovely homes. This is the working of your objective mind. Your subconscious mind is oftentimes referred to as your subjective mind. Your subjective mind takes cognizance of its environment by means independent of the five senses. Your subjective mind perceives by intuition. It is the seat of your emotion and the storehouse of memory. Your subjective mind performs its highest functions when your objective senses are in abeyance. In a word, it is that intelligence which makes itself manifest when the objective mind is suspended or in a sleepy, drowsy state. Your subjective mind sees without the use of the natural organs of vision. It has the capacity of clairvoyance and clairaudience. Your subjective mind can leave your body, travel to distant lands, and bring back information oftentimes of the most exact and truthful character. Through your subjective mind, you can read the thoughts of others, read the contents of sealed envelopes, and close safes. Your subjective mind has the ability to apprehend the thoughts of others without the use of the ordinary objective means of communication. It is of the greatest importance that we understand the interaction of the objective and subjective mind in order to learn the true art of prayer. The subconscious cannot reason like your conscious mind. Your conscious mind cannot argue controversially. Hence, if you give it wrong suggestions, it will accept them as true and will proceed to bring them to pass as conditions, experiences, and events. All things that have happened to you are based on thoughts impressed on your subconscious mind through belief. If you have conveyed erroneous concepts to your subconscious mind, the sure method of overcoming them is by the repetition of constructive, harmonious thoughts frequently repeated which your subconscious mind accepts, thus forming new and healthy habits of thought and life, for your subconscious mind is the seat of habit. The habitual thinking of your conscious mind establishes deep grooves in your subconscious mind. This is very favorable for you if your habitual thoughts are harmonious, peaceful, and constructive. If you have indulged in fear, worry, and other destructive forms of thinking, the remedy is to recognize the omnipotence of your subconscious mind and to create freedom, happiness, and perfect health. 
your subconscious mind being creative and one with your divine source will proceed to create the freedom and happiness which you have earnestly decreed. The Tremendous Power of Suggestion You must realize by now that your conscious mind is the watchman at the gate and its chief function is to protect your subconscious mind from false impressions. You are now aware of one of the basic laws of mind. Your subconscious mind is amendable to suggestion. As you know, your subconscious mind does not make comparisons or contrasts, neither does it reason and think things out for itself. This latter function belongs to your conscious mind. It simply reacts to the impressions given to it by your conscious mind. It does not show a preference for one course of action over another. The following is a classic example of the tremendous power of suggestion. Suppose you approach a timid looking passenger on board ship and say to him something like this, You look very ill. How pale you are! I feel certain you are going to be seasick. Let me help you to your cabin. This passenger turns pale. Your suggestion of seasickness associates itself with his own fears and forebodings. He accepts your aid down to the berth, and there your negative suggestion, which was accepted by him, is realized. Different Reactions to the Same Suggestion It is true that different people will react in different ways to the same suggestion because of their subconscious conditioning or belief. For example, if you go to a sailor on the ship and say to him sympathetically, My dear fellow, you are looking very ill. Aren't you feeling sick? You look to me as if you were going to be seasick. According to his temperament, he either laughs at your joke or expresses a mild irritation. Your suggestion fell on deaf ears in this instance because your suggestion of seasickness was associated in his mind with his own immunity from it. Therefore, it called up not fear or worry, but self-confidence. The dictionary says that a suggestion is the act or instance of putting something into one's mind, the mental process by which the thought or idea suggested is entertained, accepted, or put into effect. You must remember that a suggestion cannot impress something on the subconscious mind against the will of the conscious mind. In other words, your conscious mind has the power to reject the suggestion given. In the case of the sailor, he had no fear of seasickness. He had convinced himself of his immunity, and the negative suggestion had absolutely no power to evoke fear. The suggestion of seasickness to the other passenger called forth his indwelling fear of seasickness. Each of us has his own inner fears, beliefs, opinions, and these inner assumptions rule and govern our lives. A suggestion has no power in and of itself except if you accept it mentally. This causes your subconscious powers to flow in a limited and restricted way according to the nature of the suggestion. How he lost his arm. Every two or three years I give a series of lectures at the London Truth Forum in Caxton Hall. This is a forum I founded a number of years ago. Dr. Evelyn Fleet, the director, told me about an article which appeared in the English newspapers dealing with the power of suggestion. This is the suggestion a man gave to his subconscious mind over a period of about two years. I would give my right arm to see my daughter cured. It appeared that his daughter had a crippling form of arthritis together with a so-called incurable form of skin disease. Medical treatment had failed to alleviate the condition and the father had an intense longing for his daughter's healing and expressed his desire in the words just quoted. Dr. Evelyn Fleet said that the newspaper article pointed out that one day the family was out riding when their car collided with another. The father's right arm was torn off of the shoulder and immediately the daughter's arthritis and skin condition vanished. You must make certain to give your subconscious only suggestions which heal, bless, elevate, and inspire you in all your ways. Remember that your subconscious mind cannot take a joke. It takes you at your word. How Auto-Suggestion Banishes Fear Illustrations of Auto-Suggestion Auto-Suggestion means suggesting something definite and specific to oneself. Herbert Parkin, in his excellent manual of auto-suggestion, records the following incident. It has its amusing side so that one remembers it. A New York visitor in Chicago looks at his watch, which is set an hour ahead of Chicago time, and tells a Chicago friend that it is 12 o'clock. The Chicago friend, not considering the difference in time between Chicago and New York, tells the New Yorker that he is hungry and that he must go to lunch. Auto-suggestion may be used to banish various fears and other negative conditions. A young singer was invited to give an audition. 
She had been looking forward to the interview, but on three previous occasions she had failed miserably due to fear of failure. This young lady had a very good voice, but she had been saying to herself, when the time comes for me to sing, maybe they won't like me. I will try, but I'm full of fear and anxiety. Her subconscious mind accepted these negative auto-suggestions as a request and proceeded to manifest them and bring them into her experience. The cause was an involuntary auto-suggestion. Example, silent fear thoughts emotionalized and subjectified. She overcame it by the following technique. Three times a day, she isolated herself in a room. She sat down comfortably in an armchair, relaxed her body, and closed her eyes. She stilled her mind and body as best she could. Physical inertia favors mental passivity and renders the mind more receptive to suggestion. She counteracted the fear suggestion by saying to herself, I sing beautifully. I am poised, serene, confident, and calm. She repeated this statement slowly, quietly, and with feeling from five to ten times at each sitting. She had three such sittings every day and one immediately prior to sleep. At the end of a week, she was completely poised and confident. When the invitation to audition came, she gave a remarkable, wonderful audition. How she restored her memory. A woman aged 75 was in the habit of saying to herself, I am losing my memory. She reversed the procedure and practiced inducing auto-suggestion several times a day as follows. My memory from today on is improving in every department. I shall always remember whatever I need to know at every moment of time and point of space. The impressions received will be clear and more definite. I shall retain them automatically and with ease. Whatever I wish to recall will immediately present itself in the correct form in my mind. I am improving rapidly every day, and very soon my memory will be better than it has ever been before. At the end of three weeks, her memory was back to normal, and she was delighted. How he overcame a nasty temper. Many men who complained of irritability and bad temper proved to be very susceptible to auto-suggestion and obtained marvelous results by using the following statements three or four times a day, morning, noon, and at night prior to sleep for about a month. Henceforth, I shall grow more good-humored, joy, happiness, and cheerfulness are now becoming my normal states of mind. Every day, I am becoming more and more lovable and understanding. I am now becoming the center of cheer and goodwill to all those about me, infecting them with good humor. This happy, joyous, and cheerful mood is now becoming my normal, natural state of mind. I am grateful. The Constructive and Destructive Power of Suggestion Some Illustrations and Comments on Hereto Suggestion Hetero suggestion means suggestions from another person. In all ages, the power of suggestion has played a part in the life and thought of man in every period of time and in each country of the earth. In many parts of the world, it is the controlling power in religion. Suggestion may be used to discipline and control ourselves, but it can also be used to take control and command over others who do not know the laws of mind. In its constructive form, it is wonderful and magnificent. In its negative aspects, it is one of the most destructive of all the response patterns of the mind, resulting in patterns of misery, failure, suffering, sickness, and disaster. Have you accepted any of these? From infancy on, the majority of us have been given many negative suggestions. Not knowing how to thwart them, we unconsciously accepted them. Here are some of the negative suggestions. You can't. You'll never amount to anything. You mustn't. You'll fail. You haven't got a chance. You're all wrong. It's no use. It's not what you know, but who you know. The world is going to the dogs. What's the use? Nobody cares. It's no use trying so hard. You're too old now. Things are getting worse and worse. Life is an endless grind. Love is for the birds. You just can't win. Pretty soon, you'll be bankrupt. Watch out, you'll get the virus. You can't trust the soul, etc. Unless, as an adult, you use constructive auto-suggestion, which is a reconditioning therapy, the impressions made on you in the past can cause behavior patterns that cause failure in your personal and social life. Auto-suggestion is a means releasing you from the mass of negative verbal conditioning that might otherwise distort your life pattern. 
making the development of good habits difficult. You can counteract negative suggestions. Pick up the paper any day and you can read dozens of items that could sow the seeds of fertility, fear, worry, anxiety, and impending doom. If accepted by you, these thoughts of fear could cause you to lose the will for life. Knowing that you can reject all these negative suggestions by giving your subconscious mind constructive auto-suggestions, you counteract all these destructive ideas. Check regularly on the negative suggestions that people make to you. You do not have to be influenced by destructive heterosuggestion. All of us have suffered from it in our childhood and in our teens. If you look back, you can easily recall how parents, friends, relatives, teachers, and associates contributed in a campaign of negative suggestions. Study the things said to you, and you will discover much of it was in the form of propaganda. The purpose of much of what was said was to control you or instill fear into you. This heterosuggestion process goes on in every home, office, factory, and club. You will find that many of these suggestions are for the purpose of making you think, feel, and act as others want you to, and in ways that are to their advantage. How Suggestion Killed a Man Here's an illustration of heterosuggestion. A relative of mine went to a crystal gazer in India who told him that he had a bad heart and predicted that he would die at the next new moon. He began to tell all members of his family about this prediction, and he arranged his will. This powerful suggestion entered into his subconscious mind because he accepted it completely. My relative also told me that this crystal gazer was believed to have some strange occult powers, and he could do harm or good to a person. He died as predicted, not knowing that he was the cause of his own death. I suppose many of us have heard similar stupid, ridiculous, superstitious stories. Let us look at what happened in the light of our knowledge of the way the subconscious mind works. Whatever the conscious, reasoning mind of man believes, the subconscious mind will accept and act upon. My relative was happy, healthy, vigorous, and robust when he went to see the fortune teller. She gave him a very negative suggestion, which he accepted. He became terrified and constantly dwelt upon the fact that he was going to die at the next new moon. He proceeded to tell everyone about it, and he prepared for the end. The activity took place in his own mind, and his own thought was the cause. He brought about his own so-called death, or rather destruction, of the physical body by his fear and expectation of the end. The woman who predicted his death had no more power than the stones and sticks in the field. Her suggestion had no power to create or bring about the end she suggested. If he had known the laws of his mind, he would have completely rejected the negative suggestion and refused to give her words any attention, knowing in his heart that he was governed and controlled by his own thought and feeling. Like tin arrows aimed at the battleship, her prophecy could have been completely neutralized and dissipated without hurting him. The suggestions of others in themselves have absolutely no power whatever over you except the power that you give them through your own thoughts. You have to give your mental consent. You have to entertain the thought. Then it becomes your thought, and you do the thinking. Remember, you have the capacity to choose. Choose life. Choose love. Choose health. The power of an assumed major premise. Your mind works like a syllogism. This means that whatever major premise your conscious mind assumes to be true determines the conclusion your subconscious mind comes to in regard to any particular question or problem in your mind. If your premise is true, the conclusion must be true as in the following example. Every virtue is laudable. Kindness is a virtue. Therefore, kindness is laudable. Another example is as follows. All formed things change and pass away. The pyramids of Egypt are formed things. Therefore, someday the pyramids will pass away. The first statement is referred to as the major premise, and the right conclusion must necessarily follow the right premise. A college professor who attended some of my Science of Mind lectures in May of 1962 at Town Hall, New York, said to me, Everything in my life is topsy-turvy, and I have lost health, wealth, and friends. Everything I touch turns out wrong. I explained to him that he should establish a major premise in his thinking, that the infinite intelligence of his subconscious mind was guiding, directing, and prospering him spiritually, mentally, and materially. 
Then his subconscious mind would automatically direct him wisely in his investments, decisions, and also heal his body and restore his mind to peace and tranquility. This professor formulated an overall picture of the way he wanted his life to be, and this was his major premise. Infinite intelligence leads and guides me in all my ways. Perfect health is mine, and the law of harmony operates in my mind and body. Beauty, love, peace, and abundance are mine. The principle of right action and divine order govern my entire life. I know my major premise is based on the eternal truths of life, and I know, feel, and believe that my subconscious mind responds according to the nature of my conscious mind thinking. He wrote me as follows. I repeated the above statements slowly, quietly, and lovingly several times a day, knowing that they were sinking deep down into my subconscious mind and that results must follow. I am deeply grateful for the interview you gave me, and I would like to add that all my departments of my life are changing for the better. It works. The subconscious does not argue controversially. Your subconscious mind is all wise and knows the answers to all questions. It does not argue with you or talk back to you. It does not say, you must not impress me with that. For example, when you say, I can't do this, I am too old now, I can't meet this obligation, I was born on the wrong side of the tracks, I don't know the right politician, you are impregnating your subconscious with these negative thoughts, and it responds accordingly. You are actually blocking your own good, thereby bringing lack, limitation, and frustration into your life. When you set up obstacles, impediments, and delays in your conscious mind, you are denying the wisdom and intelligence resident in your subconscious mind. You are actually saying, in effect, that your subconscious mind cannot solve your problem. This leads to mental and emotional congestion, followed by sickness and neurotic tendencies. To realize your desire and overcome your frustration, affirm boldly several times a day, the infinite intelligence which gave me this desire leads, guides, and reveals to me the perfect plan for the unfolding of my desire. I know the deeper wisdom of my subconscious is now responding, and what I feel and claim within is expressed in the without. There is a balance, equilibrium, and equanimity. If you say, there is no way out, I am lost, there is no way out of this dilemma, I am stymed and blocked, you will get no answer or response from your subconscious mind. If you want the subconscious to work for you, give it the right request and attain its cooperation. It is always working for you. It is controlling your heartbeat this minute and also your breathing. It heals a cut on your finger, and its tendency is lifeward, forever seeking to take care of you and preserve you. Your subconscious has a mind of its own, but it accepts your patterns of thought and imagery. When you are seeking an answer to a problem, your subconscious will respond, but it expects you to come to a decision and to a true judgment in your conscious mind. You must acknowledge the answer is in your subconscious mind. However, if you say, I don't think there is any way out, I am all mixed up and confused, why don't I get an answer, you are neutralizing your prayer. Like the soldier marking time, you do not get anywhere. Still, the wheels of your mind, relax, let go and quietly affirm, my subconscious knows the answer. It is responding to me now. I give thanks because I know the infinite intelligence of my subconscious knows all things and is revealing the perfect answer to me now. My real conviction is now setting free the majesty and glory of my subconscious mind. I rejoice that it is so. Chapter 3 The Miracle Working Power of Your Subconscious The power of your subconscious is enormous. It inspires you, it guides you, and it reveals to you names, facts, and scenes from the storehouse of memory. Your subconscious started your heartbeat, controls the circulation of your blood, and regulates your digestion, assimilation, and elimination. When you eat a piece of bread, your subconscious mind transmutes it into tissue, muscle, bone, and blood. This process is beyond the keen of the wisest man who walks the earth. Your subconscious mind controls all the vital processes and functions of your body and knows the answer to all problems. Your subconscious mind never sleeps, never rests. It is always on the job. You can discover the miracle working power of your subconscious by plainly stating to your subconscious prior to sleep that you wish a certain specific thing accomplished. You will be delighted to discover that forces within you will be released, leading to the desired result. 
Here, then, is a source of power and wisdom which places you in touch with omnipotence or the power that moves the world, guides the planets in their course, and causes the sun to shine. Your subconscious mind is the source of your ideals, aspirations, and altruistic urges. It was through the subconscious mind that Shakespeare perceived great truths hidden from the average man of his day. Undoubtedly, it was the response of his subconscious mind that caused the Greek sculpture Phidias to portray beauty, order, symmetry, and proportion in marble and bronze. It enabled the Italian artist Raphael to paint Madonnas and Ludwig van Beethoven to compose symphonies. In 1955, I lectured at the Yoga Forest University, Rishikesh, India, and there I chatted with a visiting surgeon from Bombay. He told me about Dr. James S. Dale a Scotch surgeon who worked in Bengal before ether or other modern methods of anesthesia were discovered. Between 1843 and 1846, Dr. Esdale performed about 400 major operations of all kinds, such as amputations, removal of tumors and cancerous growths, as well as operations on the eye, ear, and throat. All operations were conducted under mental anesthesia only. This Indian doctor at Rishikesh informed me that the post-operative mortality rate of patients operated on by Dr. Esdale was extremely low, probably 2 or 3 percent. Patients felt no pain, and there were no deaths during the operations. Dr. Esdale suggested to the subconscious minds of all his patients who were in a hypnotic state that no infection or septic condition would develop. You must remember that this was before Louis Pasteur. Joseph Lister and others who pointed out the bacterial origin of disease and causes of infection due to unsterilized instruments and virulent organisms. This Indian surgeon said that the reason for the low mortality rate and the general absence of infection, which was reduced to a minimum, was undoubtedly due to the suggestions of Dr. Isdale to the subconscious minds of his patients. They responded according to the nature of his suggestion. It is simply wonderful when you conceive how a surgeon over 120 years ago discovered the miraculous wonder-working powers of the subconscious mind. Doesn't it cause you to be seized with a sort of mystic awe when you stop and think of the transcendental powers of your subconscious mind? Consider its extrasensory perceptions, such as its capacity for clairvoyance and clairaudience, its independence of time and space its capacity to render you free from all pain and suffering, and its capacity to get the answers to all problems, be that what they may. All these and many more reveal to you that there is a power and intelligence within you that far transcends your intellect, causing you to marvel at the wonders of it all. All these experiences cause you to rejoice and believe in the miracle-working powers of your own subconscious mind. Your subconscious is your book of life. Whatever thoughts, beliefs, opinions, theories, or dogmas you write, engrave, or impress on your subconscious mind, you shall experience them as the objective manifestation of circumstances, conditions, and events. What you write on the inside, you will experience on the outside. You have two sides to your life, objective and subjective, visible and invisible, thought and its manifestation. Your brain receives your thought, which is the organ of your conscious reasoning mind. When your conscious or objective mind accepts the thought completely, it is sent to the solar plex, called the brain of your mind, where it becomes flesh and is made manifest in your experience. As previously outlined, your subconscious cannot argue. It acts only from what you write on it. It accepts your verdict or the conclusions of your conscious mind as final. This is why you are always writing on the book of life, because your thoughts become your experiences. The American essayist Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Man is what he thinks all day long. What is impressed in the subconscious is expressed. William James, the father of American psychology, said that the power to move the world is in your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is one with infinite intelligence and boundless wisdom. It is fed by hidden springs and is called the law of life. Whatever you impress upon your subconscious mind, the latter will move heaven and earth to bring it to pass. You must, therefore, impress it with right ideas and constructive thoughts. 
The reason there is so much chaos and misery in the world is because people do not understand the interaction of their conscious and subconscious minds. When these two principles work in accord, in concord, in peace, and synchronously together, you will have health, happiness, peace, and joy. There is no sickness or discord when the conscious and subconscious work together harmoniously and peacefully. The tomb of Herms was opened with great expectancy and a sense of wonder because people believed that the greatest secret of the ages was contained therein. The secret was as within, so without, as above, so below. In other words, whatever is impressed in your subconscious mind is expressed on the screen of space. This same truth was proclaimed by Moses, Isaiah, and all the illumined seers of the ages. Whatever you feel as true subjectively is expressed as conditions, experiences, and events. Motion and emotion must balance. As in heaven, your own mind, so on earth, in your body and environment, this is the great law of life. You will find throughout all nature the law of action and reaction, of rest and motion. These two must balance. Then there will be harmony and equilibrium. You are here to let the life principle flow through you rhythmically and harmoniously. The intake and the outgo must be equal. The impression and the expression must be equal. All your frustration is due to unfilled desire. If you think negatively, destructively, and viciously, these thoughts generate destructive emotions which must be expressed and find an outlet. These emotions, being of a negative nature, are frequently expressed as ulcers, heart trouble, tensions, and anxieties. What is your idea or feeling about yourself now? Every part of your being expresses that idea. Your vitality, body, financial status, friends, and social status represent a perfect reflection of the idea you have of yourself. This is the real meaning of what is impressed in your subconscious mind. And which is expressed in all phases of your life. We injure ourselves by the negative ideas which we entertain. How often have you wounded yourself by getting angry, fearful, jealous, or vengeful? These are the poisons that enter your subconscious mind. You were not born with these negative attitudes. Feed your subconscious mind life-giving thoughts, and you will wipe out all the negative patterns lodged therein. As you continue to do this. All the past will be wiped out and remembered no more. The subconscious heals a malignancy of the skin. A person healing will ever be the most convincing evidence of the healing power of the subconscious mind. Over 40 years ago, I resolved a malignancy of skin through prayer. Medical therapy had failed to check the growth, and it was getting progressively worse. A clergyman with a deep psychological knowledge explained to me the inner meaning of the 139th Psalm, wherein it says, "In thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them." He explained that the term "book" meant my subconscious mind, which fashioned and molded all my organs from an invisible cell. He also pointed out that, inasmuch as my subconscious mind made my body, it could also recreate it and heal it according to the perfect pattern within it. This clergyman showed me his watch and said, "This had a maker, and the watchmaker had to have the idea first in mind before the watch became an objective reality. And if this watch was out of order, the watchmaker could fix it." My friend reminded me that the subconscious intelligence which created my body was like a watchmaker, and it also knew exactly how to heal, restore, and direct all the vital functions and processes of my body, but that I had to give it the perfect idea of health. This would act as cause, and the effect would be a healing. I prayed in a very simple way as follows: My body and all its organs were created by the infinite intelligence in my subconscious mind. It knows how to heal me. Its wisdom fashioned all my organs, tissues, muscles, and bones. This infinite healing presence within me is now transforming every atom of my being, making me whole and perfect now. I give thanks for my healing. I know is taking place now. Wonderful are the works of the creative intelligence within me. I prayed aloud for about five minutes, two or three times a day, repeating the above simple prayer. In about three months, my skin was whole and perfect. As you can see, all I did was give life-giving patterns of wholeness, beauty, and perfection to my subconscious mind. 
thereby obliterating the negative images and patterns of thought lodged in my subconscious mind which were the cause of all my trouble. Nothing appears on your body except when the mental equivalent is first in your mind, and as you change your mind by drenching it with incandescent affirmatives, you change your body. This is the basis of all healing. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul, subconscious mind, knoweth right well. Psalm 139.14 How the subconscious controls all functions of the body. While you are awake or sound asleep upon your bed, the ceaseless, tireless action of your subconscious mind controls all the vital functions of your body without the help of your conscious mind. For example, while you are asleep, your heart continues to beat rhythmically. Your lungs do not rest, and the process of inhalation and exhalation, whereby your blood absorbs fresh air, goes on just the same as when you are awake. Your subconscious controls your digestive processes and your glandular secretions, as well as all the other mysterious operations of your body. The hair on your face continues to grow whether you are asleep or awake. Scientists tell us that the skin secretes much more perspiration during sleep than during the waking hours. Your eyes, ears, and other senses are active during sleep. For instance, many of our great scientists have received answers to perplexing problems while they were asleep. They saw the answers in a dream. Oftentimes, your conscious mind interferes with the normal rhythm of the heart, lungs, and functioning of the stomach and intestines by worry, anxiety, fear, and depression. These patterns of thought interfere with the harmonious functioning of your subconscious mind. When mentally disturbed, the best procedure is to let go, relax, and still the wheels of your thought processes. Speak to your subconscious mind, telling it to take over in peace, harmony, and divine order. You will find that all the functions of your body will become normal again. Be sure to speak to your subconscious mind with authority and conviction, and it will conform to your command. Your subconscious seeks to preserve your life and restore you to health at all costs. It causes you to love your children, which also illustrates an instinctive desire to preserve all life. Let us suppose you accidentally ate some bad food. Your subconscious mind would cause you to regurgitate it. If you inadvertently took some poison, your subconscious powers would proceed to neutralize it. If you completely entrusted yourself to its wonder-working power, you would be entirely restored to health. How to get the subconscious to work for you? The first thing to realize is that your subconscious mind is always working. It is active night and day, whether you act upon it or not. Your subconscious is the builder of your body, but you cannot consciously perceive or hear that inner silent process. Your business is with your conscious mind and not your subconscious mind. Just keep your conscious mind busy with the expectation of the best and make sure the thoughts you habitually think are based on whatever things are lovely, true, just, and of good report. Begin now to take care of your conscious mind, knowing in your heart and soul that your subconscious mind is always expressing, reproducing, and manifesting according to your habitual thinking. Remember, just as water takes the shape of the pipe it flows through, the life principle in you flows through you according to the nature of your thoughts. Claim that the healing presence in your subconscious is flowing through you as harmony, health, peace, joy, and abundance. Think of it as a living intelligence, a lovely companion on the way. Firmly believe it is continually flowing through you, vivifying, inspiring, and prospering you. It will respond exactly this way. It is done unto you as you believe. Healing principle of the subconscious restores atrophied optic nerves. There is the well-known, duly authenticated case of Madame Bayer of France, recorded in the archives of the medical department of Lourdes, France. She was blind. The optic nerves were atrophied and useless. She visited Lourdes and had what she termed a miraculous healing. Ruth Cranston, a Protestant young lady who investigated and wrote about healings at Lourdes in McCall's magazine, November 1955, writes about Madame Bayer as follows. At Lourdes, she regained her sight incredibly, with the optic nerves still lifeless and useless, as several doctors could testify after repeated examinations. A month later, upon re-examination, it was found that the seeing mechanism had been restored to normal. But at first, so far as medical examination could tell, she was seeing with dead eyes.
I have visited Lordy several times where I, too, witnessed some healings. And, of course, as we shall explain in the next chapter, there is no doubt that healings take place at many shrines throughout the world, Christian and non-Christian. The waters of the shrine did not heal Madame Bayer, to whom we just referred, but by her own subconscious mind which responded to her belief. The healing principle within her subconscious mind responded to the nature of her thought. Belief is a thought in the subconscious mind. It means to accept something as true. The thought accepted executes itself automatically. Undoubtedly, Madame Bayer went to the shrine with expectancy and great faith, knowing in her heart she would receive a healing. Her subconscious mind responded accordingly, releasing the ever-present healing forces. The subconscious mind, which created the eye, can certainly bring a dead nerve back to life. What the creative principle created, it can recreate. According to your belief, is it done unto you? How to convey the idea of perfect health to your subconscious mind. A Protestant minister I knew in Johannesburg, South Africa, told me the method he used to convey the idea of perfect health to his subconscious mind. He had cancer of the lung. His technique, as given to me in his own handwriting, is exactly as follows. Several times a day, I would make certain that I was completely relaxed mentally and physically. I relaxed my body by speaking to it as follows. My feet are relaxed. My ankles are relaxed. My legs are relaxed. My abdominal muscles are relaxed. My heart and lungs are relaxed. My head is relaxed. My whole being is completely relaxed. After about five minutes, I would be in a sleepy, drowsy state, and then I affirm the following truth. The perfection of God is now being expressed through me. The idea of perfect health is now filling my subconscious mind. The image God has of me is a perfect image, and my subconscious mind recreates my body in perfect accordance with the perfect image held in the mind of God. This minister had a remarkable healing. This is a simple, easy way of conveying the idea of perfect health to your subconscious mind. Another wonderful way to convey the idea of health to your subconscious is through disciplined or scientific imagination. I told a man who was suffering from functional paralysis to make a vivid picture of himself walking around in his office, touching the desk, answering the telephone, and doing all the things he ordinarily would do if he were healed. I explained to him that this idea and mental picture of perfect health would be accepted by his subconscious mind. He lived the role and actually felt himself back in the office. He knew that he was giving his subconscious mind something definite to work upon. His subconscious mind was the film upon which the picture was impressed. One day, after several weeks of frequent conditioning of the mind with this mental picture, the telephone rang by prearrangement and kept ringing while his wife and nurse were out. The telephone was about 12 feet away, but nevertheless he managed to answer it. He was healed at that hour. The healing power of his subconscious mind responded to his mental imagery, and a healing followed. This man had a mental block, which prevented impulses from the brain reaching his legs. Therefore, he said he could not walk. When he shifted his attention to the healing power within him, the power flowed through, his focused attention enabling him to walk. Whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Chapter 4 Mental Healings in Ancient Times Down through the ages, men of all nations have somehow instinctively believed that somewhere there resided a healing power which could restore to normal the functions and sensations of man's body. They believed that this strange power could be invoked under certain conditions and that the alleviation of human suffering would follow. The history of all nations presents testimony in support of this belief. In the early history of the world, the power of secretly influencing men for good or evil, including the healing of the sick, was said to be possessed by the priests and holy men of all nations. Healing of the sick was supposed to be a power derived directly by them from God, and the procedures and processes of healing varied throughout the world. The healing processes took the form of supplications to God attended by various ceremonies, such as the laying on of hands, incantations, the application of amulets, talismans, rings, relics, and images. For example, in the religions of antiquity, priests in the ancient temples gave drugs to the patient, 
and practiced hypnotic suggestions prior to the patient's sleep, telling him that the gods would visit him in his sleep and heal him. Many healings followed. Obviously, all this was the work of potent suggestions to the subconscious mind. After the performance of certain mysterious rites, the devotees of Hecate would see the goddess during sleep, provided that before going to sleep they had prayed to her according to weird and fantastic instructions. They were told to mix lizards with resin, frankincense, and myrrh, and pound all this together in the open air under the crescent moon. Healings were reported in many cases following this grotesque procedure. It is obvious that the strange procedures, as mentioned in the illustrations given, favored suggestion and acceptance by the subconscious mind of these people by making a powerful appeal to their imagination. Actually, in all these healings, the subconscious mind of the subject was the healer. In all ages, unofficial healers have obtained remarkable results in cases where authorized medical skill has failed. This gives cause for thought. How do these healers in all parts of the world effect their cures? The answer to all these healings is due to the blind belief of the sick person, which released the healing power resident in his subconscious mind. Many of the remedies and methods employed were rather strange and fantastic, which fired the imagination of the patients, causing an aroused emotional state. This state of mind facilitated the suggestion of health and was accepted both by the conscious and subconscious mind of the sick. This will be elaborated on further in the next chapter. Biblical Accounts of the Use of the Subconscious Powers What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Note the difference in tenses. The inspired writer tells us to believe and accept as true the fact that our desire has already been accomplished and fulfilled, that it is already completed, and that its realization will follow as a thing in the future. The success of this technique depends on the confident conviction that the thought, the idea, the picture is already a fact in mind. In order for anything to have substance in the realm of mind, it must be thought of as actually existing there. Here, in a few cryptic words, is a concise and specific direction for making use of the creative power of thought by impressing upon the subconscious the particular thing which you desire. Your thought, idea, plan or purpose is as real on its own plane as your hand or your heart. In following the biblical technique, you completely eliminate from your mind all consideration of conditions, circumstances, or anything which might imply adverse contingencies. You are planting a seed, a concept, in the mind which, if you leave it undisturbed, will infallibly germinate into external fruitation. The prime condition is faith. Over and over again you read in the Bible, according to your faith is it done unto you. If you plant certain types of seeds in the ground, you have faith they will grow after their kind. This is the way of seeds and trusting the laws of growth and agriculture, you know that these seeds will come forth after their kind. Faith as mentioned in the Bible is a way of thinking, an attitude of mind, an inner certitude. Knowing that the idea you fully accept in your conscious mind will be embodied in your subconscious mind and made manifest. Faith is, in a sense, accepting as true what your reason and senses deny. For example, a shutting out of the little, rational, analytical, conscious mind and embracing an attitude of complete reliance on the inner power of your subconscious mind. Miracles at various shrines throughout the world. It is an established fact that cures have taken place at various shrines throughout the world, such as in Japan, India, Europe, and America. I have visited several of the famous shrines in Japan. At the world-famous shrine called Daibutsu is a gigantic divinity of bronze where Buddha is seated with folding hands, and the head is inclined in an attitude of profound contemplative ecstasy. It is 42 feet in height and is called the Great Buddha. Here I saw young and old making offerings at its feet. Money, fruit, rice, and oranges were offered. Candles were lit, incense was burned, and prayers of petition recited. The guide explained the chant of a young girl as she murmured a prayer, bowed low, and placed two oranges as an offering. She also lit a candle. He said she had lost her voice and it was restored at the shrine. She was thanking Buddha for restoring her voice. 
She had the simple faith that Buddha would give her back her singing voice if she followed a certain ritual, fasted, and made certain offerings. All this helped to kindle faith and expectancy, resulting in a conditioning of her mind to the point of belief. Her subconscious mind responded to her belief. To illustrate further the power of imagination and blind belief, I will relate the case of a relative of mine who had tuberculosis. His lungs were badly diseased. His son decided to heal his father. He came home to Perth, Western Australia, where his father lived, and said to him that he had met a monk who had returned from one of the healing shrines in Europe. This monk sold him a piece of the true cross. He said that he gave the monk the equivalent of $500 for it. This young man had actually picked up a splinter of wood from the sidewalk, went to the jewelers, and had it set in a ring so that it looked real. He told his father that just touching the ring or the cross healed many. He inflamed and fired his father's imagination to the point that the old gentleman snatched the ring from him, placed it over his chest, prayed silently, and went to sleep. In the morning he was healed. All the clinic's tests proved negative. You know, of course, it was not the splinter of wood from the sidewalk that healed him. It was his imagination aroused to an intense degree, plus the confident expectancy of a perfect healing. Imagination was joined to faith or subjective feeling, and the union of the two brought about a healing. The father never learned of the trick that had played upon him. If he had, he probably would have had a relapse. He remained completely cured and passed away 15 years later at the age of 89. One Universal Healing Principle It is a well-known fact that all of the various schools of healing effect cures of the most wonderful character. The most obvious conclusion which strikes your mind is that there must be some underlying principle which is common to them all, namely the subconscious mind and the one process of healing is faith. It will now be in order to recall to your mind once more the following fundamental truths. First, that you must possess mental functions which have been distinguished by designating one of the conscious mind and the other the subconscious mind. Secondly, your subconscious mind is constantly amenable to the power of suggestion. Furthermore, your subconscious mind has complete control of the functions, conditions, and sensations of your body. I venture to believe that all the readers of this book are familiar with the fact that symptoms of almost any disease can be induced in hypnotic subjects by suggestion. For example, a subject in the hypnotic state can develop a high temperature, flushed face, or chills according to the nature of the suggestion given. By experiment, you can suggest to the person that he is paralyzed and cannot walk. It will be so. By illustration, you can hold a cup of cold water under the nose of the hypnotic subject and tell him, this is full of pepper, smell it, he will proceed to sneeze. What do you think caused him to sneeze, the water or the suggestion? If a man says he is allergic to Timothy grass, you can place a synthetic flower or an empty glass in front of his nose when he is in a hypnotic state and tell him it is Timothy grass. He will portray the usual allergic symptoms. This indicates that the cause of the disease is in the mind. The healing of the disease can also take place mentally. You realize that remarkable healings take place through osteopathy, chiropractic medicine, and naturopathy, as well as through all the various religious bodies throughout the world. But it is obvious that all of these healings are brought about through the subconscious mind, the only healer there is. Notice how it heals the cut on your face caused by shaving. It knows exactly how to do it. The doctor dresses the wound and says, nature heals it. Nature refers to natural law, the law of the subconscious mind or self-preservation, which is the function of the subconscious mind. The instinct of self-preservation is the first law of nature. Your strongest instinct is the most potent of all auto-suggestions. Widely different theories. It would be tedious and unprofitable to discuss to any great extent the numerous theories advanced by different religious sects and prayer therapy groups. There are a great number who claim that because their theory produces results, it is, therefore, the correct one. This, as explained in this chapter, cannot be true. You are aware that there are all types of healings. Franz Ant Mesmer, an Australian physician from 1734 to 1815, who practiced in Paris, discovered that by applying magnets to the diseased body, he could cure that disease miraculously. 
He also performed cures with various other pieces of glass and metals. He discontinued this form of healing and claimed that his cures were due to animal magnetism, theorizing that his substance was projected from the healer to the patient. His method of treating disease from then on was by hypnotism, which was called mesmerism in his day. Other physicians said that all his healings were due to suggestion and nothing else. All of these groups, such as psychiatrists, psychologists, osteopaths, chiropractors, physicians, and all the churches are using the one universal power resident in the subconscious mind. Each may proclaim the healings are due to their theory. The process of all healing is a definite, positive mental attitude, an inner attitude, or a way of thinking called faith. Healing is due to a confident expectancy, which acts as a powerful suggestion to the subconscious mind, releasing its healing potency. One man does not heal by a different power than another. It is true he may have his own theory or method. There is only one process of healing, and that is faith. There is only one healing power, namely your subconscious mind. Select the theory and method you prefer. You can rest assured if you have faith, you shall get results. Views of Paracelsus Philippus Paracelsus, a famous Swiss alchemist and physician who lived from 1493 to 1541, was a great healer in his day. He stated what is now an obvious scientific fact when he uttered these words, Whether the object of your faith be real or false, you will nevertheless obtain the same effects. Thus, if I believed in St. Peter's statue as I should have believed in St. Peter himself, I shall obtain the same effects that I should have obtained from St. Peter. But that is superstition. Faith, however, produces miracles, and whether it is true or false faith, it will always produce the same wonders. The views of Paracelsus were also entertained in the 16th century by Pietro Pomponazzi, an Italian philosopher and contemporary of Paracelsus, who said, We can easily conceive the marvelous effects which confidence and imagination can produce, particularly when both qualities are reciprocated between the subjects and the person who influences them. The cures attributed to the influence of certain relics are the effect of their imagination and confidence. Quacks and philosophers know that if the bones of any skeleton were put in place of the saint's bones, the sick would nonetheless experience beneficial effects if they believed that they were veritable relics. Then, if you believe in the bones of saints to heal, or if you believe in the healing power of certain waters, you will get results because of the powerful suggestion given to your subconscious mind. It is the latter that does the healing. Bermheiten's Experiments Hippolyte Bernheim, professor of medicine at Nancy, France from 1910 to 1919, was the expounder of the fact that the suggestion of the physician to the patient was exerted through the subconscious mind. Bernheim, in his Suggestive Therapeutics, page 197, tells a story of a man with paralysis of the tongue which had yielded to no form of treatment. His doctor told the patient that he had a new instrument with which he promised to heal him. He introduced a pocket thermometer into the patient's mouth. The patient imagined it to be the instrument which was to save him. In a few moments, he cried out joyfully that he could once more move his tongue freely. Among our cases, continues Bermheim, facts of the same sort will be found. A young girl came into my office having suffered from complete loss of speech for nearly four weeks. After making sure of the diagnosis, I told my students that loss of speech sometimes yielded instantly to electricity, which might act simply by its suggestive influence. I sent for the induction apparatus. I applied my hand over the larynx and moved a little and said, Now you can speak aloud. In an instant, I made her saw A, then B, then Maria. She continued to speak distinctively. The loss of voice had disappeared. Here, Bermheim is showing the power of faith and expectancy on the part of the patient, which acts as a powerful suggestion to the subconscious mind. Producing a blister by suggestion Bermheim states that he produced a blister on the back of a patient's neck by applying a postage stamp and suggesting to the patient that it was a fly plaster. 
This has been confirmed by the experiments and experiences of many doctors in many parts of the world, which leave no doubt that structural change are a possible result of oral suggestion to patients. The Cause of Bloody Stigmata In Hudson's Law of Psychic Phenomena, page 153, he states, Hemorrhages and bloody stigmata are induced in certain subjects by means of suggestion. Dr. M. Baru put a subject into the somnambulistic condition and gave him the following suggestion. At 4 o'clock this afternoon, after the hypnosis, you will come into my office, sit down in the armchair, cross your arms upon your breast, and your nose will begin to bleed. At the hour appointed, the young man did as directed. Several drops of blood came from the left nostril. On another occasion, the same investigator traced the patient's name on both his forearms with the dull point of an instrument. Then, when the patient was in the somnambulistic condition, he said, At four o'clock this afternoon, you will go to sleep and your arms will bleed along the lines which I have traced, and your name will appear written on your arms in letters of blood. He was watched at four o'clock and seen to fall asleep. On the left arm, the letters stood out in bright relief, and in several places there were drops of blood. The letters were still visible three months afterward, although they had gradually grown faint. These facts demonstrate at once the correctness of the two fundamental propositions previously stated, namely the constant amenability of the subconscious mind to the power of suggestion and the perfect control which the subconscious mind exercises over the functions, sensations, and conditions of the body. All the foregoing phenomena dramatize vividly abnormal conditions induced by suggestion and are conclusive proof that as a man thinketh in his heart, subconscious mind, so is he. Chapter 5 Mental Healings in Modern Times Everyone is definitely concerned with the healing of bodily conditions and human affairs. What is it that heals? Where is this healing power? These are questions asked by everyone. The answer is that this healing power is the subconscious mind of each person and a changed mental attitude on the part of the sick person releases this healing power. No mental or religious science practitioner, psychologist, psychiatrist, or medical doctor ever healed a patient. There is an old saying, the doctor dresses the wound, but God heals it. The psychologist or psychiatrist proceeds to remove the mental blocks in the patient so that the healing principle may be released, restoring the patient to health. Likewise, the surgeon removes the physical block, enabling the healing currents to function normally. No physician, surgeon, or mental science practitioner claims he healed the patient. The one healing power is called by many names, nature, life, God, creative intelligence, and subconscious power. As previously outlined, there are many different methods used to remove the mental, emotional, and physical blocks which inhibit the flow of the healing life principle animating all of us. The healing principle resident in your subconscious mind can and will, if properly directed by you or some other person, heal your mind and body of all disease. This healing principle is operative in all men regardless of creed, color, or race. You do not have to belong to some particular church in order to use and participate in this healing process. Your subconscious will heal the burn or cut on your hand, even though you profess to be an atheist or agnostic. The modern mental therapeutic procedure is based on the truth that the infinite intelligence and power of your subconscious mind responds according to your faith. The mental science practitioner or minister follows the injunction of the Bible. For example, he goes into his closet and shuts the door, which means he stills his mind, relaxes, lets go, and thinks of the infinite healing presence within him. He closes the door of his mind to all outside distractions as well as appearances, and then he quietly and knowingly turns over his request or desire to his subconscious mind, realizing that the intelligence of his mind will answer him according to his specific needs. The most wonderful thing to know is this. Imagine the end desired and feel its reality. Then the infinite life principle will respond to your conscious choice and your conscious request. This is the meaning of believe you have received and you shall receive. 
This is what the modern mental scientist does when he practices prayer therapy. One process of healing. There is only one universal healing principle operating through everything. The cat, the dog, the tree, the grass, the wind, the earth. For everything is alive. This life principle operates through the animal, vegetable, or mineral kingdoms as instinct and the law of growth. Man is consciously aware of this life principle, and he can consciously direct it to bless himself in countless ways. There are many different approaches, techniques, and methods in using the universal power, but there is only one process of healing, which is faith. For according to your faith is it done unto you. The Law of Belief All religions of the world represent forms of belief, and these beliefs are explained in many ways. The Law of Life is belief. What do you believe about yourself, life, and the universe? It is done unto you as you believe. Belief is a thought in your mind which causes the power of your subconscious to be distributed into all phases of your life according to your thinking habits. You must realize the Bible is not talking about your belief in some ritual, ceremony, form, institution, man, or formula. It is talking about belief itself. The belief of your mind is simply the thought of your mind. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. It is foolish to believe in something to hurt or harm you. Remember, it is not the thing believed in that hurts or harms you, but the belief or thought in your mind, which creates the result. All your experiences, all your actions, and all the events and circumstances of your life are but the reflections and reactions to your own thought. Prayer therapy is the combined function of the conscious and subconscious mind scientifically directed. Prayer therapy is the synchronized, harmonious, and intelligent function of the conscious and subconscious levels of mind specifically directed for a definite purpose. In scientific prayer or prayer therapy, you must know what you are doing and why you are doing it. You trust the law of healing. Prayer therapy is sometimes referred to as mental treatment, and another term is scientific prayer. In prayer therapy, you consciously choose a certain idea, mental picture, or plan which you desire to experience. You realize your capacity to convey this idea or mental image to your subconscious by feeling the reality of the state assumed. As you remain faithful in your mental attitude, your prayer will be answered. Prayer therapy is a definite mental action for a definite specific purpose. Let us suppose that you decide to heal a certain difficulty by prayer therapy. You are aware that your problem or sickness, whatever it may be, must be caused by negative thoughts charged with fear and lodged in your subconscious mind, and that if you can succeed in cleansing your mind of these thoughts, you will get a healing. You therefore turn to the healing power within your own subconscious mind and remind yourself of its infinite power and intelligence and its capacity to heal all conditions. As you dwell on these truths, your fear will begin to dissolve, and your recollection of these truths also corrects the erroneous beliefs. You give thanks for the healing that you know will come, and then you keep your mind off the difficulty until you feel guided, after an interval, to pray again. While you are praying, you absolutely refuse to give any power to the negative conditions or to admit for a second that the healing will not come. This attitude of mind brings about the harmonious union of the conscious and subconscious mind, which releases the healing power. Faith Healing What it means and how blind faith works What is popularly termed faith healing is not the faith mentioned in the Bible, which means knowledge of the interaction of the conscious and subconscious mind. A faith healer is one who heals without any real scientific understanding of the powers and forces involved. He may claim that he has a special gift of healing and the sick person's blind belief in him or his powers may bring results. The voodoo doctor in South Africa and other parts of the world may heal by incantations or touching the so-called bones of saints or anything else may heal a person, which causes the patients to honestly believe in the method or process. Any method which causes you to move from fear and worry to faith and expectancy will heal. There are many persons, each of whom claims that because his personal theory produces results, it is, therefore, the correct one. 
This, as already explained in this chapter, cannot be true. To illustrate how blind faith works, you will recall our discussion of the Swiss physician, Franz Anton Mesmer. In 1776, he claimed many cures when he stroked diseased bodies with artificial magnets. Later on, he threw away his magnets and evolved the theory of animal magnetism. This he held to be a fluid, which pervades the universe, but is most active in the human organism. He claimed that this magnetic fluid, which was going forth from him to his patients, healed them. People flocked to him, and many wonderful cures were effected. Mesmer moved to Paris, and while there, the government appointed a commission composed of physicians and members of the Academy of Science, of which Benjamin Franklin was a member, to investigate his cures. The report admitted the leading facts claimed by Mesmer, but held that there was no evidence to prove the correctness of his magnetic fluid theory, and said the effects were due to the imagination of the patients. Soon after this, Mesmer was driven into exile and died in 1815. Shortly afterwards, Dr. Braid of Manchester undertook to show that magnetic fluid had nothing to do with the production of the healings of Dr. Mesmer. Dr. Braid discovered that patients could be thrown into hypnotic sleep by suggestion, during which many of the well-known phenomena ascribed to magnetism by Mesmer could be produced. You can readily see that all these cures were undoubtedly brought about by the active imagination of the patients together with a powerful suggestion of health to their subconscious minds. All this could be termed blind faith, as there was no understanding in those days as to how the cures were brought about. Subjective Faith and What It Means you will recall the proposition, which needs not be repeated at length, that the subjective or subconscious mind of an individual is as amenable to the control of his own conscious or objective mind as it is by the suggestions of another. It follows that whatever may be your objective belief, if you will assume to have faith actively or passively, your subconscious mind will be controlled by the suggestion and your desire will be fulfilled. The faith required in mental healings is a purely subjective faith, and it is attainable upon the cessation of active opposition on the part of the objective or conscious mind. In the healing of the body, it is, of course, desirable to secure the concurrent faith of both the conscious and subconscious mind. However, it is not always essential if you will enter into a state of passivity or receptivity by relaxing the mind and the body and getting into a sleepy state. In this drowsy state, your passivity becomes receptive to subjective impression. Recently, I was asked by a man, how is it that I got a healing through a minister? I did not believe what he said when he told me that there is no such thing as disease and that matter does not exist. This man at first thought his intelligence was being insulted, and he protested against such a palpable absurdity. The explanation is simple. He was quieted by soothing words and told to get into a perfectly passive condition, to say nothing and think of nothing for the time being. His minister also became passive and affirm quietly, peacefully, and constantly for about one half hour that this man would have perfect health, peace, harmony, and wholeness. He felt immense relief and was restored to health. It is easy to see that his subjective faith had been made manifest by his passivity under treatment, and the suggestions of perfect healthfulness by the minister were conveyed to his subconscious mind. The two subjective minds were then in rapport. The minister was not handicapped by antagonistic auto-suggestions of the patient arising from objective doubt of the power of the healer or the correctness of the theory. In this sleepy, drowsy state, the conscious mind resistance is reduced to a minimum, and results followed. The subconscious mind of the patient, being necessarily controlled by such suggestion, exercised its functions in accordance therewith, and a healing followed. The Meaning of Absent Treatment Suppose you learned that your mother was sick in New York City and you lived in Los Angeles. Your mother would not be physically present where you are, but you could pray for her. It is the Father within which doeth the work. The creative law of mind, subconscious mind, serves you and will do the work. Its response to you is automatic. Your treatment is for the purpose of inducing an inner realization of health and harmony in your mentality. 
This inner realization acting through the subconscious mind operates through your mother's subconscious mind as there is but one creative mind. Your thoughts of health, vitality, and perfection operate through the one universal subjective mind and set a law in motion on the subjective side of life which manifests through her body as a healing. In the mind principle there is no time or space. It is the same mind that operates through your mother no matter where she may be. In reality there is no absent treatment as opposed to present treatment for the universal mind is omnipresent. You do not try to send out thoughts or hold a thought. Your treatment is a conscious movement of thought and as you become conscious of the qualities of health, well-being and relaxation, these qualities will be resurrected in the experience of your mother and results will follow. The following is a perfect example of what is called absent treatment. Recently, a listener of our radio program in Los Angeles prayed as follows for her mother in New York who had a coronary thrombosis. The healing presence is right where my mother is. Her bodily condition is but a reflection of her thought life like shadows cast on the screen. I know that in order to change the images on the screen, I must change the projection reel. My mind is the projection reel. And now I project in my own mind the image of wholeness, harmony, and perfect health for my mother. This infinite healing presence which created my mother's body and all her organs is now saturating every atom of her being and a river of peace flows through every cell of her body. The doctors are divinely guided and directed and whoever touches my mother is guided to do the right thing. I know that disease has no ultimate reality. If it had, no one could be healed. I now align myself with the infinite principle of love and life and I know and agree that harmony, health, and peace are now being expressed in my mother's body. She prayed in the above manner several times daily and her mother had a most remarkable recovery after a few days, much to the amazement of her specialist. He complimented her on her great faith in the power of God. The conclusion arrived at in the daughter's mind set the creative law of mind in motion on the subjective side of life which manifested itself through her mother's body as perfect health and harmony. What the daughter felt as true about her mother was simultaneously resurrected in the experience of her mother, releasing the kinetic action of the subconscious mind. A psychologist friend of mine told me that one of his lungs was infected. X-rays and analysis showed the presence of tuberculosis. At night, before going to sleep, he would quietly affirm, every cell, nerve, tissue, and muscle of my lungs are now being made whole, pure, and perfect. My whole body is being restored to health and harmony. These are not his exact words, but they represent the essence of what he affirmed. A complete healing followed in about a month's time. Subsequent x-rays showed a perfect healing. I wanted to know his method, so I asked him why he repeated the words prior to sleep. Here is his reply. The kinetic action of the subconscious mind continues throughout your sleep time period. Hence, give the subconscious mind something good to work on as you drop off into slumber. This was a very wise answer. In thinking of harmony and perfect health, he never mentioned his trouble by name. I strongly suggest that you cease talking about your ailments or giving them a name. The only sap from which they draw life is your attention and fear of them. Like the above mentioned psychologist, become a mental surgeon. Then your troubles will be cut off like dead branches are pruned from a tree. If you are constantly naming your aches and symptoms, you inhibit the kinetic action, which means the release of the healing power and energy of your subconscious mind. Furthermore, by the law of your own mind, these imaginings tend to take shape as the thing I greatly feared. Fill your mind with the great truths of life and walk forward in the light of love. Chapter 6 Practical Techniques in Mental Healings An engineer has a technique and a process for building a bridge or an engine. Like the engineer, your mind also has a technique for governing, controlling, and directing your life. You must realize that methods and techniques are primary. In building the Golden Gate Bridge, the chief engineer understood mathematical principles, stresses, and strains. Secondly, he had a picture of the ideal bridge across the bay. 
The third step was his application of the tried and proven methods by which the principles were implemented until the bridge took form and we drive on it. There also are techniques and methods by which your prayers are answered. If your prayer is answered, there is a way in which it is answered, and this is a scientific way. Nothing happens by chance. This is a world of law and order. In this chapter, you will find practical techniques for the unfolding and nurture of your spiritual life. Your prayers must not remain up in the air like a balloon. They must go somewhere and accomplish something in your life. When we come to analyze prayer, we discover there are many different approaches and methods. We will not consider in this book the formal, ritual prayers used in religious services. These have important place in group worship. We are immediately concerned with the methods of personal prayer as it is applied in your daily life and as it is used to help others. Prayer is the formulation of an idea concerning something we wish to accomplish. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire. Your desire is your prayer. It comes out of your deepest needs and it reveals the things you want in life. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That is really prayer. Life's hunger and thirst for peace, harmony, health, joy, and all the other blessings of life. The passing over technique for impregnating the subconscious. This consists essentially in inducing the subconscious mind to take over your request as handed it by the conscious mind. This passing over is best accomplished in the Riviere-like state. Know that in your deeper mind are infinite intelligence and infinite power. Just calmly think over what you want. See it coming into fuller fruitation from this moment forward. Be like the little girl who had a very bad cough and a sore throat. She declared firmly and repeatedly, it is passing away now. It is passing away now. It passed away in about an hour. Use this technique with complete simplicity and naivety. Your subconscious will accept your blueprint. If you were building a new home for yourself and family, you know that you would be intensely interested in regard to the blueprint for your home. You would see to it that the builders conform to the blueprint. You would watch the material and select only the best wood, steel, in fact, the best of everything. What about your mental home and your mental blueprint for happiness and abundance? All your experiences and everything that enters into your life depend upon the nature of the mental building blocks which you use in the construction of your mental home. If your blueprint is full of mental patterns of fear, worry, anxiety, or lack, and if you are despondent, doubtful, and cynical, then the texture of the mental material you are weaving into your mind will come forth as more toil, care, tension, anxiety, and limitation of all kinds. The most fundamental and the most far-reaching activity in life is that which you build into your mentality every waking hour. Your word is silent and invisible. Nevertheless, it is real. You are building your mental home all the time, and your thought and mental imagery represent your blueprint. Hour by hour, moment by moment, you can build radiant health, success, and happiness by the thoughts you think, the ideas which you harbor, the beliefs that you accept, and the scenes that you rehearse in the hidden studio of your mind. This stately mansion upon the construction of which you are perpetually engaged is your personality, your identity in this plane, your whole life story on this earth. Get a new blueprint, build silently by realizing peace, harmony, joy, and goodwill in the present moment. By dwelling upon these things and claiming them, your subconscious will accept your blueprint and bring all these things to pass. By their fruits ye shall know them. The Science and Art of True Prayer The term science means knowledge, which is coordinated, arranged, and systematized. Let us think of the science and art of true prayer as it deals with the fundamental principles of life and the techniques and processes by which they can be demonstrated in your life, as well as in the life of every human being when he applies them faithfully. The art is your technique or process, and the science behind it is the definite response of creative mind to your mental picture or thought. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. 
Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Here you are told you shall receive that for which you ask. It shall be opened to you when you knock, and you shall find that for which you are searching. This teaching implies the definiteness of mental and spiritual laws. There is always a direct response from the infinite intelligence of your subconscious mind to your conscious thinking. If you ask for bread, you will not receive a stone. You must ask believing, if you are to receive. Your mind moves from the thought to the thing. Unless there is first an image in the mind, it cannot move, for there would be nothing for it to move toward. Your prayer, which is your mental act, must be accepted as an image in your mind before the power from your subconscious will play upon it and make it productive. You must reach a point of acceptance in your mind, an unqualified and undisputed state of agreement. This contemplation should be accompanied by a feeling of joy and restfulness in foreseeing the certain accomplishment of your desire. The sound basis for the art and science of true prayer is your knowledge and complete confidence that the movement of your conscious mind will gain a definite response from your subconscious mind, which is one with boundless wisdom and infinite power. By following this procedure, your prayers will be answered. The Visualization Technique The easiest and most obvious way to formulate an idea is to visualize it, to see it in your mind's eye as vividly as if it were alive. You can see with the naked eye only what already exists in the external world. In a similar way, that which you can visualize in your mind's eye already exists in the invisible realms of your mind. Any picture which you have in your mind is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. What you form in your imagination is as real as any part of your body. The idea and the thought are real and will one day appear in your objective world if you are faithful to your mental image. This process of thinking forms impressions in your mind. These impressions in turn become manifested as facts and experiences in your life. The builder visualizes the type of building he wants. He sees it as he desires it to be completed. His imagery and thought processes become a plastic mold from which the building will emerge, a beautiful or an ugly one, a skyscraper or a very low one. His mental imagery is projected as it is drawn on paper. Eventually, the contractor and his workers gather the essential materials and the building progresses until it stands finished conforming perfectly to the mental patterns of the architect. I use the visualization technique prior to speaking from the platform. I quiet the wheels of my mind in order that I may present to the subconscious mind my images of thought. Then I picture the entire auditorium and the seats filled with men and women and each one of them illumined and inspired by the infinite healing presence within each one. I see them as radiant, happy, and free. Having first built up the idea in my imagination, I quietly sustain it there as a mental picture which I imagine I hear men and women saying, I am healed. I feel wonderful. I've had an instantaneous healing. I'm transformed. I keep this up for about 10 minutes or more, knowing and feeling that each person's mind and body are saturated with love, wholeness, beauty, and perfection. My awareness grows to the point where, in my mind, I can actually hear the voices of the multitude proclaiming their health and happiness. Then I release the whole picture and go on to the platform. Almost every Sunday, some people stop and say that their prayers were answered. Mental Movie Method The Chinese say, a picture is worth a thousand words. William James, the father of American psychology, stressed the fact that the subconscious mind will bring to pass any picture held in the mind and backed by faith. Act as though I am and I will be. A number of years ago, I was in the Middle West lecturing in several states, and I desired to have a permanent location in the general area from which I could serve those who desired help. I traveled far, but the desire did not leave my mind. One evening, while in a hotel in Spokane, Washington, I relaxed completely on a couch, immobilized my attention, and in a quiet, passive manner, imagined that I was talking to a large audience, saying, in effect, I am glad to be here. I have prayed for the ideal opportunity. I saw, in my mind's eye, the imaginary audience, and I felt the reality of it all. 
I played the role of the actor, dramatized this mental movie, and felt satisfied that this picture was being conveyed to my subconscious mind, which would bring it to pass in its own way. The next morning, on awakening, I felt a great sense of peace and satisfaction, and in a few days' time, I received a telegram asking me to take over an organization in the Midwest, which I did, and I enjoyed it immensely for several years. The method outlined here appeals to many who have described it as the mental movie method. I have received numerous letters from people who listen to my radio talks and weekly public lectures telling me of the wonderful results they get using this technique in the sale of their property. I suggest to those who have homes or property for sale that they satisfy themselves in their own mind that their price is right. Then I claim that the infinite intelligence is attracting to them the buyer who really wants to have the property and who will love it and prosper in it. After having done this, I suggest that they quiet their mind, relax, let go, and get into a drowsy, sleepy state, which reduces all mental effort to a minimum. Then they are to picture the check in their hands, rejoice in the check, give thanks for the check, and go off to sleep feeling the natureness of the whole mental movie created in their own mind. They must act as though it were an objective reality, and the subconscious mind will take it as an impression, and through the deeper currents of the mind the buyer and the seller are brought together. A mental picture held in the mind, backed by faith, will come to pass. The Baudoin Technique Charles Baudoin was a professor at the Roswell Institute in France. He was a brilliant psychotherapist and a research director of the New Nancy School of Healing, who in 1910 taught that the best way to impress the subconscious mind was to enter into a drowsy, sleepy state, or a state akin to sleep in which all effort was reduced to a minimum. Then, in a quiet, passive, receptive way, by reflection, he would convey the idea to the subconscious. The following is his formula. A very simple way of securing this impregnation of the subconscious mind is to condense the idea which is to be the object of suggestion, to sum it up in a brief phrase which can be readily graven on the memory, and to repeat it over and over again as a lullaby. Some years ago, a young lady in Los Angeles was engaged in a prolonged, bitter family lawsuit over a will. Her husband had bequeathed his entire estate to her, and his sons and daughters by a previous marriage were bitterly fighting to break the will. The Baudoin technique was outlined to her, and this is what she said. She relaxed her body in an armchair, entered into the sleepy state, and, as suggested, condensed the idea of her need into a phrase consisting of six words easily graven on the memory. It is finished in divine order. The significance to her of these words meant that infinite intelligence operating through the laws of her subconscious mind would bring about a harmonious adjustment through the principle of harmony. She continued this procedure every night for about ten nights. After she got into a sleepy state, she would affirm slowly, quietly, and feelingly the statement, It is finished in divine order over and over again, feeling a sense of inner peace and an all-pervading tranquility. Then she went off into her deep, normal sleep. On the morning of the eleventh day, following the use of the above technique, she awakened with a sense of well-being, a conviction that it was finished. Her attorney called her the same day, saying that the opposing attorney and his clients were willing to settle. A harmonious agreement was reached and litigation was discontinued. The Sleeping Technique By entering into a sleepy, drowsy state, effort is reduced to a minimum. The conscious mind is submerged to a great extent when in a sleepy state. The reason for this is that the highest degree of outcropping of the subconscious occurs prior to sleep and just after we awaken. In this state, the negative thoughts, which tend to neutralize your desire and so prevent acceptance by your subconscious mind, are no longer present. Suppose you want to get rid of a destructive habit. Assume a comfortable posture, relax your body, and be still. Get into a sleepy state, and in that sleepy state, say quietly, over and over again as a lullaby, I am completely free from this habit. Harmony and peace of mind reign supreme. Repeat the above slowly, quietly, and lovingly for five or ten minutes night and morning. Each time you repeat the words, the emotional value becomes greater. 
When the urge comes to repeat the negative habit, repeat the above formula out loud by yourself. By this means you induce the subconscious to accept the idea and a healing follows. The Thank You Technique In the Bible, Paul recommends that we make known our request with praise and thanksgiving. Some extraordinary results follow this simple method of prayer. The thankful heart is always close to the creative forces of the universe, causing countless blessings to flow toward it by the law of reciprocal relationship based on a cosmic law of action and reaction. For instance, a father promises his son a car for graduation. The boy has not yet received the car, but he is very thankful and happy and is as joyous as though he had actually received the car. He knows his father will fulfill his promise, and he is full of gratitude and joy even though he has not received the car, objectively speaking. He has, however, received it with joy and thankfulness in his mind. I shall illustrate how Mr. Broke applied this technique with excellent results. He said, Bills are piling up. I am out of work. I have three children and no money. What shall I do? Regularly, every night and morning for a period of about three weeks, he repeated the words, Thank you, Father, for my wealth, in a relaxed, peaceful manner until the feeling or mood of thankfulness dominated his mind. He imagined he was addressing the infinite power and intelligence within him, knowing, of course, that he could not see the creative intelligence or infinite mind. He was seeing with the inner eye of spiritual perception, realizing that his thought image of wealth was the first cause relative to the money, position, and food he needed. His thought feeling was the substance of wealth untrammeled by antecedent conditions of any kind. By repeating, Thank you, Father, over and over again, his mind and heart were lifted up to the point of acceptance, and when fear, thoughts of lack, poverty, and distress came into his mind, he would say, Thank you, Father, as often as necessary. He knew that as he kept up the thankful attitude, he would recondition his mind to the idea of wealth, which is what happened. The sequel to his prayer is very interesting. After praying in the above-mentioned manner, he met a former employer of his on the street whom had not seen him for 20 years. The man offered him a very lucrative position and advanced him $500 on a temporary loan. Today, Mr. Broke is vice president of the company for which he works. His recent remark to me was, I shall never forget the wonders of thank you, Father. It has worked wonders for me. The Affirmative Method the effectiveness of an affirmation is determined largely by your understanding of the truth and the meaning back of the words. In praying, use not vain repetition. Therefore, the power of your affirmation lies in the intelligent application of definite and specific positives. For example, a boy adds three and three and puts down seven on the blackboard. The teacher affirms with mathematical certainty that three and three are six. Therefore, the boy changes his figures accordingly. The teacher's statement did not make 3 and 3 equal 6 because the latter was already a mathematical truth. The mathematical truth caused the boy to rearrange the figures on the blackboard. It is abnormal to be sick. It is normal to be healthy. Health is the truth of your being. When you affirm health, harmony, and peace for yourself or another, and when you realize these are universal principles of your own being, you will rearrange the negative patterns of your subconscious mind based on your faith and understanding of that which you affirm. The result of the affirmative process of prayer depends on your conforming to the principles of life, regardless of appearances. Consider for a moment that there is a principle of mathematics and none of error. There is a principle of truth, but none of dishonesty. There is a principle of intelligence, but none of ignorance. There is a principle of harmony, and none of discord. There is a principle of health, but none of disease. And there is a principle of abundance, but none of poverty. The affirmative method was chosen by the author for use on his sister, who was to be operated on for the removal of gallstones in a hospital in England. The condition described was based on the diagnosis of hospital tests and the usual x-ray procedures. She asked me to pray for her. We were separated geographically about 6,500 miles, but there is no time or space in the mind principle.
Infinite mind or intelligence is present in its entirety at every point simultaneously. I withdrew all thought from the contemplation of symptoms and from the corporeal personality altogether. I affirmed as follows. This prayer is for my sister Catherine. She is relaxed and at peace, poised, balanced, serene, and calm. The healing intelligence of her subconscious mind, which created her body, is now transforming every cell, nerve, tissue, muscle, and bone of her being according to the perfect pattern of all organs lodged in her subconscious mind. Silently, quietly, all distorted thought patterns in her subconscious mind are removed and dissolved, and the vitality, Wholeness and beauty of the life principle are made manifest in every atom of her being. She is now open and receptive to the healing currents which are flowing through her like a river, restoring her to perfect health, harmony, and peace. All distortions and ugly images are now washed away by the infinite ocean of love and peace flowing through her, and it is so. I affirm the above several times a day, and at the end of two weeks, my sister had an examination, which showed a remarkable healing, and the x-ray proved negative. To affirm is to state that it is so, and as you maintain this attitude of mind as true, regardless of all evidence to the contrary, you will receive an answer to your prayer. Your thought can only affirm, for even if you deny something, you are actually affirming the presence of what you deny. Repeating an affirmation, knowing what you are saying and why you are saying it, leads the mind to that state of consciousness where it accepts that which you state as true. Keep on affirming the truths of life until you get the subconscious reaction which satisfies. The Argumentative Method This method is just what the word implies. It stems from the procedure of Dr. Fianus Parkhurst Quimby of Maine. Dr. Quimby, a pioneer in mental and spiritual healing, lived and practiced in Belfast, Maine, about 100 years ago. A book called The Quimby Manuscripts, published in 1921 by Thomas Y. Crow Company, New York City, and edited by Horatio Dresser, is available in your library. This book gives newspaper accounts of this man's remarkable results in prayer treatment of the sick. Quimby duplicated many of the healing miracles recorded in the Bible. In brief, the argumentative method employed according to Quimby consists of spiritual reasoning where you conceive the patient and yourself that his sickness is due to his false belief, groundless fears, and negative patterns lodged in his subconscious mind. You reason it out clearly in your mind and convince your patient that the disease or ailment is due only to a distorted, twisted pattern of thought which has taken form in his body. This wrong belief in some external power and external causes has now externalized itself as sickness and can be changed by changing the thought patterns. You explain to the sick person that the basis of all healing is a change of belief. You also point out that the subconscious mind created the body and all its organs. Therefore, it knows how to heal it, can heal it, and is doing so now as you speak. You argue in the courtroom of your mind that the disease is a shadow of the mind based on disease-soaked, morbid thought imagery. You continue to build up all the evidence you can muster on behalf of the healing power within, which created all the organs in the first place, and which has a perfect pattern of every cell, nerve, and tissue within it. Then you render a verdict in the courthouse of your mind in favor of yourself or your patient. You liberate the sick one by faith and spiritual understanding. Your mental and spiritual evidence is overwhelming. There being but one mind, what you feel as true will be resurrected in the experience of the patient. This procedure is essentially the argumentative method used by Dr. Quimby of Maine from 1849 to 1869. The absolute method is like modern sound wave therapy. Many people throughout the world practice this form of prayer treatment with wonderful results. The person using the absolute method mentions the name of the patient, such as John Jones, then quietly and silently thinks of God and his qualities and attributes, such as God is all bliss, boundless love, infinite intelligence, all-powerful, boundless wisdom, absolute harmony, indescribable beauty, and perfection. As he quietly thinks along these lines, he is lifted up in consciousness into a new spiritual wavelength, 
at which time he feels the infinite ocean of God's love is now dissolving everything unlike itself in the mind and body of John Jones for whom he is praying. He feels all the power and love of God are now focused on John Jones, and whatever is bothering or vexing him is now completely neutralized in the presence of the infinite ocean of life and love. The absolute method of prayer might be likened to the sound wave or sonic therapy recently shown me by a distinguished physician in Los Angeles. He has an ultra sound wave machine which oscillates at a tremendous speed and sends sound waves to any area of the body to which it is directed. These sound waves can be controlled and he told me of achieving remarkable results in dissolving arthritic calcareous deposits as well as the healing and removal of other disturbing conditions. To the degree that we rise in consciousness by contemplating qualities and attributes of God, do we generate spiritual electronic waves of harmony, health, and peace. Many remarkable healings follow this technique of prayer. A cripple walks. Dr. Phineas Parkhurst Quimby, of whom we spoke previously in this chapter, used the absolute method in the latter years of his healing career. He was really the father of the psychosomatic medicine and the first psychoanalyst. He had the capacity to diagnose clairvoyantly the cause of the patient's troubles, pains, and aches. The following is a condensed account of the healing of a cripple as recorded in Quimby's manuscripts. Quimby was called on to visit a woman who was lame, aged, and bedridden. He states that her ailment was due to the fact that she was imprisoned by a creed so small and contracted that she would not stand upright and move about. She was living in the tomb of fear and ignorance. Furthermore, she was taking the Bible literally, and it frightened her. In this tomb, Quimby said, was the presence and power of God trying to burst the bands, break through the bonds, and rise from the dead. When she would ask others for an explanation of some passage of the Bible, the answer would be a stone. Then she would hunger for the bread of life. Dr. Quimby diagnosed her case as a mind cloudy and stagnated due to the excitation and fear caused by the inability to see clearly the meaning of the passage of the Bible, which she had been reading. This showed itself in the body by her heavy and sluggish feeling, which would terminate as paralysis. Quimby traveled in his mind and contemplated the divine ideal, for example, the vitality, intelligence, harmony, and the power of God functioning in the sick person. This is why he said to the woman, Therefore, where I go you cannot come, for you are in your narrow, restricted belief, and I am in health. This prayer and explanation produced an instantaneous sensation, and a change came over her mind. She walked without her crutches. Quimby said it was one of the most singular of all his healings. She was, as it were, dead to error, and to bring her to life or truth was to raise her from the dead. He also explained to her that the truth which she accepted was the angel or idea which rolled away the stone of fear, ignorance, and superstition, thereby releasing the healing power of God which made her whole. The Decree Method Power goes into our word according to the feeling and faith behind it. When we realize the power that moves the world is moving on our behalf and is backing up our word, our confidence and assurance grow. You do not try and add power to power. Therefore, there must be no mental striving, coercion, force, or mental wrestling. A young girl used the decree method on a young man who was constantly phoning her, pressing her for dates, and meeting her at her place of business. She found it very difficult to get rid of him. She decreed as follows, I release unto God. He is in his true place at all times. I am free and he is free. I now decree that my words go forth into infinite mind and it brings it to pass. It is so. She said he vanished and she never saw him since, adding, it was as though the ground swallowed him up. Thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. Job 22:28. Chapter 7 The Tendency of Our Subconscious is Life Word over 90% of your mental life is subconscious, so men and women who fail to make use of this marvelous power live within very narrow limits. Your subconscious processes are always lifeward and constructive. Your subconscious is the builder of your body and maintains all its vital functions. 
It is on the job 24 hours a day and never sleeps. It is always trying to help and preserve you from harm. Your subconscious mind is in touch with infinite life and boundless wisdom, and its impulses and ideas are always lifeward. The great aspirations, inspirations, and visions from a grander and nobler life spring from the subconscious. Your profoundest convictions are those you cannot argue about rationally, because they do not come from your conscious mind. They come from your subconscious mind. Your subconscious speaks to you in intuitions, impulses, hunches, intimations, urges, and ideas, and it is always telling you to rise, transcend, grow, advance, adventure, and move forward to greater heights. The urge to love, to save the lives of others, comes from the depths of your subconscious. For example, during the Great San Francisco Earthquake and Fire of April 18, 1906, invalids and cripples who had been confined to bed for long periods of time rose up and performed some of the most amazing feats of bravery and endurance. The intense desire welled up within them to save others at all cost, and their subconscious responded accordingly. Great artists, musicians, poets, speakers, and writers tune in with their subconscious powers and become animated and inspired. For example, Robert Louis Stevenson, before he went to sleep, used to charge his subconscious with the task of evolving stories for him while he slept. He was accustomed to ask his subconscious to give him a good, marketable thriller when his bank account was low. Stevenson said the intelligence of his deeper mind gave him the story piece by piece, like a serial. This shows how your subconscious will speak lawfully and wise sayings through you, which your conscious mind knows nothing about. Mark Twain confided to the world on many occasions that he never worked in his life. All his humor and all his great writings were due to the fact that he tapped the inexhaustible reservoir of his subconscious mind. How the body portrays the workings of the mind. The interaction of your conscious and subconscious mind requires a similar interaction between the corresponding system of nerves. The cerebral spinal system is the organ of the conscious mind, and the sympathetic system is the organ of the subconscious mind. The cerebral spinal system is the channel through which you receive conscious perception by means of your five physical senses and exercise control over the movement of your body. This system has its nerves in the brain, and it is the channel of your volitional and conscious mental action. The sympathetic system, sometimes referred to as the involuntary nervous system, has its center in the ganglionic mass at the back of the stomach known as the solar plex, and is sometimes spoken of as the abdominal brain. It is the channel of that mental action which unconsciously supports the vital functions of the body. The two systems may work separately or synchronously. Judge Thomas Troward says, The vagus nerve passes out of the cerebral region as a portion of the voluntary system, and through it we control the vocal organs. Then it passes onward to the throat rack, sending out branches to the heart and lungs. Finally, passing through the diaphragm, it loses the outer coating which distinguishes the nerves of the voluntary system, and becomes identified with those of the sympathetic system, so forming a connecting link between the two and making the man physically a single entity. Similarly, different areas of the brain indicate their connection with the objective and subjective activities of the mind respectively, and speaking in a general way, we may assign the frontal portion of the brain to the former and the posterior portion to the latter, while the intermediate portion partakes of the character of both. A rather simple way of looking at the mental and physical interaction is to realize that your conscious mind grasps an idea which induces a corresponding vibration in your voluntary system of nerves. This in turn causes a similar current to be generated in your involuntary system of nerves, thus handing the idea over to your subconscious mind, which is the creative medium. This is how your thoughts become things. Every thought entertained by your conscious mind and accepted as true is sent by your brain to your solar plex, the brain of your subconscious mind, to be made into your flesh and to be brought forth into your world as a reality. There is an intelligence which takes care of the body. 
When you study the cellular system and the structure of the organs, such as the eyes, ears, heart, liver, bladder, etc., you learn they consist of groups of cells which form a group intelligence whereby they function together and are able to take orders and carry them out in deductive function at the suggestion of the mastermind, conscious mind. A careful study of the single-celled organism shows you what goes on in your complex body. Though the monocellular organism has no organs, it still gives evidence of mind action and reaction performing the basic functions of movement, ailmentation, assimilation, and elimination. Many say there is an intelligence which will take care of your body if you will let it alone. That is true, but the difficulty is that the conscious mind always interferes with its five cents evidence based on outer appearances, leading to the sway of false beliefs, fears, and mere opinion. When fear, false beliefs, and negative patterns are made to register in your subconscious mind through psychological, emotional conditioning, there is no other course open to the subconscious mind except to act on the blueprint specifications offered it. The subconscious mind works continually for the common good. The subjective self within you works continuously for the general good, reflecting an innate principle of harmony behind all things. Your subconscious mind has its own will, and it is a very real something in itself. It acts night and day whether you act upon it or not. It is the builder of your body, but you cannot see, hear, or feel it building, as all this is a silent process. Your subconscious has a life of its own, which is always moving toward harmony, health, and peace. This is the divine norm within it seeking expression through you at all times. How man interferes with the innate principle of harmony. To think correctly, scientifically, we must know the truth. To know the truth is to be in harmony with the infinite intelligence and power of your subconscious mind, which is always moving lifeward. Every thought or action which is not harmonious, whether through ignorance or design, will result in discord and limitation of all kinds. Scientists inform us that you build a new body every 11 months, so you are really only 11 months old from a physical standpoint. If you build defects back into your body by thoughts of fear, anger, jealousy, and ill will, you have no one to blame but yourself. You are the sum total of your own thoughts. You can keep from entertaining negative thought and imagery. The way to get rid of darkness is with light. The way to overcome cold is with heat. The way to overcome the negative thought is to substitute the good thought. Affirm the good and the bad will vanish. Why it's normal to be healthy, vital, and strong. It's abnormal to be sick. The average child born into the world is perfectly healthy with all its organs functioning perfectly. This is the normal state and we should remain healthy, vital and strong. The instinct of self-preservation is the strongest instinct of our nature and it constitutes a most potent, ever-present and constantly operative truth inherent in your nature. It is, therefore, obvious that all your thoughts, ideas, and beliefs must operate with greater potentiality when they are in harmony with the innate life principle in you, which is forever seeking to preserve and protect you along all lines. It follows from this that normal conditions can be restored with greater ease and certainty than abnormal conditions can be induced. It is abnormal to be sick. It simply means you are going against the stream of life and thinking negatively. The law of life is the law of growth. All nature testifies to the operation of this law by silently, constantly expressing itself in the law of growth. When there is growth and expression, there must be life. Where there is life, there must be harmony. And where there is harmony, there is perfect health. If your thought is in harmony with the creative principle of your subconscious mind, you are in tune with the innate principle of harmony. If you entertain thoughts which are not in accordance with the principle of harmony, these thoughts cling to you, harass you, worry you, and finally bring about disease, and if persisted in, possibly death. In the healing of disease, you must increase the inflow and distribution of the vital forces of your subconscious mind throughout your system. This can be done by eliminating thoughts of fear, 
worry, anxiety, jealousy, hatred, and every other destructive thought which tends to tear down and destroy your nerves and glands. Body tissue which controls the elimination of all waste material. Pot's disease cured. In the Nautilus magazine of March 1917, there appears an article about a boy suffering from Pott's disease, or tuberculosis of the spine, who had a remarkable healing. His name was Frederick Elias Andrews of Indianapolis, now minister of Unity School of Christianity, Kansas City, Missouri. His physician pronounced him incurable. He began to pray, and from a crooked, twisted cripple going about on hands and knees, he became a strong, straight, well-formed man. He created his own affirmation, mentally absorbing the qualities he needed. He affirmed over and over again many times a day, I am whole, perfect, strong, powerful, loving, harmonious, and happy. He persevered and said that this prayer was the last utterance on his lips at night and the first in the morning. He prayed for others also by sending out thoughts of love and health. This attitude of mind and way of prayer returned to him multiplied many times. His faith and perseverance paid off with big dividends. When thoughts of fear, anger, jealousy, and envy drew his attention, he would immediately start his counteracting force of affirmation going in his mind. His subconscious mind responded according to the nature of his habitual thinking. How faith in your subconscious powers makes you whole. A young man who came to my lectures on the healing power of the subconscious mind had severe eye trouble, which his doctor said necessitated an operation. He said to himself, my subconscious made my eyes and it can heal me. Each night as he went to sleep, he entered into a drowsy meditative state, the condition akin to sleep. His attention was immobilized and focused on the eye doctor. He imagined the doctor was in front of him, and he plainly heard, or imagined he heard, the doctor saying to him, A miracle has happened. He heard this over and over again every night for perhaps five minutes or so before going to sleep. At the end of three weeks, he again went to the ophthalmologist who had previously examined his eyes, and the physician said to this man, This is a miracle. What happened? This man impressed his subconscious mind using the doctor as the instrument or a means of convincing it or conveying the idea. Through repetition, faith, and expectancy, he impregnated his subconscious mind. His subconscious mind made his eye. Within it was the perfect pattern, and immediately it proceeded to heal the eye. This is another example of how faith in the healing power of your subconscious can make you whole. Chapter 8 How to Get the Results You Want The principal reasons for failure are lack of confidence and too much effort. Many people block answers to their prayers by failing to fully comprehend the workings of their subconscious mind. When you know how your mind functions, you gain a measure of confidence. You must remember whenever your subconscious mind accepts an idea, it immediately begins to execute it. It uses all its mighty resources to that end and mobilizes all the mental and spiritual laws of your deeper mind. This law is true for good or bad ideas. Consequently, if you use it negatively, it brings trouble, failure, and confusion. When you use it constructively, it brings guidance, freedom, and peace of mind. The right answer is inevitable when your thoughts are positive, constructive, and loving. From this, it is perfectly obvious that the only thing you have to do in order to overcome failure is to get your subconscious to accept your idea or request by feeling its reality now, and the law of your mind will do the rest. Turn over your request with faith and confidence, and your subconscious will take over and answer for you. You will always fail to get results by trying to use mental coercion. Your subconscious mind does not respond to coercion. It responds to your faith or conscious mind acceptance. Your failure to get results may also arise from such statements as, things are getting worse, I will never get an answer, I see no way out, it is hopeless, I don't know what to do, I'm all mixed up. When you use such statements, you get no response or cooperation from your subconscious mind. Like a soldier marking time, you neither go forward nor backward. In other words, you don't get anywhere. 
If you get into a taxi and give half dozen different directions to the driver in five minutes, he would become hopelessly confused and probably would refuse to take you anywhere. It is the same when working with your subconscious mind. There must be a clear-cut idea in your mind. You must arrive at the definite decision that there is a way out, a solution to the vexing problem in sickness. Only the infinite intelligence within your subconscious knows the answer. When you come to that clear-cut conclusion in your conscious mind, your mind is then made up, and according to your belief, is it done unto you. Easy does it. A house owner once remonstrated with a furnace repairman for charging $200 for fixing the boiler. The mechanic said, I charged five cents for the missing bolt and $199.95 for knowing what was wrong. Similarly, your subconscious mind is the master mechanic, the all-wise one, who knows ways and means of healing any organ of your body as well as your affairs. Decree health and your subconscious will establish it, but relaxation is the key. Easy does it. Do not be concerned with details and means, but know the end result. Get the feel of the happy solution to your problem, whether it is health, finances, or employment. Remember how you felt after you had recovered from a severe state of illness? Bear in mind that your feeling is the touchstone of all subconscious demonstration. Your new idea must be felt subjectively in a finished state, not the future, but as coming about now. Infer no opponent. Use imagination and not willpower. In using your subconscious mind, you infer no opponent. You use no willpower. You imagine the end and the freedom state. You will find your intellect trying to get in the way, but persist in maintaining a simple, childlike, miracle-making faith. Picture yourself without the ailment or problem. Imagine the emotional accompaniment of the freedom state you crave. Cut out all red tape from the process. The simple way is the best. How Disciplined Imagination Works Wonders A wonderful way to get a response from your subconscious mind is through disciplined or scientific imagination. As previously pointed out, your subconscious mind is the builder of the body and controls all its vital functions. The Bible says, Whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. To believe is to accept something is true, or to live in the state of being it. As you sustain this mood, you shall experience the joy of the answered prayer. The Three Steps to Success in Prayer The usual procedure is as follows. 1. Take a look at the problem. 2. Turn to the solution or way out known only to the subconscious mind. 3. Rest in a sense of deep conviction that it is done. Do not weaken your prayer by saying, I wish I might be healed. I hope so. Your feeling about the work to be done is the boss. Harmony is yours. Know that health is yours. Become intelligent by becoming a vehicle for the infinite healing power of the subconscious mind. Pass on the idea of health to your subconscious mind to the point of conviction, then relax. Get yourself off your hands. Say to the condition and circumstance, this too shall pass. Through relaxation, you impress your subconscious mind, enabling the kinetic energy behind the idea to take over and bring it into concrete realization. The Law of Reversed Effort and Why You Get the Opposite of What You Pray For Coup, the famous psychologist from France who visited America about 40 years ago, defined the law of reversed effort as follows. When your desires and imagination are in conflict, your imagination invariably gains the day. If, for example, you were asked to walk a plank on the floor, you would do so without question. Now suppose the same plank were placed 20 feet up in the air between two walls, would you walk it? Your desire to walk it would be counteracted by your imagination or fear of falling. Your dominant idea, which would be the picture of falling, would conquer. Your desire, will, or effort to walk on the plank would be reversed, and the dominant idea of failure would be reinforced. Mental effort is invariably self-defeated, eventuating always in the opposite of what is desired. The suggestions of powerlessness to overcome the condition dominate the mind. Your subconscious is always controlled by the dominant idea. Your subconscious will accept the stronger of two contradictory propositions. The effortless way is the better. If you say, I want a healing, but I can't get it, 
I try so hard, I force myself to pray, I use all the willpower I have, you must realize that your error lies in your effort. Never try to compel the subconscious mind to accept your idea by exercising willpower. Such attempts are doomed to failure, and you get the opposite of what you prayed for. The following is a rather common experience. Students, when taking examinations and reading through their papers, find that all their knowledge has suddenly deserted them. Their minds become appalling blanks, and they are unable to recall one relevant thought. The more they grit their teeth and summon the powers of the will, the further the answers seem to flee. But when they have left the examination room and the mental pressure relaxes, the answers they were seeking float tantalizingly back into their minds. Trying to force themselves to remember was the cause of their failure. This is an example of the law of reversed effort, whereby you get the opposite of what you asked or prayed for. The conflict of desire and imagination must be reconciled. To use mental force is to presuppose that there is opposition. When your mind is concentrated on the means to overcome a problem, it is no longer concerned with the obstacle. The harmonious union or agreement between your conscious and subconscious on any idea, desire, or mental image. When there is no longer any quarrel in either part of your mind, your prayer will be answered. The two agreeing may also be represented as you and your desire, your thought and feeling your idea and emotion, your desire and imagination. You avoid all conflict between your desires and imagination by entering into a drowsy, sleepy state which brings all effort to a minimum. The conscious mind is submerged to a great extent when in a sleepy state. The best time to impregnate your subconscious is prior to sleep. The reason for this is that the highest degree of outcropping of the subconscious occurs prior to sleep and just after we awaken. In this state, the negative thoughts and imagery which tend to neutralize your desire and so prevent acceptance by your subconscious mind no longer present themselves. When you imagine the reality of the fulfilled desire and feel the thrill of accomplishment, your subconscious brings about the realization of your desire. A great many people solve all their dilemmas and problems by the play of their controlled, directed, and disciplined imagination, knowing that whatever they imagine and feel as true will and must come to pass. The following will clearly illustrate how a young girl overcame the conflict between her desire and her imagination. She desired a harmonious solution to her legal problem, yet her mental imagery was constantly on failure loss, bankruptcy, and poverty. It was a complicated lawsuit and there was one postponement after another with no solution in sight. At my suggestion, she got into a sleepy, drowsy state each night prior to sleep and she began to imagine the happy ending, feeling it to the best of her ability. She knew that the image in her mind had to agree with her heart's desire. Prior to sleep, she began to dramatize as vividly as possible her lawyer having an animated discussion with her regarding the outcome. She would ask him questions and he would answer her appropriately. He would say to her over and over again, there has been a perfect, harmonious solution. The case has been settled out of court. During the day when fear thoughts came into her mind, she would run her mental movie with gestures, voice, and sound equipment. She could easily imagine the sound of his voice, smile, and mannerism. She ran this mental picture so often it became a subjective pattern, a regular train track. At the end of a few weeks, her attorney called her and confirmed objectively what she had been imagining and feeling as true subjectively. This is really what the psalmist meant when he wrote, Let the words of my mouth, your thoughts, mental images, good, and the meditations of my heart, your feeling, nature, emotion, be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, the law of your subconscious mind, my strength and my redeemer, the power and wisdom of your subconscious mind can redeem you from sickness, bondage, and misery. Psalm 1914 Chapter 9 How to Use the Power of Your Subconscious for Wealth If you're having financial difficulties, if you're trying to make ends meet, it means you have not convinced your subconscious mind that you will always have plenty and some to spare. You know men and women who work a few hours a week and make fabulous sums of money. They do not strive or slave hard. 
Do not believe the story that the only way you can become wealthy is by the sweat of your brow and hard labor. It is not so. The effortless way of life is the best. Do the thing you love to do and do it for the joy and thrill of it. I know an executive in Los Angeles who receives a salary of $75,000 yearly. Last year, he went out on a nine-month cruise seeing the world and its beauty spots. He said to me that he had succeeded in convincing his subconscious mind that he is worth that much money. He told me that many men in his organization, getting about $100 a week, knew more about the business than he did and could manage it better. But they had no ambition, no creative ideas, and were not interested in the wonders of their subconscious mind. Wealth is of the mind. Wealth is simply a subconscious conviction on the part of the individual. You will not become a millionaire by saying, I am a millionaire, I am a millionaire. You will grow into a wealth consciousness by building into your mentality the idea of wealth and abundance. Your invisible means of support. The trouble with most people is that they have no invisible means of support. When business falls away, the stock market drops or they lose their investments, they seem helpless. The reason for such insecurity is that they do not know how to tap the subconscious mind. They are unacquainted with the inexhaustible storehouse within. A man with a poverty type mind finds himself in poverty stricken conditions. Another man with a mind filled with ideas of wealth is surrounded with everything he needs. It is never intended that man should lead a life of indigence. You can have wealth, everything you need and plenty to spare. Your words have power to cleanse your mind of wrong ideas and to instill right ideas in their place. The Ideal Method for Building a Wealth Consciousness Perhaps you are saying as you read this chapter, I need wealth and success. This is what you do. Repeat for about five minutes to yourself, three or four times a day, wealth, success. These words have tremendous power. They represent the inner power of the subconscious mind. Anchor your mind on this substantial power within you. Then, conditions and circumstances corresponding to their nature and quality will be manifested in your life. You are not saying, I am wealthy. You are dwelling on real powers within you. There is no conflict in the mind when you say, wealth. Furthermore, the feeling of wealth will well up within you as you dwell on the idea of wealth. The feeling of wealth produces wealth. Keep this in mind at all times. Your subconscious mind is like a bank, a sort of universal financial institution. It magnifies whatever you deposit or impress upon it, whether it is the idea of wealth or of poverty. Choose wealth. Why your affirmations for wealth fail. I have talked to many people during the past 35 years whose usual complaint is, I have said for weeks and months, I am wealthy, I am prosperous, and nothing has happened. I discovered that when they said, I am prosperous, I am wealthy, they felt within that they were lying to themselves. One man told me, I have affirmed that I am prosperous until I am tired. Things are now worse. I knew when I made the statement that it was obviously not true. His statements were rejected by the conscious mind and the very opposite of what he outwardly affirmed and claimed was made manifest. Your affirmation succeeds best when it is specific and when it does not produce a mental conflict or argument. Hence the statements made by this man made matters worse because they suggested his lack. Your subconscious accepts what you really feel to be true, not just idle words or statements. The dominant idea or belief is always accepted by the subconscious mind. How to avoid mental conflict. The following is the ideal way to overcome this conflict for those who have this difficulty. Make this practical statement frequently, particularly prior to sleep. By day and by night, I am being prospered in all my interests. This affirmation will not arouse any argument because it does not contradict your subconscious mind's impression of financial lack. I suggested to one businessman whose sales and finances were very low and who was greatly worried that he sit down in his office, become quiet, and repeat this statement over and over again. My sales are improving every day. This statement engaged the cooperation of the conscious and subconscious mind. Results followed. Don't sign blank checks. You sign blank checks when you make such statements as, there is not enough to go around. There is a shortage. I will lose the house because of the mortgage, etc. 
If you are full of fear about the future, you are also writing a blank check and attracting negative conditions to you. Your subconscious mind takes your fear and negative statements as your request and proceeds in its own way to bring obstacles, delays, lack, and limitation into your life. Your subconscious gives you compound interest. To him that hath the feeling of wealth, more wealth shall be added. To him that hath the feeling of lack, more lack shall be added. Your subconscious multiplies and magnifies whatever you deposit in it. Every morning as you awaken, deposit thoughts of prosperity, success, wealth, and peace. Dwell upon these concepts. Busy your mind with them as often as possible. These constructive thoughts will find their way as deposits in your subconscious mind and bring forth abundance and prosperity. Why nothing happened? I can hear you saying, oh, I did that and nothing happened. You did not get results because you indulged in fear thoughts perhaps 10 minutes later and neutralized the good you had affirmed. When you place a seed in the ground, do not dig it up. You let it take root and grow. Suppose, for example, you are going to say, I shall not be able to make that payment. Before you get further then, I shall stop the sentence and dwell on a constructive statement such as, by day and by night, I am prospered in all my ways. True Source of Wealth Your subconscious mind is never short of ideas. There are within it an infinite number of ideas ready to flow into your conscious mind and appear as cash in your pocketbook in countless ways. This process will continue to go on in your mind regardless of whether the stock market goes up or down, or whether the pound sterling or dollar drops in value. Your wealth is never truly dependent on bonds, stocks, or money in the bank. These are really only symbols necessary and useful, of course, but only symbols. The point I wish to emphasize is that if you convince your subconscious mind that wealth is yours and that it is always circulating in your life, you will always and inevitably have it, regardless of the form it takes. Trying to make ends meet and the real cause. There are people who claim that they are always trying to make ends meet. They seem to have a great struggle to meet their obligations. Have you listened to their conversation? In many instances, their conversation runs along this vein. They are constantly condemning those who have succeeded in life and who have raised their heads above the crowd. Perhaps they are saying, oh, that fellow has a racket. He is ruthless. He is a crook. This is why they lack. They are condemning the thing they desire and want. The reason they speak critically of their more prosperous associates is because they are envious and covetous of the other's prosperity. The quickest way to cause wealth to take wings and fly away is to criticize and condemn others who have more wealth than you. A common stumbling block to wealth. There is one emotion which is the cause of the lack of wealth in the lives of many. Most people learn this the hard way. It is envy. For example, if you see a competitor depositing large sums of money in the bank and you have only a meager amount to deposit, does it make you envious? The way to overcome this emotion is to say to yourself, isn't it wonderful? I rejoice in that man's prosperity. I wish for him greater and greater wealth. To entertain envious thoughts is devastating because it places you in a very negative position. Therefore, wealth flows from you instead of to you. If you are ever annoyed or irritated by the prosperity or great wealth of another, claim immediately that you truly wish for him greater wealth in every possible way. This will neutralize the negative thoughts in your mind and cause an ever greater measure of wealth to flow to you by the law of your own subconscious mind. Rubbing out a great mental block to wealth. If you are worried and critical about someone who you claim is making money dishonestly, cease worrying about him. You know such a person is using the law of mind negatively. The law of mind takes care of him. Be careful not to criticize him for the reasons previously indicated. Remember, the block or obstacle to wealth is in your own mind. You can now destroy that mental block. This you may do by getting on mental good terms with everyone. Sleep and grow rich. As you go to sleep at night, practice the following technique. Repeat the word wealth quietly, easily, and feelingly. 
Do this over and over again, just like a lullaby. Lull yourself to sleep with the one word, wealth. You should be amazed at the result. Wealth should flow to you in avalanches of abundance. This is another example of the magic power of your subconscious mind. Chapter 10. Your Right to be Rich It is your right to be rich. You are here to lead the abundant life and be happy, radiant, and free. You should, therefore, have all the money you need to lead a full, happy, and prosperous life. You are here to grow, expand, and unfold spiritually, mentally, and materially. You have the inalienable right to fully develop and express yourself along all lines. You should surround yourself with beauty and luxury. Why be satisfied with just enough to go around when you can enjoy the riches of your subconscious mind? In this chapter, you can learn to make friends with money, and you should always have a surplus. Your desire to be rich is a desire for a fuller, happier, more wonderful life. It is a cosmic urge. It is not only good, but also very good. Money is a symbol. Money is a symbol of exchange. It means to you not only freedom from want, but beauty, luxury, abundance, and refinement. It is merely a symbol of the economic health of the nation. When your blood is circulating freely in your body, you are healthy. When money is circulating freely in your life, you are economically healthy. When people begin to hoard money to put it away in tin boxes and become charged with fear, there is economic illness. Money has taken many forms as a medium of exchange down through the centuries, such as salt, beads, and trinkets of various kinds. In early times, a man's wealth was determined by the number of sheep and oxen he had. Now we use currency and other negotiable instruments, as it is much more convenient to write a check than carry some sheep around with you to pay bills. How to Walk the Royal Road to Riches Knowledge of the powers of your subconscious mind is the means to the royal road to riches of all kinds, spiritual, mental, or financial. The student of the laws of mind believes and knows definitely that regardless of economic situations, stock market fluctuation, depression, strikes, war, other conditions or circumstances, he will always be amply supplied regardless of what form money takes. The reason for this is that he has conveyed the idea of wealth to his subconscious mind and it keeps him supplied wherever he may be. He has convinced himself in his mind that money is forever, flowing freely in his life, and that there is always a wonderful surplus. Should there be a financial collapse of government tomorrow and all the man's present holdings become valueless, as the German marks did after the First World War, he would still attract wealth and be cared for, regardless of the form the new currency took. Why you do not have more money as you read this chapter, you are probably saying, I am worthy of a higher salary than I am receiving. I believe most people are inadequately compensated. One of the causes many people do not have more money is that they are silently or openly condemning it. They refer to money as filthy lucre, or the love of money is the root of all evil. Another reason they do not prosper is that they have a sneaky subconscious feeling there is some virtue in poverty. This subconscious pattern may be due to early childhood training, superstition, or it could be based on a false interpretation of scriptures. Money and a balanced life. One time a man said to me, I am broke. I do not like money. It is the root of all evil. These statements represent a confused neurotic mind. Love of money to the exclusion of everything else will cause you to become lopsided and unbalanced. You are here to use your power and authority wisely. Some men crave power, others crave money. If you set your heart on money exclusively and say, money is all I want, I am going to give all my attention to amassing money, nothing else matters, you can get money and attain a fortune, but you have forgotten that you are here to lead a balanced life. You must also satisfy the hunger for peace of mind, harmony, love, joy, and perfect health. By making money your sole aim, you simply made a wrong choice. You thought that was all you wanted, but you found after all your efforts that it was not only the money you needed. You also desired true expression of your hidden talents, true place in life, beauty, and the joy of contributing to the welfare and success of others. 
By learning the laws of your subconscious mind, you could have a million dollars or many millions if you wanted them and still have peace of mind, harmony, perfect health, and perfect expression. Poverty is a mental disease. There is no virtue in poverty. It is a disease like any other mental disease. If you were physically ill, you would think there was something wrong with you. You would seek help and do something about the condition at once. Likewise, if you do not have money constantly circulating in your life, there is something radically wrong with you. The urge of the life principle in you is toward growth, expansion, and the life more abundant. You are not here to live in a hovel, dress in rags, and go hungry. You should be happy, prosperous, and successful. Why you must never criticize money. Cleanse your mind of all weird and superstitious beliefs about money. Do not ever regard money as evil or filthy. If you do, you cause it to take wings and fly away from you. Remember that you lose what you condemn. You cannot attract what you criticize. Getting the right attitude toward money. Here is a simple technique you may use to multiply money in your experience. Use the following statement several times a day. I like money. I love it. I use it wisely, constructively, and judiciously. Money is constantly circulating in my life. I release it with joy and it returns to me multiplied in a wonderful way. It is good and very good. Money flows to me in avalanches of abundance. I use it for good only and I am grateful for my good and for the riches of my mind. How the scientific thinker looks at money. Suppose, for example, you found gold, silver, lead, copper, or iron in the ground. Would you pronounce these things evil? All evil comes from man's darkened understanding, from his ignorance, from his false interpretation of life, and from his misuse of his subconscious mind. Uranium, lead, or some other metal could have been used as a medium of exchange. We use paper bills, checks, nickel, and silver. Surely these are not evil. Physicists and chemists know today that the only difference between one metal and another is the number and rate of motion of electrons revolving around the central nucleus. They can now change one metal into another through a bombardment of atoms in the powerful cyclotron. Gold under certain conditions becomes mercury. I believe that our modern scientists in the near future will be able to make gold, silver, and other metals synthetically in the chemical laboratory. The cost may be prohibitive now, but it can be done. I cannot imagine any intelligent person seeing anything evil in electrons, neutrons, protons, and isotopes. The piece of paper in your pocket is composed of atoms and molecules with their electrons and protons arranged differently. Their number and rates of motion are different. That is the only way the paper differs from the silver in your pocket. How to attract the money you need. Many years ago, I met a young boy in Australia who wanted to become a physician and surgeon, but he had no money. I explained to him how a seed deposited in the soil attracts to itself everything necessary for its unfolding and all that he had to do was take a lesson from the seed and deposit the required idea in his subconscious mind. For expenses, this young, brilliant boy used to clean out doctor's offices, wash windows, and do odd repair jobs. He told me that every night as he went to sleep, he used to picture in his mind's eye a medical diploma on a wall with his name on it in big, bold letters. He used to clean and shine the framed diplomas in the medical building where he worked. It was not hard for him to engrave the image of a diploma in his mind and develop it there. Definite results followed as he persisted with his mental picture every night for about four months. The sequel of this story was very interesting. One of the doctors took a great liking to this young boy and after training him in the art of sterilizing instruments, giving hypodermic injections and other miscellaneous first aid work, he employed him as a technical assistant in his office. The doctor later sent him to medical school at his own expense. Today this young man is a prominent medical doctor in Montreal, Canada. He discovered the law of attraction by using his subconscious mind the right way. He operated an age-old law which says, having seen the end, you have willed the means to the realization of the end. The end in this case was to become a medical doctor. This young man was able to imagine, see, and feel the reality of being a doctor. 
He lived with that idea, sustained it, nourished it, and loved it until, through his imagination, it penetrated the layers of his subconscious mind and became a conviction, thereby attracting to him everything necessary for the fulfillment of his dream. Why Some Men Do Not Get a Raise in Pay If you are working in a large organization and you are silently thinking of and resenting the fact you are underpaid, that you are not appreciated and that you deserve more money and greater recognition, you are subconsciously severing your ties with that organization. You are setting a law in motion and the superintendent or manager will say to you, we have to let you go. Actually, you dismissed yourself. The manager was simply the instrument through which your own negative mental state was confirmed. It was an example of the law of action and reaction. The action was your thought and the reaction was the response of your subconscious mind. Obstacles and impediments on the pathway to riches. I am sure you have heard men say, that fellow has a racket. He is a racketeer. He is getting money dishonestly. He is a faker. I knew him when he had nothing. He is a crook, a thief, and a swindler. If you analyze the man who talks like that, you discover he is usually in want or suffering from some financial or physical illness. Perhaps his formal college friends went up the ladder of success and excelled him. Now he is bitter and envious of their progress. In many instances, this is the cause of his downfall. Thinking negatively of these classmates and condemning their wealth causes the wealth and prosperity he is praying for to vanish and flee away. He is condemning the thing he is praying for. He is praying two ways. On the one hand, he is saying, wealth is flowing to me now. And in the next breath, silently and audibly, he is saying, I resent that fellow's wealth. Always make it a special point to rejoice in the wealth of the other person. Protect your investments. If you are seeking wisdom regarding investments, or if you are worried about your stocks or bonds, quietly claim, infinite intelligence governs and watches over all my financial transactions, and whatsoever I do shall prosper. Do this frequently and you will find that your investments will be wise. Moreover, you will be protected from loss, as you will be prompted to sell your securities or holdings before any loss accrues to you. You cannot get something for nothing. In large stores, the management employs store detectives to prevent people from stealing. They catch a number of people every day trying to get something for nothing. All such people are living in the mental atmosphere of lack and limitation and are stealing from themselves peace, harmony, faith, honesty, integrity, goodwill, and confidence. Furthermore, they are attracting to themselves all manner of loss, such as loss of character, prestige, social status, and peace of mind. These people lack faith in the source of supply and the understanding of how their minds work. If they would mentally call on the powers of their subconscious mind and claim that they are guided to their true expression, they would find work and constant supply. Then, by honesty, integrity, and perseverance, they would become a credit to themselves and to society at large. Your Constant Supply of Money Recognizing the powers of your subconscious mind and the creative power of your thought or mental image is the way to opulence, freedom, and constant supply. Accept the abundant life in your own mind. Your mental acceptance and expectancy of wealth has its own mathematics and mechanics of expression. As you enter into the mood of opulence, all things necessary for the abundant life will come to pass. Let this be your daily affirmation. Write it in your heart. I am one with the infinite riches of my subconscious mind. It is my right to be rich, happy, and successful. Money flows to me freely, copiously, and endlessly. I am forever conscious of my true worth. I give of my talents freely, and I am wonderfully blessed financially. It is wonderful. Chapter 11 Your Subconscious Mind as a Partner in Success Success means successful living. A long period of peace, joy, and happiness on this plane may be termed success. The real things of life, such as peace, harmony, integrity, security, and happiness are intangible. They come from the deep self of man. Meditating on these qualities builds these treasures of heaven in our subconscious. The Three Steps to Success 
Let us discuss three steps to success. The first step to success is to find out the thing you love to do, then do it. Success is in loving your work. Although, if a man is a psychiatrist, it is not adequate for him to get a diploma and place it on the wall. He must keep up with the times, attend conventions, and continue studying the mind and its workings. The successful psychiatrist visits clinics and reads the latest scientific articles. In other words, he is informed in the most advanced methods of alleviating human suffering. The most successful psychiatrist or doctor must have the interest of his patients at heart. Someone may say, how can I put the first step into operation? I do not know what I should do. In such a case, pray for guidance as follows. The infinite intelligence of my subconscious mind reveals to me my true place in life. Repeat this prayer quietly, positively, and lovingly to your deeper mind. As you persist with faith and confidence, the answer will come to you as a feeling, a hunch, or a tendency in a certain direction. It will come to you clearly and in peace, and as an inner silent awareness. The second step to success is to specialize in some particular branch of work and know more about it than anyone else. For example, if a young man chooses chemistry as his profession, he should concentrate on one of the many branches in this field. He should give all of his time and attention to this chosen specialty. He should become sufficiently enthusiastic to try to know all there is available about his field. If possible, he should know more than anyone else. The young man should become ardently interested in his work and should desire to serve the world. He that is greatest among you, let him become your servant. There is a great contrast in this attitude of mind in comparison to that of the man who only wants to make a living or just get by. Getting by is not true success. Man's motive must be greater, nobler, and more altruistic. He must serve others, thereby casting his bread upon the waters. The third step is the most important one. You must be sure that the thing you want to do does not redound to your success only. Your desire must not be selfish. It must benefit humanity. The path of a complete circuit must be formed. In other words, your idea must go forth with the purpose of blessing or serving the world. It will then come back to you pressed down, shaken together, and running over. If it is to benefit yourself exclusively, the circle or complete circuit is not formed, and you may experience a short circuit in your life which may consist of limitation or sickness. The Measure of True Success Some people may say, but Mr. James made a fortune in selling fraudulent oil stock. A man may seem to succeed for a while, but the money he obtained by fraud usually takes wings and flies away. When we rob from another, we rob from ourselves. Because we are in a mood of lack and limitation which may manifest itself in our body, home life, and affairs. What we think and feel, we create. We create what we believe. Even though a man may have accumulated a fortune fraudulently, he is not successful. There is no success without peace of mind. What good is man's accumulated wealth if he cannot sleep nights, is sick, or has a guilt complex? I knew a man in London who told me of his exploits. He had been a professional pickpocket and had amassed a large amount of money. He had a summer home in France and lived in royal fashion in England. His story was that he was in constant dread of being arrested by Scotland Yard. He had many inner disorders, which were undoubtedly caused by his constant fear and deep-seated guilt complex. He knew he had done wrong. This deep sense of guilt attracted all kinds of trouble to him. Subsequently, he voluntarily surrendered to the police and served a prison sentence. After his release from prison, he sought psychological and spiritual counsel and became transformed. He went to work and became an honest, law-abiding citizen. He found what he loved to do and was happy. A successful person loves his work and expresses himself fully. Success is contingent upon a higher ideal than the mere accumulation of riches. The man of success is the man who possesses great psychological and spiritual understanding. Many of the great industrialists today depend upon the correct use of their subconscious minds for their success. There was an article published some years ago about Flagler, an oil magnate. He admitted that the secret of his success was his ability to see a project in its completion. 
For instance, in his case, he closed his eyes, imagined a big oil industry, saw trains running on tracks, heard whistles blowing, and saw smoke. Having seen and felt the fulfillment of his prayer, his subconscious mind brought about its realization. If you imagine an objective clearly, you will be provided with the necessities, in ways you know not of through the wonder-working power of your subconscious mind. In considering the three steps to success, you must never forget the underlying power of the creative forces of your subconscious mind. This is the energy in back of all steps in any plan of success. Your thought is creative. Thought fused with feeling becomes a subjective faith or belief, and according to your belief is it done unto you. Knowledge of a mighty force in you which is capable of bringing to pass all your desires gives you confidence and a sense of peace. Whatever your field of action may be, you should learn the laws of your subconscious mind. When you know how to apply the powers of your mind, and when you are expressing yourself fully and giving of your talents to others, you are on the sure path to true success. If you are about God's business or any part of it, God, by His very nature, is for you. So who can be against you? With this understanding, there is no power in heaven or on earth to withhold success from you. How He Made His Dream Come True A movie actor told me that he had very little education, but he had a dream as a boy of becoming a successful movie actor. Out in the field mowing hay, driving the cows home, or even milking them, he said, I would constantly imagine I saw my name in big lights at a large theater. I kept this up for years until finally I ran away from home. I got extra jobs in the motion picture field, and the day finally came when I saw my name in great big lights as I did when I was a boy. Then he added, I know the power of sustained imagination to bring success. His dream pharmacy became a reality. Thirty years ago, I knew a young pharmacist who was receiving $40 a week plus commission on sales. After 25 years, he said to me, I will get a pension and retire. I said to this young man, why don't you own your own store? Get out of this place. Raise your sights. Have a dream for your children. Maybe your son wants to be a doctor. Perhaps your daughter desires to be a great musician. His answer was that he had no money. He began to awaken to the fact that whatever he could conceive as true, he could give conception. The first step toward his goal was his awakening to the powers of his subconscious mind, which I briefly elaborated on for his benefit. His second step was his realization that if he could succeed in conveying an idea to his subconscious mind, the latter would somehow bring it to pass. He began to imagine that he was in his own store. He mentally arranged the bottles, dispensed prescriptions, and imagined several clerks in the store waiting on customers. He also visualized a big bank balance. Mentally, he worked in that imaginary store. Like a good actor, he lived the role. Act as though I am, and I will be. This pharmacist put himself wholeheartedly into the act, living, moving, and acting on the assumption that he owned the store. The sequel was interesting. He was discharged from his position. He found new employment with a large chain store, became manager, and later on district manager. He saved enough money in four years to provide a down payment on a drug store of his own. He called it his dream pharmacy. It was, he said, exactly the store I saw in my imagination. He became a recognized success in his chosen field and was happy doing what he loved to do. Using the Subconscious Mind in Business Some years ago, I gave a lecture to a group of businessmen on the powers of imagination and the subconscious mind. In this lecture, I pointed out how Goeth used his imagination wisely when confronted with difficulties and predicaments. His biographers point out that he was accustomed to fill many hours quietly holding imaginary conversations. It is well known that his custom was to imagine one of his friends before him in a chair answering him in the right way. In other words, if he were concerned over any problems, he imagined his friend giving him the right or appropriate answer, accompanied with the usual gestures and tonal qualities of the voice, and he made the entire imaginary scene as real and as vivid as possible. One of the men present at this lecture was a young stockbroker. 
He proceeded to adopt the technique of Goeth. He began to have mental, imaginary conversations with a multi-millionaire banker friend of his who used to congratulate him on his wise and sound judgment and compliment him on his purchase of the right stocks. He used to dramatize this imaginary conversation until he had psychologically fixed it as a form of belief in his mind. This broker's inner talking and controlled imagination certainly agreed with his aim, which was to make sound investments for his clients. His main purpose in life was to make money for his clients and to see them prosper financially by his wise counsel. He is still using his subconscious mind in his business, and he is a brilliant success in his field of endeavor. Boy of 16 years turns failure into success. A young boy who was attending high school said to me, I am getting very poor grades. My memory is failing. I do not know what is the matter. I discovered that the only thing wrong with this boy was his attitude, which was one of indifference and resentment towards some of his teachers and fellow students. I taught him how to use his subconscious mind and how to succeed in his studies. He began to affirm certain truths several times a day, particularly at night prior to sleep, and also in the morning after awakening. These are the best times to impregnate the subconscious mind. He affirmed as follows, I realize that my subconscious mind is a storehouse of memory. It retains everything I read and hear from my teachers. I have a perfect memory and the infinite intelligence in my subconscious mind constantly reveals to me everything I need to know at all my examinations, whether written or oral. I radiate love and goodwill to all my teachers and fellow students. I sincerely wish for them success in all good things. This young man is now enjoying a greater freedom than he has ever known. He is now receiving all A's. He constantly imagines the teachers and his mother congratulating him on his success in his studies. How to become successful in buying and selling. In buying and selling, remember that your conscious mind is the starter and your subconscious mind is the motor. You must start the motor to enable it to perform its work. Your conscious mind is the dynamo that awakens the power of your subconscious mind. The first step in conveying your clarified desire, idea, or image to the deeper mind is to relax, immobilize the attention, get still, and be quiet. This quiet, relaxed, and peaceful attitude of mind prevents extraneous matter and false ideas from interfering with your mental absorption of your ideal. Furthermore, in a quiet, passive, and receptive attitude of mind, effort is reduced to a minimum. The second step is to begin to imagine the reality of that which you desire. For example, you may wish to buy a home and, in your relaxed state of mind, affirm as follows. The infinite intelligence of my subconscious mind is all wise. It reveals to me now the ideal home, which is central, ideal, is in a lovely environment, meets with all my requirements, and is commensurate with my income. I am now turning this request over to my subconscious mind, and I know it responds according to the nature of my request. I release this request with absolute faith and confidence in the same way that a farmer deposits a seed in the ground, trusting implicitly in the laws of growth. The answer to your prayer may come through an advertisement in the paper, through a friend, or you may be guided directly to a particular home, which is exactly what you are seeking. There are many ways by which your prayer may be answered. The principal knowledge in which you may place your confidence is that the answer always comes, provided you trust the working of your deeper mind. You may wish to sell a home, land, or any kind of property. In private consultation with real estate brokers, I have told them of the way I sold my own home on Orlando Avenue in Los Angeles. Many of them have applied the technique I used with remarkable and speedy results. I placed the sign which read, For Sale by Owner, in the garden in front of my home. The day after I said to myself as I was going to sleep, Supposing you sold your house, what would you do? I answered my own question, and I said, I would take that sign down and throw it in the garage. In my imagination, I took hold of the sign, pulled it up from the ground, placed it on my shoulder, went to the garage, threw it on the floor, and said jokingly to the sign, I don't need you anymore. I felt the inner satisfaction of it all, realizing it was finished. The next day, a man gave me a deposit of $1,000 and said to me, Take your sign down. We will go into escrow now. Immediately, I pulled the sign up and took it to the garage. The outer action conformed to the inner. 
There is nothing new about this. As within, so without, meaning according to the image impressed on your subconscious mind, so it is on the objective screen of your life. The outside mirrors the inside. External action follows internal action. Here is another very popular method used in selling homes, land, or any kind of property. Affirm slowly, quietly, and feelingly as follows. Infinite intelligence attracts to me the buyer for this home who wants it and who prospers in it. This buyer is being sent to me by the creative intelligence of my subconscious mind, which makes no mistakes. This buyer may look at many other homes, but mine is the only one he wants and will buy, because he is guided by the infinite intelligence within him. I know the buyer is right, the time is right, and the price is right. Everything about it is right. The deeper currents of my subconscious mind are now in operation, bringing both of us together in divine order. I know that it is so. Remember always that what you are seeking is also seeking you. And whenever you want to sell a home or property of any kind, there is always someone who wants what you have to offer. By using the powers of your subconscious mind correctly, you free your mind of all sense of competition and anxiety in buying and selling. How she succeeded in getting what she wanted. There is a young lady who regularly comes to my lectures and classes. She had to change buses three times. It took her one and a half hours each time to come to the lectures. In one lecture, I explained how a young man who needed a car in his work received one. She went home and experimented as outlined in my lecture. Here is her letter in part narrating her application of my method and published by her permission. Dear Mr. Murphy, this is how I received a Cadillac car. I wanted one to come to the lectures regularly. In my imagination, I went through the identical process I would go through if I were actually driving a car. I went to the showroom and the salesman took me for a ride in one. I also drove it several blocks. I claimed the Cadillac car as my own over and over again. I kept the mental picture of getting into the car, driving it, feeling the upholstery, etc. constantly for over two weeks. Last week I drove to your lectures in a Cadillac. My uncle in Inglewood passed away and left me his Cadillac and his entire estate. A success technique employed by many outstanding executives and businessmen. There are many prominent businessmen who quietly use the abstract term success over and over many times a day until they reach a conviction that success is theirs. They know that the idea of success contains all the essential elements of success. Likewise, you can begin now to repeat the word success to yourself with faith and conviction. Your subconscious mind will accept it as true of you, and you will be under a subconscious compulsion to succeed. You are compelled to express your subjective beliefs, impressions, and convictions. What does success imply to you? You want, undoubtedly, to be successful in your home life and in your relationship with others. You wish to be outstanding in your chosen work or profession. You wish to possess a beautiful home and all the money you need to live comfortably and happily. You want to be successful in your prayer life and in your contact with the powers of your subconscious mind. You are a businessman also because you are in the business of living. Become a successful businessman by imagining yourself doing what you long to do and possessing the things you long to possess. Become imaginative. Mentally participate in the reality of the successful state. Make a habit of it. Go to sleep feeling successful every night and perfectly satisfied and you will eventually succeed in implanting the idea of success in your subconscious mind. Believe you were born to succeed and wonders will happen as you pray. Chapter 12 Scientists Use the Subconscious Mind Many scientists realize the true importance of the subconscious mind. Edison, Marconi, Kettering, Poincare, Einstein, and many others have used the subconscious mind. It has given them the insight and the know-how for all their great achievements in modern science and industry. Research has shown that the ability to bring into action the subconscious power has determined the success of all the great scientific and research workers. An instance of how a famous chemist... Friedrich von Stratonitz used his subconscious mind to solve his problem is as follows. 
He had been working laboriously for a long time trying to rearrange the six carbon and the six hydrogen atoms of the benzene formula, and he was constantly perplexed and unable to solve the matter. Tired and exhausted, he turned the request over completely to his subconscious mind. Shortly afterward, as he was about to board a London bus, his subconscious presented his conscious mind with a sudden flash of a snake biting its own tail and turning around like a pinwheel. This answer from his subconscious mind gave him the long-sought answer of the circular rearrangement of the atoms that is known as the benzene ring. How a distinguished scientist brought forth his inventions. Nikola Tesla was a brilliant electrical scientist who brought forth the most amazing innovations. When an idea for a new invention came into his mind, he would build it up in his imagination, knowing that his subconscious mind would reconstruct and reveal to his conscious mind all the parts needed for its manufacture in concrete form. Through quietly contemplating every possible improvement, he spent no time in correcting defects and was able to give the technicians the perfect product of his mind. He said, invariably, my device works as I imagined it should. In 20 years, there has not been a single exception. How a famous naturalist solved his problem. Professor Agassiz, a distinguished American naturalist, discovered the indefatigable activities of his subconscious mind while he slept. His widow, in her biography of her famous husband, has reported the following. He had been for two weeks striving to decipher the somewhat obscure impression of a fossil fish on the stone slab in which it was preserved. Weary and perplexed, he put his work aside at last and tried to dismiss it from his mind. Shortly after, he waked one night persuaded that while asleep he had seen his fish with all the missing features perfectly restored. But when he tried to hold and make fast the image, it escaped him. Nevertheless, he went early to the Jardin des Plantes, thinking that on looking anew at the impression, he should see something which would put him back on the track of his vision. In vain, the blurred record was as black as ever. The next night he saw the fish again, but with no more satisfactory result. When he awoke, it disappeared from his memory as before. Hoping that the same experience might be repeated, on the third night he placed a pencil and paper beside his bed before going to sleep. Accordingly, toward morning the fish reappeared in his dream. Confusedly at first, but at last with such distinctness that he had no longer any doubt as to its zoological characters. Still half dreaming in perfect darkness, he traced these characters on the sheet of paper at the bedside. In the morning, he was surprised to see in his nocturnal sketch features which he thought it impossible the fossil itself should reveal. He hastened to the Jardin des Plantes and, with his drawing as a guide, succeeded in chiseling away the surface of the stone under which portions of the fish proved to be hidden. When wholly expressed, it corresponded with his dream and his drawing, and he succeeded in classifying it with ease. And outstanding physicians solved the problem of diabetes. Some years ago, I received a clipping from a magazine describing the origin of the discovery of insulin. This is the essence of the article as I recall it. About 40 years ago or more, Dr. Frederick Banting, a brilliant Canadian physician and surgeon, was concentrating his attention on the ravages of diabetes. At that time, medical science offered no effective method of arresting the disease. Dr. Banting spent considerable time experimenting and studying the international literature on the subject. One night he was exhausted and fell asleep. While asleep, his subconscious mind instructed him to extract the residue from the degenerated pancreatic duct of dogs. This was the origin of insulin which has helped millions of people. You will note that Dr. Banting had been consciously dwelling on the problem for some time seeking a solution, a way out and his subconscious responded accordingly. It does not follow that you will always get an answer overnight. The answer may not come for some time. Do not be discouraged. Keep on turning the problem over every night to the subconscious mind prior to sleep as if you had never done it before. One of the reasons for the delay may be that you look upon it as a major problem. You may believe it will take a long time to solve. Your subconscious mind is timeless and spaceless. Go to sleep believing you have the answer now. Do not postulate the answer in the future. Have an abiding faith in the outcome. Become convinced now as you read this book that there is an answer and a perfect solution for you. 
How a famous scientist and physicist escaped from a Russian concentration camp. Dr. Lothar van Blank Schmidt, a member of the Rocket Society and an outstanding research electronic engineer, gives the following condensed summary of how he used his subconscious mind to free himself from certain death at the hands of brutal guards in a Russian prison camp coal mine. He states as follows. I was a prisoner of war in a coal mine in Russia, and I saw men dying all around me in that prison compound. We were watched over by brutal guards, arrogant officers, and sharp, fast-thinking commissaires. After a short medical checkup, a quota of coal was assigned to each person. My quota was 300 pounds per day. In case any man did not fill his quota, his small food ration was cut down, and in a short time he was resting in the cemetery. I started concentrating on my escape. I knew that my subconscious mind would somehow find a way. My home in Germany was destroyed. My family wiped out. All my friends and former associates were either killed in the war or were in concentration camps. I said to my subconscious mind, I want to go to Los Angeles and you will find the way. I had seen pictures of Los Angeles and I remembered some of the boulevards very well as well as some of the buildings. Every day and night I would imagine I was walking down Wilshire Boulevard with an American girl whom I met in Berlin prior to the war. She is now my wife. In my imagination we would visit the stores, ride buses, and eat in the restaurants. Every night I made it a special point to drive my imaginary American automobile up and down the boulevards of Los Angeles. I made all this vivid and real. These pictures in my mind were as real and as natural to me as one of the trees outside the prison camp. Every morning the chief guard would count the prisoners as they were lined up. He would call out one, two, three, etc. And when 17 was called out, which was my number in sequence, I stepped aside. In the meantime, the guard was called away for a minute or so. And on his return, he started by mistake on the next man as number 17. When the crew returned in the evening, the number of men was the same, and I was not missed, and the discovery would take a long time. I walked out of the camp undetected and kept walking for 24 hours, resting in a deserted town the next day. I was able to live by fishing and killing some wildlife. I found coal trains going to Poland and traveled on them by night, until finally I reached Poland. With the help of friends, I made my way to Lutheran, Switzerland. One evening at the Palace Hotel, Lucerne, I had a talk with a man and his wife from the United States of America. This man asked me if I would care to be a guest at his home in Santa Monica, California. I accepted, and when I arrived in Los Angeles, I found that their chauffeur drove me along Wilshire Boulevard and many other boulevards, which I had imagined so vividly in the long months in the Russian coal mines. I recognized the buildings, which I had seen in my mind so often. It actually seemed as if I had been to Los Angeles before. I had reached my goal. I will never cease to marvel at the wonders of the subconscious mind. Truly, it has ways we know not of. How archaeologists and paleontologists reconstruct ancient scenes. These scientists know that their subconscious mind has a memory of everything that has ever transpired. As they study the ancient ruins and fossils through their imaginative perception, their subconscious mind aids them in reconstructing the ancient scenes. The dead past becomes alive and audible once more. Looking at these ancient temples and studying the pottery, statuary, tools, and household utensils of these ancient times, the scientist tells us of an age when there was no language. Communication was done by grunts, groans, and signs. The keen concentration and disciplined imagination of the scientist awakens the latent powers of his subconscious mind, enabling him to clothe the ancient temples with roofs and surround them with gardens, pools, and fountains. The fossil remains are clothed with eyes, sinews, and muscles, and they again walk and talk. The past becomes the living present, and we find that in mind there is no time or space. Through disciplined, controlled, and directed imagination, you can be a companion of the most scientific and inspired thinkers of all time. How to receive guidance from your subconscious. When you have what you term a difficult decision to make, or when you fail to see the solution to your problem, begin at once to think constructively about it. If you are fearful and worried, you are not really thinking. True thinking is free from fear. 
Here is a simple technique you can use to receive guidance on any subject. Quiet the mind and still the body. Tell the body to relax. It has to obey you. It has no volition, initiative, or self-conscious intelligence. Your body is an emotional disk which records your beliefs and impressions. Mobilize your attention. Focus your thought on the solution to your problem. Try to solve it with your conscious mind. Think how happy you would be about the perfect solution. Sense the feeling you would have if the perfect answer were yours now. Let your mind play with this mood in a relaxed way. Then drop off to sleep. When you awaken and you do not have the answer, get busy about something else. Probably when you are preoccupied with something else, the answer will come into your mind like toast pops out of the toaster. In receiving guidance from your subconscious mind, the simple way is the best. This is an illustration. I once lost a valuable ring which was an heirloom. I looked everywhere for it and could not locate it. At night, I talked to the subconscious in the same manner that I would talk to anyone. I said to it prior to dropping off to sleep, you know all things. You know where that ring is and you now reveal to me where it is. In the morning, I awoke suddenly with the words ringing in my ear, ask Robert. I thought it very strange that I should ask Robert, a young boy about nine years of age. However, I followed the inner voice of intuition. Robert said, oh yes, I picked it up in the yard while I was playing with the boys. I placed it on the desk in my room. I did not think it worth anything, so I did not say anything about it. The subconscious mind will always answer you if you trust it. His subconscious revealed the location of his father's will. A young man who attends my lectures had this experience. His father died and apparently left no will. However, this man's sister told him that their father had confided to her that a will had been executed which was fair to all. Every attempt to locate the will failed. Prior to sleep, he talked to his deeper mind as follows. I now turn this request over to the subconscious mind. It knows just where that will is and reveals it to me. Then he condensed his request down to one word, answer, repeating it over and over again as a lullaby. He lulled himself to sleep with the word answer. The next morning, this young man had an overpowering hunch to go to a certain bank in Los Angeles where he found a safe deposit vault registered in the name of his father, the contents of which solved all his problems. Your thought as you go to sleep arouses the powerful latency which is within you. For example, let us suppose you were wondering whether to sell your home, buy a certain stock, sever partnership, move to New York, or stay in Los Angeles, dissolve the present contract, or take a new one. Do this. Sit quietly in your armchair or at the desk in your office. Remember that there is a universal law of action and reaction. The action is your thought. The reaction is the response from your subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is reactive and reflexive. This is its nature. It rebounds, rewards, and repays. It is the law of correspondence. It responds by corresponding. As you contemplate right action, you will automatically experience a reaction or response in yourself which represents the guidance or answer of your subconscious mind. In seeking guidance, you simply think quietly about right action, which means that you are using the infinite intelligence residence in your subconscious mind to the point where it begins to use you. From there on, your course of action is directed and controlled by the subjective wisdom within you, which is all-wise and omnipotent. Your decision will be right. There will only be right action because you are under a subjective compulsion to do the right thing. I use the word compulsion because the law of the subconscious is compulsion. The secret of guidance. The secret of guidance or right action is to mentally devote yourself to the right answer until you find its response in you. The response is a feeling, an inner awareness, and an overpowering hunch whereby you know that you know. You have used the power to the point where it begins to use you. You cannot possibly fail or make one false step while operating under the subjective wisdom within you. You will find that all your ways are pleasantness and all your paths are peace. Chapter 13 Your Subconscious and the Wonders of Sleep You spend about 8 out of every 24 hours or one third of your entire life in sleep. 
This is an inexorable law of life. This also applies to the animal and vegetable kingdoms. Sleep is a divine law, and many answers to our problems come to us when we are sound asleep upon the bed. Many people have advocated the theory that you get tired during the day, that you go to sleep to rest the body, and that a reparative process takes place while you sleep. Nothing rests in sleep. Your heart, your lungs, and all your vital organs function while you're asleep. If you eat prior to sleep, the food is digested and assimilated. Also, your skin secretes perspiration and your nails and hair continue to grow. Your subconscious mind never rests or sleeps. It is always active, controlling all your vital forces. The healing process takes place more rapidly while you are asleep as there is no interference from your conscious mind. Remarkable answers are given to you while you are asleep. Why We Sleep Dr. John Bigelow, a famous research authority on sleep, demonstrated that at night while asleep you receive impressions showing that the nerves of the eyes, ears, nose, and taste buds are active during sleep, and also that the nerves of your brain are quite active. He says that the main reason we sleep is because the nobler part of the soul is united by abstraction to our higher nature and becomes a participant in the wisdom and foreknowledge of the gods. Dr. Bigelow states also, the results of my studies have not only strengthened my convictions that the supposed exemption from customary toils and activities was not the final purpose of sleep, but have also made clear to my mind the conviction that no part of a man's life deserves to be considered more indispensable to its symmetrical and perfect spiritual development than while he is separated from the phenomenal world in sleep. Prayer, a form of sleep. Your conscious mind gets involved with vexations, strife, and contentions of the day, and it is very necessary to withdraw periodically from sense evidence and the objective world and commune silently with the inner wisdom of your subconscious mind. By claiming guidance, strength, and greater intelligence in all phases of your life, you will be enabled to overcome all difficulties and solve your daily problems. This regular withdrawal from sense evidence and the noise and confusion of everyday living is also a form of sleep. For example, you become asleep to the world of the senses and alive to the wisdom and power of your subconscious mind. Startling Effects of Sleep Deprivation Lack of sleep can cause you to become irritable, moody, and depressed. Dr. George Stevenson of the National Association for Mental Health says, I believe it can be safely said that all human beings need a minimum of six hours sleep to be healthy. Most people need more. Those who think they can get along on less are fooling themselves. Medical research scholars investigating sleep processes and deprivation of sleep point out that severe insomnia has preceded psychologic breakdown in some instances. Remember, you are spiritually recharged during sleep, and adequate sleep is essential to produce joy and vitality in life. You need more sleep. Robert O'Brien, in an article, Maybe You Need More Sleep, in an issue of the Reader's Digest, reports the following experiment on sleep. For the last three years, experiments have been in progress at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in Washington, D.C. Subjects, more than 100 military and civilian volunteers, have been kept awake for as long as four days. Thousands of tests have measured the effects of their behavior and personality. Results of these tests have given scientists astonishingly new insights into the mysteries of sleep. They now know that a tired brain apparently craves sleep so hungrily that it will sacrifice anything to get it. After only a few hours of sleep loss, fleeting stolen naps called lapses or microsleep occurred at the rate of three or four an hour. As in sleep, eyelids dropped, heartbeat slowed. Each lapse lasted just a fraction of a second. Sometimes the lapses were periods of blankness, sometimes they were filled with images, wisps of dreams. As hours of sleep loss mounted, the lapses took place more often and lasted longer, perhaps two or three seconds. Even if the subjects had been piloting an airliner in a thunderstorm, they still couldn't have resisted microsleeps for those few priceless seconds. And it can happen to you, as many who have fallen asleep at the wheel of a car can testify. Another startling effect of sleep deprivation was its attack on human memory and perception. 
Many sleep-deprived subjects were unable to retain information long enough to relate it to the tasks they were supposed to perform. They were totally befuddled in situations requiring them to hold several factors in mind and act on them as a pilot must when he skillfully integrates wind direction, airspeed, altitude, and glide path to make a safe landing. Sleep brings counsel. A young lady in Los Angeles who listens to my morning radio talks told me that she has been offered a lucrative position in New York City at twice her present salary. She was wondering whether to accept or not and prayed prior to sleep as follows. The creative intelligence of my subconscious mind knows what is best for me. Its tendency is always lifeward and it reveals to me the right direction, which blesses all concerned. I give thanks for the answer which I know will come to me. She repeated this simple prayer over and over again as a lullaby prior to sleep and in the morning she had a persistent feeling that she should not accept the offer. She rejected the offer and subsequent events verified her inward sense of knowing because the company went bankrupt in a few months following their offer of employment to her. The conscious mind may be correct on the facts objectively known, but the intuitive faculty of her subconscious mind saw the failure of the concern in question and prompted her accordingly. Saved from certain disaster. I will illustrate how the wisdom of your subconscious mind can instruct you and protect you relative to your request for right action as you go to sleep. Many years ago, before the Second World War, I was offered a very lucrative assignment in the Orient, and I prayed for guidance and the right decision as follows. Infinite intelligence within me knows all things, and the right decision is revealed to me in divine order. I will recognize the answer when it comes. I repeated this simple prayer over and over again as a lullaby prior to sleep, and in a dream came the vivid realization of things to come three years hence. An old friend appeared in the dream and said, Read these headlines. Do not go. The headlines of the newspaper which appeared in the dream related to war and attack on Pearl Harbor. Occasionally, the writer dreams literally. The aforementioned dream was undoubtedly a dramatization of the subconscious mind which projected a person whom I trusted and respected. To some, a warning may come in the form of a mother who appears in a dream. She tells the person not to go here or there and the reason for the warning. Your subconscious mind is all wise. It knows all things. Oftentimes, it will speak to you only in a voice that your conscious mind will immediately accept as true. Sometimes your subconscious will warn you in a voice which sounds like that of your mother or some loved one which may cause you to stop on the street and you find if you had gone another foot a falling object from a window might have struck you on the head. My subconscious mind is one with the universe subconscious and it knew the Japanese were planning a war and it also knew when the war would start. Dr. Ryan, director of the Department of Psychology at Duke University, has gathered together a vast amount of evidence showing that a great number of people all over the world see events before they happen, and in many instances are, therefore, able to avoid the tragic event which was foreseen vividly in a dream. The dream which I had showed clearly the headlines in the New York Times about three years prior to the tragedy of Pearl Harbor. In consequence of this dream, I immediately canceled the trip as I felt a subconscious compulsion to do so. Three years later, the Second World War proved the truth of the inner voice of intuition. Your future is in your subconscious mind. Remember that the future, the result of your habitual thinking, is already in your mind except when you change it through prayer. The future of a country, likewise, is in the collective subconscious of the people of that nation. There is nothing strange in the dream I had wherein I saw the headlines of the New York newspapers long before the war began. The war had already taken place in mind, and all the plans of attack were already engraved on that great recording instrument, the subconscious mind or collective unconscious of the universal mind. Tomorrow's events are in your subconscious mind. So are next week's and next month's, and they may be seen by a highly psychic or clairvoyant person. No disaster or tragedy can happen to you if you decide to pray. Nothing is predetermined or foreordained. Your mental attitude, for example, the way you think, feel, and believe determines your destiny. You can, through scientific prayer, which is explained in a previous chapter, mold, fashion, and create your own future. 
Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. A catnap gets him fifteen thousand dollars. One of my students mailed me a newspaper clipping three or four years ago about a man called Ray Hammerstrom, a roller at the steelworks in Pittsburgh operated by Jones and Laughlin Steel Corporation. He received fifteen thousand dollars for his dream. According to the article, the engineers could not fix a faulty switch in a newly installed bar mill which controlled the delivery of straight bars to the cooling beds. The engineers worked on the switch about 11 or 12 times to no avail. Hammerstrom thought a lot about the problem and tried to figure out a new design which might work. Nothing worked. One afternoon, he lay down for a nap, and prior to sleep, he began to think about the answer to the switch problem. He had a dream in which a perfect design for the switch was portrayed. When he awoke, he sketched his new design according to the outline of his dream. This visionary catnap won Hammerstrom a check for fifteen thousand dollars, the largest award the firm ever gave an employee for a new idea. How a famous professor solved his problem in sleep. Dr. H. V. Helprick. Professor of Assyrian at the University of Pennsylvania wrote as follows: One Saturday morning, I had been wearying myself in the vain attempt to decipher two small fragments of a gate which were supposed to belong to the finger rings of some Babylonians. About midnight, weary and exhausted, I went to bed and dreamed the following remarkable dream. A tall, thin priest of Nippur, about forty years of age, led me to the treasure chamber of the temple, a small, low-ceilinged room without windows, while scrapes of a gate and lapazula lay scattered on the floor. Here he addressed me as follows: the two fragments which you have published separately on page twenty-two and twenty-six belong together, are not finger rings. The first two rings served as earrings for the statue of the god. The two fragments you have are the portions of them. If you will put them together, you will have confirmation of my words. I awoke at once. I examined the fragments, and to my astonishment, found the dream verified. The problem was then at last solved. This demonstrates clearly the creative manifestation of his subconscious mind, which knew the answer to all his problems. How the subconscious works for a famous writer while he slept. Robert Louis Stevenson, in one of his books *Across the Plains*, devotes a whole chapter to dreams. He was a vivid dreamer and had the persistent habit of giving specific instructions to his subconscious every night prior to sleep. He would request his subconscious to evolve stories for him while he slept. For example, if Stevenson's funds were at low ebb, his command to his subconscious would be something like this. Give me a good, thrilling novel which will be marketable and profitable. His subconscious responded magnificently. Stevenson says these little brownies, the intelligences and powers of his subconscious, can tell me a story piece by piece, like a serial, and keep me, its supposed creator, all the while in total ignorance of where they aim. And he added that part of my work, which is done when I am up and about while he is consciously aware and awake, is by no means necessarily mine, since all goes to show that the brownies have a hand in it even then. Sleep in peace and wake in joy. To those who suffer from insomnia, you will find the following prayer very effective. Repeat it slowly, quietly, and lovingly prior to sleep. My toes are relaxed. My ankles are relaxed. My abdominal muscles are relaxed. My heart and lungs are relaxed. My hands and arms are relaxed. My neck is relaxed. My brain is relaxed. My face is relaxed. My eyes are relaxed. My whole mind and body are relaxed. I fully and freely forgive everyone, and I sincerely wish for them harmony, health. Peace and all the blessings of me. I am at peace. I am poised, serene, and calm. I rest in security and in peace. A great stillness steals over me, and a great calm quiets my whole being as I realize the divine presence within me. I know that the realization of life and love heals me. I wrap myself in the mantle of love and fall asleep filled with goodwill for all. Throughout the night, peace remains with me, and in the morning, I shall be filled with life and love. A circle of love is drawn around me. I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. 
I sleep in peace, I wake in joy, and in Him I live, move, and have my being. Chapter 14 Your Subconscious Mind and Marital Problems Ignorance of the functions and powers of the mind is the cause of all marital trouble. Each using the law of mind correctly can solve friction between husband and wife. By praying together, they stay together. The contemplation of divine ideals, the study of the laws of life, the mutual agreement on a common purpose and plan, and the enjoyment of personal freedom bring about that harmonious marriage, that wedded bliss, that sense of oneness where the two become one. The best time to prevent divorce is before marriage. It is not wrong to try to get out of a very bad situation. But why get into the bad situation in the first place? Would it not be better to give attention to the real cause of marital problems? In other words, to really get at the root of the matter involved. As with all other problems of men and women, the problems of divorce, separation, annulment, and endless litigation are directly traceable to lack of knowledge of the working and interrelationship of the conscious and subconscious mind. The Meaning of Marriage Marriage to be real must first be on a spiritual basis. It must be of the heart, and the heart is the chalice of love. Honesty, sincerity, kindness, and integrity are also forms of love. Each partner should be perfectly honest and sincere with the other. It is not a true marriage when a man marries a woman for her money, social position, or to lift his ego, because this indicates a lack of sincerity, honesty, and true love. Such a marriage is a farce, a sham, and a masquerade. When a woman says, I am tired of working, I want to get married because I want security, her premise is false. She is not using the laws of mind correctly. Her security depends upon her knowledge of the interaction of the conscious and subconscious mind and its application. For example, a woman will never lack for wealth or health if she applies the techniques outlined in the respective chapters of this book. Her wealth can come to her independent of her husband, father, or anyone else. A woman is not dependent on her husband for health, peace, joy, inspiration, guidance, love, wealth, security, happiness, or anything in the world. Her security and peace of mind come from her knowledge of the inner powers within her and from the constant use of the laws of her own mind in a constructive fashion. How to Attract the Ideal Husband you are now acquainted with the way your subconscious mind works. You know that whatever you impress upon it will be experienced in your world. Begin now to impress your subconscious mind with the qualities and characteristics you desire in a man. The following is an excellent technique. Sit down at night in your armchair, close your eyes, let go, relax the body, become very quiet, passive, and receptive. Talk to your subconscious mind and say to it, I am now attracting a man into my experience who is honest, sincere, loyal, faithful, peaceful, happy, and prosperous. These qualities which I admire are sinking down into my subconscious mind now. As I dwell upon these characteristics, they become a part of me and are embodied subconsciously. I know there is an irresistible law of attraction and that I attract to me a man according to my subconscious belief. I attract that which I feel to be true in my subconscious mind. I know I can contribute to his peace and happiness. He loves my ideals and I love his ideals. He does not want to make me over, neither do I want to make him over. There is mutual love, freedom, and respect. Practice this process of impregnating your subconscious mind. Then you will have the joy of attracting to you a man possessing the qualities and characteristics you mentally dwelt upon. Your subconscious intelligence will open up a pathway whereby both of you will meet according to the irresistible and changeless flow of your own subconscious mind. Have a keen desire to give the best that is in you of love, devotion, and cooperation. Be receptive to this gift of love, which you have given to your subconscious mind. How to Attract the Ideal Wife Affirm as follows, I now attract the right woman who is in complete accord with me. This is a spiritual union because it is divine love functioning through the personality of someone with whom I blend perfectly. I know I can give to this woman love, light, peace, and joy. 
I feel and believe I can make this woman's life full, complete, and wonderful. I now decree that she possesses the following qualities and attributes. She is spiritual, loyal, faithful, and true. She is harmonious, peaceful, and happy. We are irresistibly attracted to each other. Only that which belongs to love, truth, and beauty can enter my experience. I accept my ideal companion now. As you think quietly and with interest on the qualities and attributes which you admire in the companion you seek, you will build the mental equivalent into your mentality. Then the deeper currents of your subconscious mind will bring both of you together in divine order. No need for third mistake. Recently a teacher said to me, I have had three husbands and all three have been passive, submissive, and dependent on me to make all decisions and govern everything. Why do I attract such type men? I asked her whether she had known that her second husband was the effeminate type and she replied, of course not. Had I known, I would not have married him. Apparently she had not learned anything from the first mistake. The trouble was with her personality makeup. She was very masculine, domineering, and unconsciously wanted someone who would be submissive and passive so that she could play the dominant role. All this was unconscious motivation, and her subconscious picture attracted to her what she subjectively wanted. She had to learn to break the pattern by adopting the right prayer process. How she broke the negative pattern. The above-mentioned woman learned a simple truth. When you believe you can have the type of man you idealize, it is done unto you as you believe. The following is the specific prayer she used to break the old subconscious pattern and attract to her the ideal mate. I am building into my mentality the type of man I deeply desire. The man I attract for a husband is strong, powerful, loving, very masculine, successful, honest, loyal, and faithful. He finds love and happiness with me. I love to follow where he leads. I know he wants me, and I want him. I am honest, sincere, loving, and kind. I have wonderful gifts to offer him. They are goodwill, a joyous heart, and a healthy body. He offers me the same. It is mutual. I give and I receive. Divine intelligence knows where this man is, and the deeper wisdom of my subconscious mind is now bringing both of us together in its own way and we recognize each other immediately. I release this request to my subconscious mind, which knows how to bring my request to pass. I give thanks for the perfect answer. She prayed in the above manner night and morning, affirming these truths and knowing that through frequent occupation of the mind, she would reach the mental equivalent of that which she sought. The Answer to Her Prayer Several months went by. She had a great number of dates and social engagements, none of which was agreeable to her. When she was about to question, waver, doubt, and vacillate, she reminded herself that the infinite intelligence was bringing it to pass in its own way, and that there was nothing to be concerned about. Her final decree in her divorce proceedings was granted, which brought her a great sense of release and mental freedom. Shortly afterwards, she went to work as a receptionist in a doctor's office. She told me that the minute she saw the physician, she knew he was the man she was praying about. Apparently, he knew it too, because he proposed to her the first week she was in the office, and their subsequent marriage was ideally happy. This physician was not the passive or submissive type, but was a real man a former football player, an outstanding athlete, and was a deeply spiritual man, though he was completely devoid of any secretarian or denominational affiliation. She got what she prayed for because she claimed it mentally until she reached the point of saturation. In other words, she mentally and emotionally united with her idea, and it became a part of her in the same way that an apple becomes a part of her bloodstream. Should I get a divorce? Divorce is an individual problem. It cannot be generalized. In some cases, of course, there never should have been a marriage. In some cases, divorce is not the solution. No more so than marriage is the solution for a lonely man. Divorce may be right for one person and wrong for another. A divorced woman may be far more sincere and noble than many of her married sisters who perhaps are living a lie. For example, I once talked with a woman whose husband was a dope fiend, an ex-convict, a wife beater, and a non-provider. She had been told it was wrong to get a divorce. I explained to her that marriage is of the heart. 
If two hearts blend harmoniously, lovingly, and sincerely, that is the ideal marriage. The pure action of the heart is love. Following this explanation, she knew what to do. She knew in her heart that there is no divine law which compelled her to be browbeaten, intimidated, and beaten because someone said, I pronounce you man and wife. If you are in doubt as to what to do, ask for guidance, knowing that there is always an answer, and you will receive it. Follow the lead that comes to you in the silence of your soul. It speaks to you in peace. Drifting into Divorce Recently, a young couple, married for only a few months, was seeking a divorce. I discovered that the young man had a constant fear that his wife would leave him. He expected rejection, and he believed that she would be unfaithful. These thoughts haunted his mind and became an obsession with him. His mental attitude was one of separation and suspicion. She felt unresponsive to him. It was his own feeling and atmosphere of loss and separation operating through them. This brought about a condition or action in accordance with the mental pattern behind it. There is a law of action and reaction or cause and effect. The thought is the action and the response of the subconscious mind is the reaction. His wife left home and asked for a divorce, which is what he feared and believed she would do. Divorce begins in the mind. Divorce takes place first in the mind. The legal proceedings follow after. These two young people were full of resentment, fear, suspicion, and anger. These attitudes weaken, exhaust, and debilitate the whole being. They learned that hate divides and that love unites. They began to realize what they had been doing with their minds. Neither one of them knew the law of mental action, nor they were misusing their minds and bringing on chaos and misery. These two people went back together at my suggestion and experimented with prayer therapy. They began to radiate love, peace, and goodwill to each other. Each one practiced radiating harmony, health, peace, and love to the other, and they alternated in the reading of the Psalms every night. Their marriage is growing more beautiful every day. The Nagging Wife Many times the reason the wife nags is because she gets no attention. Oftentimes it is a craving for love and affection. Give your wife attention and show your appreciation. Praise and exalt all her many good points. There is also the nagging type of woman who wants to make the man conform to her particular pattern. This is about the quickest way in the world to get rid of a man. The wife and the husband must cease being scavengers, always looking at the petty faults or errors in each other. Let each give attention and praise for the constructive and wonderful qualities in the other. The Brooding Husband if a man begins to brood, grows morbid against his wife because of the things she said or did, he is, psychologically speaking, committing adultery. One of the meanings of adultery is idolatry. Example, giving attention to or uniting mentally with that which is negative and destructive. When a man is silently resenting his wife and is full of hostility towards her, he is unfaithful. He is not faithful to his marriage vows, which are to love, cherish, and honor her all the days of his life. The man who is brooding, bitter, and resentful can swallow his sharp remarks, abate his anger, and he can go to great lengths to be considerate, kind, and courteous. He can deftly skirt the differences. Through praise and mental effort, he can get out of the habit of antagonism. Then, he will be able to get along better, not only with his wife, but with his business associates also. Assume the harmonious state, and eventually, you will find peace and harmony. The Great Mistake a great mistake is to discuss your marital problems or difficulties with neighbors and relatives. Suppose, for example, a wife says to the neighbor, John never gives me any money. He treats my mother abominably, drinks to excess, and is constantly abusive and insulting. Now, this wife is degrading and belittling her husband in the eyes of all the neighbors and relatives. He no longer appears as the ideal husband to them. Never discuss your marital problems with anyone except a trained counselor. Why cause numerous people to think negatively of your marriage? Moreover, as you discuss and dwell upon these shortcomings of your husband, you are actually creating these states within yourself. Who is thinking and feeling it? You are. As you think and feel, so are you. Relatives will usually give you the wrong advice. It is usually biased and prejudiced because it is not given in an impersonal way. Any advice you receive which violates the golden rule, which is a cosmic law, is not good or sound.
It is well to remember that no two human beings ever live beneath the same roof without clashes of temperament, periods of hurts and strain. Never display the unhappy side of your marriage to your friends. Keep your quarrels to yourself. Refrain from criticism and condemnation of your partner. Don't try to make your wife over. A husband must not try to make his wife over into a second edition of himself. The tactless attempt to change her in many ways is foreign to her nature. These attempts are always foolish and many times result in dissolution of the marriage. These attempts to alter her destroy her pride and self-esteem and arouse the spirit of contrariness and resentment that proves fatal to the marriage bond. Adjustments are needed, of course, but if you have a good look inside your own mind and study your character and behavior, you will find so many shortcomings they will keep you busy the rest of your life. If you say, I will make him over into what I want, you are looking for trouble and the divorce court. You are asking for misery. You will have to learn the hard way that there is no one to change but yourself. Pray together and stay together through steps in prayer. The first step, never carry over from one day to another accumulated irritations arising from little disappointments. Be sure to forgive each other for any sharpness before you retire at night. The moment you awaken in the morning, claim infinite intelligence is guiding you in all your ways. Send out loving thoughts of peace, harmony, and love to your marriage partner, to all members of the family, and to the whole world. The second step, say grace at breakfast. Give thanks for the wonderful food, for your abundance, and for all your blessings. Make sure that no problems, worries, or arguments shall enter into the table conversation. The same applies at dinner time. Say to your wife or husband, I appreciate all you are doing, and I radiate love and goodwill to you all day long. The third step, the husband and wife should alternate in praying each night. Do not take your marriage partner for granted. Show your appreciation and love. Think appreciation and goodwill rather than condemnation, criticism, and nagging. The way to build a peaceful home and a happy marriage is to use a foundation of love, beauty, harmony, mutual respect, faith in God, and all things good. Read the 23rd, 27th, and 91st Psalms, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and other great texts of the Bible before going to sleep. As you practice these truths, your marriage will grow more and more blessed through the years. Chapter 15, Your Subconscious Mind and Your Happiness William James, father of American psychology, said that the greatest discovery of the 19th century was not in the realm of physical science. The greatest discovery was the power of the subconscious touched by faith. In every human being is that limitless reservoir of power which can overcome any problem in the world. True and lasting happiness will come into your life the day you get the clear realization that you can overcome any weakness the day you realize that your subconscious can solve your problems, heal your body, and prosper you beyond your fondest dream. You might have felt very happy when your child was born, when you got married, when you graduated from college, or when you won a great victory or a prize. You might have been very happy when you became engaged to the loveliest girl or the most handsome man. You could go on and list innumerable experiences which have made you happy. However, no matter how marvelous these experiences are, they do not give real lasting happiness. They are transitory. The book of Proverbs gives the answer, Whosoever trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. When you trust in the Lord, the power and wisdom of your subconscious mind to lead, guide, govern, and direct all your ways, you will become poised, serene, and relaxed. As you radiate love, peace, and goodwill to all, you are really building a superstructure of happiness for all the days of your life. You must choose happiness. Happiness is a state of mind. There is a phrase in the Bible which says, Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. You have the freedom to choose happiness. This may seem extraordinarily simple, and it is. Perhaps this is why people stumble over the way to happiness. They do not see the simplicity of the key to happiness. The great things of life are simple, dynamic, and creative. They produce well-being and happiness. St. Paul reveals to you how you can think your way into a life of dynamic power and happiness in these words. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, 
whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good rapport, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Galatians 4.8 How to Choose Happiness Begin now to choose happiness. This is how you do it. When you open your eyes in the morning, say to yourself, Divine order takes charge of my life today and every day. All things work together for good for me today. This is a new and wonderful day for me. There will never be another day like this one. I am divinely guided all day long, and whatever I do will prosper. Divine love surrounds me, enfolds me, and enwraps me, and I go forth in peace. Whenever my attention wanders away from that which is good and constructive, I will immediately bring it back to the contemplation of that which is lovely and of good rapport. I am a spiritual and mental magnet attracting to myself all things which bless and prosper me. I am going to be a wonderful success in all my undertakings today. I am definitely going to be happy all day long. Start each day in this manner, then you will be choosing happiness, and you will be a radiant, joyous person. He made it a habit to be happy. A number of years ago, I stayed for about a week in a farmer's house in Connemara on the west coast of Ireland. He seemed to be always singing and whistling and was full of humor. I asked him the secret of his happiness, and his reply was, It is a habit of mine to be happy. Every morning when I awaken and every night before I go to sleep, I bless my family, the crops, the cattle, and I thank God for the wonderful harvest. This farmer had made a practice of this for over 40 years. As you know, thoughts repeated regularly and systematically sink into the subconscious mind and become habitual. He discovered that happiness is a habit. You must desire to be happy. There is one very important point about being happy. You must sincerely desire to be happy. There are people who have been depressed, dejected, and unhappy so long that when they suddenly were made happy by some wonderful, good, joyous news, they would actually be like the woman who said to me, It is wrong to be so happy. They have been so accustomed to the old mental patterns that they do not feel at home being happy. They long for the former depressed, unhappy state. I knew a woman in England who had rheumatism for many years. She would pat herself on the knee and say, My rheumatism is bad today. I cannot go out. My rheumatism keeps me miserable. This dear elderly lady got a lot of attention from her son, daughter, and the neighbors. She really wanted her rheumatism. She enjoyed her misery, as she called it. This woman did not really want to be happy. I suggested a curative procedure to her. I wrote down some biblical verses and told her that if she gave attention to these truths, her mental attitude would undoubtedly change and will result in her faith and confidence in being restored to health. She was not interested. There seems to be a peculiar mental morbid streak in many people whereby they seem to enjoy being miserable and sad. Why choose unhappiness? Many people choose unhappiness by entertaining these ideas. Today is a black day. Everything is going to go wrong. I am not going to succeed. Everyone is against me. Business is bad and it is going to get worse. I'm always late. I never get the breaks. He can, but I can't. If you have this attitude of mind the first thing in the morning, you will attract all these experiences to you and you will be very unhappy. Begin to realize that the world you live in is determined largely by what goes on in your mind. Marcus Aurelius, the great Roman philosopher and sage, said, A man's life is what his thoughts make of it. Emerson, America's foremost philosopher, said, A man is what he thinks all day long. The thoughts you habitually entertain in your mind have the tendency to actualize themselves in physical conditions. Make certain you do not indulge in negative thoughts, defeatist thoughts, or unkind depressing thoughts. Recall frequently to your mind that you can experience nothing outside your own mentality. If I had a million dollars, I would be happy. I have visited many men in mental institutions who were millionaires, but they insisted they were penniless and destitute. They were incarcerated because of psychotic, paranoid, and manic depressive tendencies. Wealth in and of itself will not make you happy. On the other hand, it is not a deterrent to happiness. 
Today, there are many people trying to buy happiness through the purchase of radios, television sets, automobiles, a home in the country, a private yacht, and a swimming pool. But happiness cannot be purchased or procured in that way. The kingdom of happiness is in your thought and feeling. Too many people have the idea that it takes something artificial to produce happiness. Some say, if I were elected mayor, made president of the organization, promoted to general manager of the corporation, I would be happy. The truth is that happiness is a mental and spiritual state. None of these positions mentioned will necessarily bequeath happiness. Your strength, joy, and happiness consist in finding out the law of divine order and right action lodged in your subconscious mind, and by applying these principles in all phases of your life. He found happiness to be the harvest of a quiet mind. Lecturing in San Francisco some years ago, I interviewed a man who was very unhappy and dejected over the way his business was going. He was the general manager. His heart was filled with resentment toward the vice president and the president of the organization. He claimed that they opposed him. Because of this internal strife, business was declining. He was receiving no dividends or stock bonuses. This is how he solved his business problem. The first thing in the morning, he affirmed quietly as follows. All those working in our corporation are honest, sincere, cooperative, faithful, and full of goodwill to all. They are mental and spiritual links in the chain of this corporation's growth, welfare, and prosperity. I radiate love, peace, and goodwill in my thoughts, words, and deeds to my two associates and to all those in the company. The president and the vice president of our company are divinely guided in all their undertakings. The infinite intelligence of my subconscious mind makes all decisions through me. There is only right action in our business transactions and in our relationship with each other. I send the messengers of peace, love, and goodwill before me to the office. Peace and harmony reign supreme in the minds and hearts of all those in the company, including myself. I now go forth into a new day full of faith, confidence, and trust. This business executive repeated the above meditation slowly three times in the morning, feeling the truth of what he affirmed. When fearful or angry thoughts came into his mind during the day, he would say to himself, Peace, harmony, and poise govern my mind at all times. As he continued disciplining his mind in this manner, all the harmful thoughts ceased to come, and peace came into his mind. He reaped the harvest. Subsequently, he wrote me to the effect that at the end of about two weeks of reordering his mind, the president and the vice president called him into the office, praised his operations and his new constructive ideas, and remarked how fortunate they were in having him as general manager. He was very happy in discovering that man finds happiness within himself. The block or stump is not really there. I read a newspaper article some years ago which told me about a horse that shied when he came to a stump on the road. Subsequently, every time the horse came to that same stump, he shied. The farmer dug the stump out, burned it, and leveled the old road. Yet for 25 years, every time the horse passed the place where the former stump was, he shied. The horse was shying at the memory of a stump. There is no block to your happiness save in your own thought life and mental imagery. Is fear or worry holding you back? Fear is a thought in your mind. You can dig it up this very moment by supplanting it with faith in success, achievement, and victory over all problems. I knew a man who failed in business. He said to me, I made mistakes. I've learned a lot. I am going back into business and I will be a tremendous success. He faced up to that stump in his mind. He did not whine or complain, but he tore up the stump of failure, and through believing in his inner powers to back him up, he banished all fear thoughts and old depressions. Believe in yourself, and you will succeed and be happy. The Happiest People The happiest man is he who constantly brings forth and practices what is best in him. Happiness and virtue complement each other. The best are not only the happiest, but the happiest are usually the best in the art of living life successfully. God is the highest and best in you. Express more of God's love, light, truth, and beauty, and you will become one of the happiest persons in the world today. Epictetus, the Greek Stoic philosopher, said, There is but one way to tranquility of mind and happiness. Let this, therefore, be always ready at hand with thee. 
both when thou wakest early in the morning, and all the day long, and when thou goest late to sleep, to account no external things thy own, but commit all these to God. Chapter 16 Your Subconscious Mind and Harmonious Human Relations In studying this book, you learn that your subconscious mind is a recording machine, which faithfully reproduces whatever you impress upon it. This is one of the reasons for the application of the golden rule in human relations. All things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them. This quotation has outer and inner meanings. You are interested in its inner meaning from the standpoint of your subconscious mind, which is, as you would that men should think about you, think you about them in a like manner. As you would that men should feel about you, feel you also about them in like manner. As you would want men to act toward you, act you toward them in like manner. For example, you may be polite and courteous to someone in your office, but when his back is turned, you are very critical and resentful toward him in your mind. Such negative thoughts are highly destructive to you. It is like taking poison. You are actually taking mental poisons which rob you of vitality, enthusiasm, strength, guidance, and goodwill. These negative thoughts and emotions sink down into your subconscious and cause all kinds of difficulties and maladies in your life. The Master Key to Happy Relationships with Others Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. A study of this quotation and the application of the inner truths therein contained represent the real key to harmonious relations. To judge is to think, to arrive at a mental verdict or conclusion in your mind. The thought you have about the other person is your thought because you are thinking it. Your thoughts are creative, therefore you actually create in your own experience what you think and feel about the other person. It is also true that the suggestion you give to another, you give to yourself, because your mind is the creative medium. This is why it is said, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. When you know this law and the way your subconscious mind works, you are careful to think, feel, and act right towards others. These verses teach you about the emancipation of man and reveal to you the solution to your individual problems. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. The good you do for others comes back to you in like measure, and the evil you do returns to you by the law of your own mind. If a man cheats and deceives another, he is actually cheating and deceiving himself. His sense of guilt and mood of loss inevitably will attract loss to him in some way at some time. His subconscious records his mental act and reacts according to the mental intention or motivation. Your subconscious mind is impersonal and unchanging, neither considering persons nor respecting religious affiliations or institutions of any kind. It is neither compassionate nor vindictive. The way you think, feel, and act toward others returns at last upon yourself. The daily headlines made him sick. Begin now to observe yourself. Observe your reactions to people, conditions, and circumstances. How do you respond to the events and news of the day? It makes no difference at all the other people were wrong and you alone were right. If the news disturbs you, it is your evil because your negative emotions robbed you of peace and harmony. A woman wrote me about her husband saying that he goes into a rage when he reads what certain newspaper columnists write in the newspaper. She added that this constant reaction of anger and suppressed rage on his part brought on bleeding ulcers and his physician recommended an emotional reconditioning. I invited this man to see me and I explained to him the way his mind functions indicating how emotionally immature it was to get angry when others write articles with which he disapproves or disagrees. He began to realize that he should give the newspaper man freedom to express himself even though the latter disagreed with him politically, religiously, or in any other way. In the same manner, the newspaper man would give him freedom to write a letter to the newspaper disagreeing with his published statements. He learned that he could disagree without being disagreeable. He awakened to the simple truth that it is never what a person says or does that affects him. It is his reaction to what is said or done that matters.
This explanation was the cure for this man, and he realized that with a little practice he could master his morning tantrums. His wife told me subsequently that he laughed at himself and also at what the columnists say. They no longer have power to disturb, annoy, and irritate him. His ulcers have disappeared due to his emotional poise and serenity. I hate women, but I like men. A private secretary was very bitter towards some of the girls in her office because they were gossiping about her and, as she said, spreading vicious lies about her. She admitted that she did not like women. She said, I hate women, but I like men. I discovered also that she spoke to the girls who were under her in the office in a very haughty, imperious, and irritable tone of voice. She pointed out that they took a delight in making things difficult for her. There was a certain pomposity in her way of speaking, and I could see where her tone of voice would affect some people unpleasantly. If all the people in the office or factory annoy you, isn't it a possibility that the vibration, annoyance, and turmoil may be due to some subconscious pattern or mental projection from you? We know that a dog will react ferociously if you hate or fear dogs. Animals pick up your subconscious vibrations and react accordingly. Many undisciplined human beings are just as sensitive as dogs, cats, and other animals. I suggested a process of prayer to this private secretary who hated women, explaining to her that when she began to identify herself with spiritual values and commenced to affirm the truths of life, her voice, mannerisms, and hatred of women would completely disappear. She was surprised to know that the emotion of hatred shows up in a person's speech, actions, in his writings, and in all phases of his life. She ceased reacting in the typical, resentful, and angry way. She established a pattern of prayer, which she practiced regularly, systematically, and consciously in the office. The prayer was as follows. I think, speak, and act lovingly, quietly, and peacefully. I now radiate love, peace, tolerance, and kindliness to all the girls who criticized me and gossiped about me. I anchor my thoughts on peace, harmony, and goodwill to all. Whenever I am about to react negatively, I say firmly to myself, I am going to think, speak, and act from the standpoint of the principle of harmony, health, and peace within myself. Creative intelligence leads, rules, and guides me in all my ways. The practice of this prayer transformed her life, and she found that all criticism and annoyance ceased. The girls became co-workers and friends along life's journey. She discovered that there is no one to change but myself. His inner speech held back his promotion. One day a salesman came to see me and described his difficulties in working with the sales manager of his organization. He had been with the company 10 years and had received no promotion or recognition of any kind. He showed me his sales figures, which were greater proportionally than the other men in the territory. He said that the sales manager did not like him that he was unjustly treated and that at conferences the manager was rude to him and at times ridiculed his suggestions. I explained that undoubtedly the cause was to a great degree within himself and that his concept and belief about his superior bore witness to the reaction of this man. The measure we meet shall be measured to us again. His mental measure or concept of the sales manager was that he was mean and cantankerous. He was filled with bitterness and hostility toward the executive. On his way to work, he conducted a vigorous conversation with himself filled with criticism, mental arguments, recriminations, and denunciations of his sales manager. What he gave out mentally, he was inevitably bound to get back. This salesman realized that his inner speech was highly destructive because the intensity and force of his silent thoughts and emotions and personally conducted mental condemnation and vilification of the sales manager entered into his own subconscious mind. This brought about the negative response from his boss as well as creating many other personal, physical, and emotional disorders. He began to pray frequently as follows. I am the only thinker in my universe. I am responsible for what I think about my boss. My sales manager is not responsible for the way I think about him. I refuse to give power to any person, place, or thing to annoy me or disturb me. I wish health, success, peace of mind, and happiness for my boss. I sincerely wish him well, and I know he is divinely guided in all his ways. He repeated this prayer out loud slowly, quietly, and feelingly, knowing that his mind is like a garden, and that whatever he plants in the garden will come forth like seeds after their kind. 
I also told him to practice mental imagery prior to sleep in this way. He imagined that his sales manager was congratulating him on his fine work, on his zeal and enthusiasm, and on his wonderful response from customers. He felt the reality of all this, felt his handshake, heard the tone of his voice, and saw him smile. He made a real mental movie, dramatizing it to the best of his ability. Night after night, he conducted this mental movie, knowing that his subconscious mind was the receptive plate on which his conscious imagery would be impressed. Gradually, by a process of what may be termed mental and spiritual osmosis, the impression was made on his subconscious mind, and the expression automatically came forth. The sales manager subsequently called him up to San Francisco, congratulated him, and gave him a new assignment as division sales manager over 100 men with a big increase in salary. He changed his concept and estimate of his boss, and the latter responded accordingly. Becoming Emotionally Mature What the other person says or does cannot really annoy or irritate you except you permit him to disturb you. The only way he can annoy you is through your own thought. For example, if you get angry, you have to go through four stages in your mind. You begin to think about what he said. You decide to get angry and generate an emotion of rage. Then you decide to act. Perhaps you talk back and react in kind. You see that the thought, emotion, reaction, and action all take place in your mind. When you become emotionally mature, you do not respond negatively to the criticism and resentment of others. To do so would mean that you had descended to that state of low mental vibration and become one with the negative atmosphere of the other. Identify yourself with your aim in life and you do not permit any person, place, or thing to deflect you from your inner sense of peace, tranquility, and radiant health. The Meaning of Love and Harmonious Human Relations Sigmund Freud, the Australian founder of psychoanalysis, said that unless the personality has love, it sickens and dies. Love includes understanding, goodwill, and respect for the divinity in the other person. The more love and goodwill you emanate and exude, the more comes back to you. If you puncture the other fellow's ego and wound his estimate of himself, you cannot gain his goodwill. Recognize that every man wants to be loved and appreciated and made to feel important in the world. Realize that the other man is conscious of his true worth and that, like yourself, he feels the dignity of being an expression of the one life principle animating all men. As you do this consciously and knowingly, you build the other person up and he returns your love and goodwill. He hated audiences. An actor told me that the audience booed and hissed him on his first appearance on the stage. He added that the play was badly written and that undoubtedly he did not play a good role. He admitted openly to me that for months afterward he hated audiences. He called them dopes, dummies, stupid, ignorant, gullible, etc. He quit the stage in disgust and went to work in the drugstore for a year. One day, a friend invited him to hear a lecture in Town Hall, New York City, on how to get along with ourselves. This lecture changed his life. He went back to the stage and began to pray sincerely for the audience and himself. He poured out love and goodwill every night before appearing on the stage. He made it a habit to claim that the peace of God filled the hearts of all present, and that all present were lifted up and inspired. During each performance, he sent out love vibrations to the audience. Today, he is a great actor and he loves and respects people. His goodwill and esteem are transmitted to others and are felt by them. Handling Difficult People There are difficult people in the world who are twisted and distorted mentally. They are malconditioned. Many are mental delinquents, argumentative, uncooperative, cantankerous, cynical, and sour on life. They are sick psychologically. Many people have deformed and distorted minds, probably warped during childhood. Many have congenial deformities. You would not condemn a person who had tuberculosis, nor should you condemn a person who is mentally ill. No one, for example, hates or resents a hunchback. There are many mental hunchbacks. You should have compassion and understanding. To understand all is to forgive all. Misery loves company. The hateful, frustrated, distorted, and twisted personality is out of tune with the infinite. He resents those who are peaceful, happy, and joyous. Usually, he criticizes, condemns, and vilifies those who have been very good and kind to him. 
His attitude is this. Why should they be so happy when he is so miserable? He wants to drag them down to his own level. Misery loves company. When you understand this, you remain unmoved, calm, and dispassionate. The Practice of Empathy in Human Relations A girl visited me recently stating that she hated another girl in her office. She gave as a reason that the other girl was prettier, happier, and wealthier than she, and in addition was engaged to the boss of the company where they worked. One day after the marriage had taken place, the crippled daughter, by a former marriage of the woman whom she hated, came into the office. The child put her arms around her mother and said, Mommy, Mommy, I love my new daddy. Look what he gave me. She showed her mother a wonderful new toy. She said to me, My heart went out to that little girl and I knew how happy she must feel. I got a vision of how happy this woman was. All of a sudden I felt love for her and I went into the office and wished her all the happiness in the world and I meant it. In psychological circles today, this is called empathy which simply means the imaginative projection of your mental attitude into that of another. She projected her mental mood or the feeling of her heart into that of the older woman and began to think and look out through the other woman's brain. She was actually thinking and feeling as the other woman and also as the child because she likewise had projected herself into the mind of the child. She was looking out from the vantage point of the child's mother. If tempted to injure or think ill of another, project yourself mentally into the mind of Moses and think from the standpoint of the Ten Commandments. Appeasement never wins. Do not permit people to take advantage of you or gain their point by temper tantrums, crying jags, or so-called heart attacks. These people are dictators who try to enslave you and make you do their bidding. Be firm but kind and refuse to yield. Appeasement never wins. Refuse to contribute to their delinquency, selfishness, and possessiveness. Remember, do that which is right. You are here to fulfill your ideal and remain true to the eternal virilities and spiritual values of life, which are eternal. Give no one in all the world the power to deflect you from your goal, your aim in life, which is to express your hidden talents to the world to serve humanity and to reveal more and more of God's wisdom, truth, and beauty to all people in the world. Remain true to your ideal. Know definitely and absolutely that whatever contributes to your peace, happiness, and fulfillment must of necessity bless all men who walk the earth. The harmony of the part is the harmony of the whole, for the whole is in the part, and the part is in the whole. All you owe the other, as Paul says, is love, and love is the fulfilling of the law of health, happiness, and peace of mind. Chapter 17. How to Use Your Subconscious Mind for Forgiveness Life plays no favorites. God is life, and this life principle is flowing through you this moment. God loves to express himself as harmony, peace, beauty, joy, and abundance through you. This is called the will of God or the tendency of life. If you set up resistance in your mind to the flow of life through you, this emotional congestion will get snarled up in your subconscious mind and cause all kinds of negative conditions. God has nothing to do with unhappy or chaotic conditions in the world. Man's negative and destructive thinking brings about all these conditions. Therefore, it is silly to blame God for your trouble or sickness. Many persons habitually set up mental resistance to the flow of life by accusing and reproaching God for the sin, sickness, and suffering of mankind. Others cast the blame on God for their pains, aches, and loss of loved ones, personal tragedies, and accidents. They are angry at God, and they believe He is responsible for their misery. As long as people entertain such negative concepts about God, they will experience the automatic negative reactions from their subconscious minds. Actually, such people do not know that they are punishing themselves. They must see the truth, find release, and give up all condemnation, resentment, and anger against anyone or any power outside themselves. Otherwise, they cannot go forward into a healthy, happy, or creative activity. 
The minute these people entertain a God of love in their minds and hearts, and when they believe that God is their loving Father who watches over them, cares for them, guides them, sustains and strengthens them, this concept and belief about God or the life principle will be accepted by their subconscious mind and they will find themselves blessed in countless ways. Life always forgives you. Life forgives you when you cut your finger. The subconscious intelligence within you sets about immediately to repair it. New cells build bridges over the cut. Should you take some tainted food by error, life forgives you and causes you to regurgitate it in order to preserve you. If you burn your hand, the life principle reduces the edema and congestion and gives you new skin, tissue and cells. Life holds no grudges against you and it is always forgiving you. Life brings you back to health, vitality, harmony, and peace if you cooperate by thinking in harmony with nature. Negative, hurtful memories, bitterness, and ill will clutter up and impede the free flow of the life principle in you. How he banished that feeling of guilt. I knew a man who worked every night until about 1 o'clock in the morning. He paid no attention to his two boys or his wife. He was always too busy working hard. He thought people should pat him on the back because he was working arduously and persistently past midnight every night. He had a blood pressure of over 200 and was full of guilt. Unconsciously, he proceeded to punish himself by hard work and he completely ignored his children. A normal man does not do that. He is interested in his boys and in their development. He does not shut his wife out of his world. I explained to him why he was working so arduously. There is something eating you inside, otherwise you would not act this way. You are punishing yourself and you have to learn to forgive yourself. He did have a deep sense of guilt. It was toward a brother. I explained to him that God was not punishing him, but that he was punishing himself. For example, if you misuse the laws of life, you will suffer accordingly. If you put your hand on a naked charged wire, you will get burned. The forces of nature are not evil. It is your use of them that determines whether they have a good or evil effect. Electricity is not evil. It depends on how you use it, whether to burn down a structure or light up a home. The only sin is ignorance of the law, and the only punishment is the automatic reaction of man's misuse of the law. If you misuse the principle of chemistry, you may blow up the office or the factory. If you strike your hand on a board, you may cause your hand to bleed. The board is not for that purpose. Its purpose may be to lean upon or to support your feet. This man realized that God does not condemn or punish anyone and that all his suffering was due to the reaction of his subconscious mind to his own negative and destructive thinking. He had cheated his brother at one time and the brother had now passed on. Still, he was full of remorse and guilt. I asked him, would you cheat your brother now? He said, no. Did you feel you were justified at the time? His reply was yes, but you would not do it now? He added, no, I am helping others to know how to live. I added the following comment, you have a greater reason and understanding now. Forgiveness is to forgive yourself. Forgiveness is getting your thoughts in line with the divine law of harmony. Self-condemnation is called hell, bondage and restriction. Forgiveness is called heaven, harmony and peace. The burden of guilt and self-condemnation was lifted from his mind, and he had a complete healing. The doctor tested his blood pressure, and it had become normal. The explanation was the cure. A murderer learned to forgive himself. A man who murdered his brother in Europe visited me many years ago. He was suffering from great mental anguish and torture, believing that God must punish him. He explained that his brother had been having an affair with his wife, and that he had shot him on the spur of the moment. This had happened about 15 years previous to his interview with me. In the meantime, this man had married an American girl and had been blessed with three lovely children. He was in a position where he helped many people and he was a transformed man. My explanation to him was that physically and psychologically he was not the same man who shot his brother since scientists inform us that every cell of our bodies change every 11 months. Moreover, mentally and spiritually, he was a new man. He was now full of love and goodwill for humanity. The old man, who committed the crime 15 years before, was mentally and spiritually dead. 
Actually, he was condemning an innocent man. This explanation had a profound effect upon him, and he said it was as if a great weight had been lifted from his mind. He realized the significance of the following truth in the Bible. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins may be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 1.18 Criticism cannot hurt you without your consent. A school teacher told me that one of her associates criticized a speech she had given, saying to her that she spoke too fast. She swallowed some of her words. She couldn't be heard. Her diction was poor and her speech ineffective. This teacher was furious and full of resentment toward her critic. She admitted to me that the criticisms were just. Her first reaction was really childish, and she agreed that the letter was really a blessing and a marvelous corrective. She proceeded immediately to supplement her deficiencies in her speech by enrolling in a course in public speaking at City College. She wrote and thanked the writer of the note for her interest, expressing appreciation for her conclusions and findings, which enabled the teacher to correct the matter at once. How to be compassionate Suppose none of the things mentioned in the letter had been true of the teacher. The latter would have realized that her class material had upset the prejudices, superstitions, or narrow secretarian beliefs of the writer of the note, and that a psychologically ill person was simply pouring forth her resentment because a psychological boil had been heard. To understand this fact is to be compassionate. The next logical step would be to pray for the other person's peace, harmony, and understanding. You cannot be hurt when you know that you are master of your thoughts, reactions, and emotions. Emotions follow thoughts, and you have the power to reject all thoughts which may disturb or upset you. Left at the Altar Some years ago, I visited a church to perform a marriage ceremony. The young man did not appear, and at the end of two hours, the bride-to-be shed a few tears, and then said to me, I prayed for divine guidance. This might be the answer, for he never faileth. That was her reaction, faith in God and all things good. She had no bitterness in her heart because, as she said, it must not have been right action because my prayer was for right action for both of us. Someone else having a similar experience would have gone into a tantrum, have had an emotional fit, required sedation, and perhaps needed hospitalization. Tune in with the infinite intelligence within your subconscious depths, trusting the answer in the same way that you trusted your mother when she held you in her arms. This is how you can acquire poise and mental and emotional health. It is wrong to marry. Sex is evil, and I am evil. Some time ago, I talked to a young lady aged 22. She was taught that it was a sin to dance, to play cards, to swim, and to go out with men. She was threatened by her mother who told her she would burn eternally in hellfire if she disobeyed her will and her religious teachings. This girl wore a black dress and black stockings. She wore no rouge, lipstick, or any form of makeup because her mother said that these things were sinful. Her mother told her that all men were evil and that sex was of the devil and simply diabolic debauchery. This girl had to learn how to forgive herself as she was full of guilt. To forgive means to give for. She had to give up all these false beliefs for the truths of life and a new estimate of herself. When she went out with young men in the office where she worked, she had a deep sense of guilt and thought that God would punish her. Several eligible young men proposed to her, but she said to me, It is wrong to marry. Sex is evil and I am evil. This was her conscious or early conditioning speaking. She came to me once weekly for about 10 weeks and I taught her the workings of the conscious and subconscious mind as set forth in this book. This young girl gradually came to see that she had been completely brainwashed, mesmerized and conditioned by an ignorant, superstitious, bigoted and frustrated mother. She broke away completely from her family and started to live a wonderful life. At my suggestion, she dressed up and had her hair attended to. She took lessons in dancing from a man, and she also took driving lessons. She learned to swim, play cards, and had a number of dates. She began to love he.
She prayed for a divine companion by claiming that infinite spirit would attract to her a man who harmonized with her thoroughly. Eventually, this came to pass. As she left my office one evening, there was a man waiting to see me, and I casually introduced them. They are now married and harmonize with each other perfectly. Forgiveness is necessary for healing. Forgiveness of others is essential to mental peace and radiant health. You must forgive everyone who has ever hurt you if you want perfect health and happiness. Forgive yourself by getting your thoughts in harmony with divine law and order. You cannot really forgive yourself completely until you have forgiven others first. To refuse to forgive yourself is nothing more or less than spiritual pride or ignorance. In the psychosomatic field of medicine today, it is being constantly stressed that resentment, condemnation of others, remorse, and hostility are behind a host of maladies ranging from arthritis to cardiac disease. They point out that these sick people who were hurt, mistreated, deceived, or injured were full of resentment and hatred for those who hurt them. This caused inflamed and festering wounds in their subconscious minds. There is only one remedy. They have to cut out and discard their hurts, and the one and only sure way is by forgiveness. Forgiveness is love in action. The essential ingredient in the art of forgiveness is the willingness to forgive. If you sincerely desire to forgive the other, you are 51% over the hurdle. I feel sure you know that to forgive the other does not necessarily mean that you like him or want to associate with him. You cannot be compelled to like someone, neither can a government legislate goodwill, love, peace, or tolerance. It is quite impossible to like people because someone in Washington issues a verdict to that effect. We can, however, love people without liking them. The Bible says, Love ye one another. This anyone can do who really wants to do it. Love means that you wish for the other health, happiness, peace, joy, and all the blessings of life. There is only one prerequisite, and that is sincerity. You are not being magnanimous when you forgive. You are really being selfish, because what you wish for the other, you are actually wishing for yourself. The reason is that you are thinking it and you are feeling it. As you think and feel, so are you. Could anything be simpler than that? Technique of Forgiveness The following is a simple method which works wonders in your life as you practice it. Quiet your mind, relax, and let go. Think of God and His love for you, and then affirm, I fully and freely forgive. Mention the name of the offender. I release him mentally and spiritually. I completely forgive everything connected with the matter in question. I am free, and he or she is free. It is a marvelous feeling. It is my day of general amnesty. I release anybody and everybody who has ever hurt me, and I wish for each and every one health, happiness, peace, and all the blessings of life. I do this freely, joyously, and lovingly, and whenever I think of the person or persons who hurt me, I say, I have released you and all the blessings of life are yours. I am free and you are free. It is wonderful. The great secret of true forgiveness is that once you have forgiven the person, it is unnecessary to repeat the prayer. Whenever the person comes to your mind or the particular hurt happens to enter your mind, wish the delinquent well and say, Peace be to you. Do this as often as the thought enters your mind. You will find that after a few days the thought of the person or experience will return less and less often until it fades into nothingness. The Acid Test for Forgiveness There is an acid test for gold. There is also an acid test for forgiveness. If I should tell you something wonderful about someone who has wronged you, cheated you, or defrauded you, and you sizzled at hearing the good news about this person, the roots of hatred would still be in your subconscious mind, playing havoc with you. Let us suppose you had a painful abscess on your jaw a year ago, and you told me about it. I would casually ask you if you had any pain now. You would automatically say, of course not. I have a memory of it, but no pain. That is the whole story. You may have a memory of the incident, but no string or hurt anymore. This is the acid test, and you must meet it psychologically and spiritually. 
Otherwise, you are simply deceiving yourself and not practicing the true art of forgiveness. To understand all is to forgive all. When man understands the creative law of his own mind, he ceases to blame other people and conditions for making or marring his life. He knows that his own thoughts and feelings create his destiny. Furthermore, he is aware that externals are not the causes and conditioners of his life and his experiences. To think that others can mar your happiness, that you are a football of a cruel fate, that you must oppose and fight others for a living, all these and other things like them are untenable when you understand that thoughts are things. The Bible says the same thing, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23.7 Chapter 18 How Your Subconscious Removes Mental Blocks The solution lies within the problem. The answer is in every question. If you are presented with a difficult situation and you cannot see your way clear, the best procedure is to assume that infinite intelligence within your subconscious mind knows all and sees all, has the answer, and is revealing it to you now. Your new mental attitude that the creative intelligence is bringing about a happy solution will enable you to find the answer. Rest assured that such an attitude of mind would bring order, peace, and meaning to all your undertakings. How to break or build a habit. You are a creature of habit. Habit is the function of your subconscious mind. You learn to swim, ride a bicycle, dance, and drive a car by consciously doing these things over and over again until they establish tracks in your subconscious mind. Then the automatic habit action of your subconscious mind took over. This is sometimes called second nature, which is a reaction of your subconscious mind to your thinking and acting. You are free to choose a good habit or a bad habit. If you repeat a negative thought or act over a period of time, you will be under the compulsion of a habit. The law of your subconscious is compulsion. How he broke a bad habit. Mr. Jones said to me, an uncontrollable urge to drink seizes me and I remain drunk for two weeks at a time. I can't give up this terrible habit. Time and time again, these experiences had occurred to this unfortunate man. He had grown into the habit of drinking to excess. Although he had started drinking on his own initiative, he also began to realize that he could change the habit and establish a new one. He said that while through his willpower he was able to suppress his desires temporarily, his continued efforts to suppress the many urges only made matters worse. His repeated failures convinced him that he was hopeless and powerless to control his urge or obsession. This idea of being powerless operated as a powerful suggestion to his subconscious mind and aggravated his weakness, making his life a succession of failures. I taught him to harmonize the functions of the conscious and subconscious mind. When these two cooperate, the idea or desire implanted in the subconscious mind is realized. His reasoning mind agreed that if the old habit path or track had carried him into trouble, he could consciously form a new path to freedom, sobriety, and peace of mind. He knew that his destructive habit was automatic, but since it was acquired through his conscious choice, he realized that if he had been conditioned negatively, he also could be conditioned positively. As a result, he ceased thinking of the fact that he was powerless to overcome the habit. Moreover, he understood clearly that there was no obstacle to his healing other than his own thought. Therefore, there was no occasion for great mental effort or mental coercion. The Power of His Mental Picture This man acquired a practice of relaxing his body and getting into a relaxed, drowsy, meditative state. Then he filled his mind with the picture of the desired end, knowing his subconscious mind could bring it about the easiest way. He imagined his daughter congratulating him on his freedom and saying to him, Daddy, it's wonderful to have you home. He had lost his family through drink. He was not allowed to visit them and his wife would not speak to him. Regularly, systematically, he used to sit down and meditate in the way outlined. When his attention wandered, he made it a habit to immediately recall the mental picture of his daughter with her smile and the scene of his home enlivened by her cheerful voice. All this brought about a reconditioning of his mind. It was a gradual process. He kept it up. 
He persevered, knowing that sooner or later he would establish a new habit pattern in his subconscious mind. I told him that he could liken his conscious mind to a camera, that his subconscious mind was the sensitive plate on which he registered and impressed the picture. This made a profound impression on him and his whole aim was to firmly impress the picture on his mind and develop it there. Films are developed in the dark. Likewise, mental pictures are developed in the dark room of the subconscious mind. Focused Attention Realizing that his conscious mind was simply a camera, he used no effort. There was no mental struggle. He quietly adjusted his thoughts and focused his attention on the scene before him until he gradually became identified with the picture. He became absorbed in the mental atmosphere, repeating the mental movie frequently. There was no room for doubt that a healing would follow. When there was any temptation to drink, he would switch his imagination from any reveries of drinking bouts to the feeling of being at home with his family. He was successful because he confidently expected to experience the picture he was developing in his mind. Today, he is president of a multi-million dollar concern and is radiantly happy. He said a jinx was following him. Mr. Block said that he had been making an annual income of $20,000, but for the past three months, all doors seemed to jam tightly. He brought up clients to the point where they were about to sign on the dotted line, and then at the 11th hour, the door closed. He added that perhaps a jinx was following him. In discussing the matter with Mr. Block, I discovered that three months previously, he had become very irritated, annoyed, and resentful toward a dentist who, after he had promised to sign a contract, had withdrawn at the last moment. He began to live in the unconscious fear that other clients would do the same, thereby setting up a history of frustration, hostility, and obstacles. He gradually built up in his mind a belief of obstruction and last-minute cancellations until a vicious circle had been established. What I fear most has come upon me. Mr. Block realized that the trouble was in his mind and that it was essential to change his mental attitude. His run of so-called misfortune was broken in the following way. I realize I am one with the infinite intelligence of my subconscious mind, which knows no obstacle, difficulty, or delay. I live in the joyous expectancy of the best. My deeper mind responds to my thoughts. I know that the work of the infinite power of my subconscious cannot be hindered. Infinite intelligence always finishes successfully whatever it begins. Creative wisdom works through me bringing all my plans and purposes to completion. Whatever I start, I bring to a successful conclusion. My aim in life is to give wonderful service, and all those whom I contact are blessed by what I have to offer. All my work comes to full fruitation in divine order. He repeated this prayer every morning before going to call on his customers, and he also prayed each night prior to sleep. In a short time, he had established a new habit pattern in his subconscious mind, and he was back in his old accustomed stride as a successful salesman. How much do you want what you want? A young man asked Socrates how he could get wisdom. Socrates replied, come with me. He took the lad to a river, pushed the boy's head under the water, held it there until the boy was gasping for air, then relaxed and released his head. When the boy regained his composure, he asked him, what did you desire most when you were under water? I wanted air, said the boy. Socrates said to him, when you want wisdom as much as you wanted air when you were immersed in the water, you will receive it. Likewise, when you really have an intense desire to overcome any block in your life, and you come to a clear-cut decision that there is a way out, and that is the course you wish to follow, then victory and triumph are assured. If you really want peace of mind and inner calm, you will get it. Regardless of how unjustly you have been treated or how unfair the boss has been or what a mean scoundrel someone has proved to be, all this makes no difference to you when you awaken to your mental and spiritual powers. You know what you want and you will definitely refuse to let the thieves' thoughts of hatred, anger, hostility, and ill will rob you of peace, harmony, health, and happiness. You cease to become upset by people, conditions, news, and events by identifying your thoughts immediately with your aim in life. Your aim is peace, health, inspiration, harmony, and abundance. Feel a river of peace flowing through you now. Your thought is the immaterial and invisible power. 
and you choose to let it bless, inspire, and give you peace. Why he could not be healed. This is a case history of a married man with four children who was supporting and secretly living with another woman during his business trips. He was ill, nervous, irritable, and cantankerous, and he could not sleep without drugs. The doctor's medicine failed to bring down his high blood pressure of over 200. He had pains in numerous organs of his body, which doctors could not diagnose or relieve. To make matters worse, he was drinking heavily. The cause of all this was a deep, unconscious sense of guilt. He had violated the marriage vows, and this troubled him. The religious creed he was brought up on was deeply lodged in his subconscious mind, and he drank excessively to heal the wound of guilt. Some invalids take morphine and codeine for severe pains. He was taking alcohol for the pain or wound in his mind. It was the old story of adding fuel to the fire. The explanation and the cure. He listened to the explanation of how his mind worked. He faced his problem, looked at it, and gave up his dual role. He knew that his drinking was an unconscious attempt to escape. The hidden cause lodged in his subconscious mind had to be eradicated, then the healing would follow. He began to impress his subconscious mind three or four times a day by using the following prayer. My mind is full of peace, poise, balance, and equilibrium. The infinite lies stretched in smiling response within me. I am not afraid of anything in the past, the present, or the future. The infinite intelligence of my subconscious mind leads, guides, and directs me in all ways. I now meet every situation with faith, poise, calmness, and confidence. I am now completely free from the habit. My mind is full of inner peace, freedom, and joy. I forgive myself. Then I am forgiven. Peace, sobriety, and confidence reign supreme in my mind. He repeated this prayer frequently as outlined, being fully aware of what he was doing and why he was doing it. Knowing what he was doing gave him the necessary faith and confidence. I explained to him that as he spoke these statements out loud, slowly, lovingly, and meaningfully, they would gradually sink down into his subconscious mind. Like seeds, they would grow after their kind. These truths on which he concentrated went in through his eyes, his ears heard the sound, and the healing vibrations of these words reached his subconscious mind and obliterated all the negative mental patterns which caused all the trouble. Light dispels darkness. The constructive thought destroys the negative thought. He became a transformed man within a month. Refusing to admit it. If you are an alcoholic or a drug addict, admit it. Do not dodge the issue. Many people remain alcoholics because they refuse to admit it. Your disease is instability and inner fear. You are refusing to face life and so you try to escape your responsibilities through the bottle. As an alcoholic, you have no free will, although you think you have and you may even boast about your willpower. If you are a habitual drunkard and say bravely, I will not touch it anymore, you have no power to make this assertion come true because you do not know where to locate the power. You are living in a psychological prison of your own making, and you are bound by your beliefs, opinions, training, and environmental influences. Like most people, you are a creature of habit. You are conditioned to react the way you do. Building in the idea of freedom. You can build the idea of freedom and peace of mind into your mentality so that it reaches your subconscious depths. The latter, being all-powerful, will free you from all desire for alcohol. Then you will have the new understanding of how your mind works, and you can truly back up your statement and prove the truth to yourself. 51% Healed If you have a keen desire to free yourself from any destructive habit, you are 51% healed already. When you have a greater desire to give up the bad habit than to continue it, you will not experience too much difficulty in gaining complete freedom. Whatever thought you anchor the mind upon, the latter magnifies. If you engage the mind on the concept of freedom, freedom from that habit, and peace of mind, and if you keep it focused on this new direction of attention, you generate feelings and emotions, which gradually emotionalize the concept of freedom and peace. Whatever idea you emotionalize is accepted by your subconscious and brought to pass. Your subconscious removes mental blocks. The Law of Substitution 
Realize that something good can come out of your suffering. You have not suffered in vain. However, it is foolish to continue to suffer. If you continue as an alcoholic, it will bring about mental and physical deterioration and decay. Realize that the power in your subconscious is backing you up. Even though you may be seized by melancholy, you should begin to imagine the joy of freedom that is in store for you. This is the law of substitution. Your imagination took you to the bottle. Let it take you now to freedom and peace of mind. You will suffer a little bit, but it is for a constructive purpose. You will bear it like a mother in the pangs of childbirth, and you will, likewise, bring forth a child of the mind. Your subconscious will give birth to sobriety. Cause of Alcoholism The real cause of alcoholism is negative and destructive thinking, for as a man thinketh, so is he. The alcoholic has a deep sense of inferiority, inadequacy, defeat, and frustration, usually accompanied by a deep inner hostility. He has countless alibis as to his reason for drinking, but the sole reason is in his thought life. Three Magic Steps the first step, get still, quiet the wheels of the mind. Enter into a sleepy, drowsy state. In this relaxed, peaceful, receptive state, you are preparing for the second step. The second step, take a brief phrase which can readily be graven on the memory and repeat it over and over as a lullaby. Use the phrase, sobriety and peace of mind are mine now, and I give thanks. To prevent the mind from wandering, repeat it aloud or sketch its pronunciation with the lips and tongue as you say it mentally. This helps its entry into the subconscious mind. Do this for five minutes or more. You will find a deep emotional response. The third step, just before going to sleep, practice what Johann von Goethe, German author, used to do. Imagine a friend, a loved one in front of you. Your eyes are closed, you are relaxed and at peace. The loved one or friend is subjectively present and is saying to you, congratulations. You see the smile, you hear the voice, you mentally touch the hand. It is all real and vivid. The word congratulations imply complete freedom. Hear it over and over again until you get the subconscious reaction, which satisfies. Keep on keeping on. When fear knocks at the door of your mind, or when worry, anxiety, and doubt cross your mind, behold your vision, your goal. Think of the infinite power within your subconscious mind, which you can generate by your thinking and imagining, and this will give you confidence, power, and courage. Keep on, persevere, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. Chapter 19 How to Use Your Subconscious Mind to Remove Fear one of our students told me that he was invited to speak at a banquet. He said he was panic-stricken at the thought of speaking before a thousand people. He overcame his fear this way. For several nights he sat down in an armchair for about five minutes and said to himself slowly, quietly, and positively, I am going to master this fear. I am overcoming it now. I speak with poise and confidence. I am relaxed and at ease. He operated a definite law of mind and overcame his fear. The subconscious mind is amendable to suggestion and is controlled by suggestion. When you still your mind and relax, the thoughts of your conscious mind sink down into the subconscious through a process similar to osmosis, whereby fluids separated by a porous membrane intermingle. As these positive seeds or thoughts sink into the subconscious area, they grow after their kind and you become poised, serene, and calm. Man's Greatest Enemy It is said that fear is man's greatest enemy. Fear is behind failure, sickness, and poor human relations. Millions of people are afraid of the past, the future, old age, insanity, and death. Fear is a thought in your mind, and you are afraid of your own thoughts. A little boy can be paralyzed with fear when he is told there is a boogeyman under his bed that is going to take him away. When his father turns on the light and shows him there is no boogeyman, he is freed from fear. The fear in the mind of the boy was as real as if there really was a boogeyman there. He was healed of a false thought in his mind. The thing he feared did not exist. Likewise, most of your fears have no reality. They are merely a conglomeration of sinister shadows, and shadows have no reality. Do the things you fear. Ralph Waldo Emerson, philosopher and poet, said, 
Do the thing you are afraid to do, and the death of fear is certain. There was a time when the writer of this chapter was filled with unutterable fear when standing before an audience. The way I overcame it was to stand before the audience, do the thing I was afraid to do, and the death of fear was certain. When you affirm positively that you are going to master your fears and you come to a definite decision in your conscious mind, you release the power of the subconscious, which flows in response to the nature of your thought. Banishing Stage Fright A young lady was invited to an audition. She had been looking forward to the interview. However, on three previous occasions, she had failed miserably due to stage fright. She possessed a very good voice, but she was certain that when the time came for her to sing, she would be seized with stage fright. The subconscious mind takes your fears as a request, proceeds to manifest them, and brings them into your experience. On three previous auditions, she sang wrong notes, and she finally broke down and cried. The cause, as previously outlined, was an involuntary auto-suggestion. For example, a silent fear thought emotionalized and subjectified. She overcame it by the following technique. Three times a day, she isolated herself in a room. She sat down comfortably in an armchair, relaxed her body, and closed her eyes. She stilled her mind and body to the best of her ability. Physical inertia favors passivity and renders the mind more receptive to suggestion. She counteracted the fear suggestion by its converse, saying to herself, I sing beautifully. I am poised, serene, confident, and calm. She repeated the words slowly, quietly, and with feeling from five to ten times at each sitting. She had three such sittings every day and one immediately prior to sleep at night. At the end of a week, she was completely poised, confident, and gave a definitely outstanding audition. Carry out the above procedure, and the death of fear is certain. Fear of Failure Occasionally, young men from the local university come to see me, as well as school teachers, who often seem to suffer from suggestive amnesia at examinations. The complaint is always the same. I know the answers after the examination is over, but I can't remember the answers during the examination. The idea, which realizes itself, is the one to which we invariably give concentrated attention. I find that each one is obsessed with the idea of failure. Fear is behind the temporary amnesia, and it is the cause of the whole experience. One young medical student was the most brilliant person in his class, yet he found himself failing to answer simple questions at the time of written or oral examinations. I explained to him that the reason was he had been worrying and fearful for several days previous to the examination. These negative thoughts became charged with fear. Thoughts enveloped in the powerful emotion of fear are realized in the subconscious mind. In other words, this young man was requesting his subconscious mind to see to it that he failed, and that is exactly what it did. On the day of the examination, he found himself stricken with what is called, in psychological circles, suggestive amnesia. How he overcame the fear. He learned that his subconscious mind was the storehouse of memory and that it had a perfect record of all he had heard and read during his medical training. Moreover, he learned that the subconscious mind was responsive and reciprocal. The way to be in rapport with it was to be relaxed, peaceful, and confident. Every night and morning, he began to imagine his mother congratulating him on his wonderful record. He would hold an imaginary letter from her in his hand. As he began to contemplate the happy result, he called forth a corresponding or reciprocal response or reaction in himself. The all-wise, omnipotent power of the subconscious took over, dictated, and directed his conscious mind accordingly. He imagined the end, thereby willing the means to the realization of the end. Following this procedure, he had no trouble passing subsequent examinations. In other words, the subjective wisdom took over compelling him to give an excellent account of himself. Fear of water, mountains, closed spaces, etc. There are many people who are afraid to go into an elevator, climb mountains, or even swim in the water. It may well be that the individual had unpleasant experiences in the water in his youth, such as having been thrown forcibly into the water without being able to swim. He might have been forcibly detained in an elevator, which failed to function properly, causing resultant fear of closed spaces. I had an experience when I was about 10 years of age. I accidentally fell into a pool and went down three times. 
I can still remember the dark water engulfing my head and my gasping for air until another boy pulled me out at the last moment. This experience sank into my subconscious mind and for years I feared the water. An elderly psychologist said to me, go down to the swimming pool, look at the water and say out loud in strong tones, I am going to master you. I can dominate you. Then go into the water, take lessons and overcome it. This I did and I mastered the water. Do not permit water to master you. Remember, you are the master of the water. When I assumed a new attitude of mind, the omnipotent power of the subconscious responded, giving me strength, faith, and confidence, and enabling me to overcome my fear. Master Technique for Overcoming Any Particular Fear The following is a process and technique for overcoming fear, which I teach from the platform. It works like a charm. Try it. Suppose you are afraid of the water, a mountain, an interview, an audition, or you fear closed spaces. If you are afraid of swimming, begin now to sit still for five or ten minutes, three or four times a day, and imagine you are swimming. Actually, you are swimming in your mind. It is a subjective experience. Mentally, you have projected yourself into the water. You feel the chill of the water and the movement of your arms and legs. It is all real, vivid, and a joyous activity of the mind. It is not idle daydreaming. For you know that what you are experiencing in your imagination will be developed in your subconscious mind. Then you will be compelled to express the image and likeness of the picture you impressed on your deeper mind. This is the law of the subconscious. You could apply the same technique if you are afraid of mountains or high places. Imagine you are climbing the mountain. Feel the reality of it all. Enjoy the scenery knowing that as you continue to do this mentally, you will do it physically with ease and comfort. He blessed the elevator. I knew an executive of a large corporation who was terrified to ride in an elevator. He would walk up five flights of stairs to his office every morning. He said that he began to bless the elevator every night and several times a day. He finally overcame his fear. This is how he blessed the elevator. The elevator in our building is a wonderful idea. It came out of the universal mind. It is a boon and a blessing to all our employees. It gives wonderful service. It operates in divine order. I ride it in peace and joy. I remain silent now while the currents of life, love, and understanding flow through the patterns of my thought. In my imagination, I am now in the elevator, and I step out into my office. The elevator is full of our employees. I talk to them, and they are friendly, joyous, and free. It is a wonderful experience of freedom, faith, and confidence. I give thanks. He continued this prayer for about 10 days, and on the 11th day, he walked into the elevator with other members of the organization and felt completely free. Normal and Abnormal Fear Man is born only with two fears the fear of falling, and the fear of noise. These are an alarm system given you by nature as a means of self-preservation. Normal fear is good. You hear an automobile coming down the road and you step aside to survive. The momentary fear of being run over is overcome by your action. All other fears were given to you by parents, relatives, teachers, and all those who influenced your early years. Abnormal Fear Abnormal fear takes place when man lets his imagination run riot. I knew a woman who was invited to go on a trip around the world by plane. She began to cut out of the newspapers all reports of airplane catastrophes. She pictured herself going down in the ocean, being drowned, etc. This is abnormal fear. Had she persisted in this, she would undoubtedly have attracted what she feared most. Another example of abnormal fear is that of a businessman in New York who was very prosperous and successful. He had his own private mental motion picture, of which he was the director. He would run this mental movie of failure, bankruptcy, empty shelves, and no bank balance until he sank into a deep depression. He refused to stop this morbid imagery and kept reminding his wife that this can't last. There will be a recession. I feel sure we will go bankrupt, etc. His wife told me that he finally did go into bankruptcy and all the things he imagined and feared came to pass. The things he feared did not exist, but he brought them to pass by constantly fearing, believing, and expecting financial disaster. 
Job said, The thing I feared has come upon me. There are people who are afraid that something terrible will happen to their children and that some dread catastrophe will befail them. When they read about an epidemic or a rare disease, they live in fear that they will catch it, and some imagine they have the disease already. All this is abnormal fear. The answer to abnormal fear. Move mentally to the opposite. To stay at the extreme of fear is stagnation plus mental and physical deterioration. When fear arises, there immediately comes with it a desire for something opposite to the thing feared. Place your attention on the thing immediately desired. Get absorbed and engrossed in your desire, knowing that the subjective always overturns the objective. This attitude will give you confidence and lift your spirits. The infinite power of your subconscious mind is moving on your behalf, and it cannot fail. Therefore, peace and assurance are yours. Examine your fears. The president of a large organization told me that when he was a salesman, he used to walk around the block five or six times before he called on a customer. The sales manager came along one day and said to him, Don't be afraid of the boogeyman behind the door. There is no boogeyman. It is a false belief. The manager told him that whenever he looked at his own fears, he stared them in the face and stood up to them, looking them straight in the eye. Then they faded and shrank into insignificance. He landed in the jungle. A chaplain told me of his experiences in the Second World War. He had to parachute from a damaged plane and land in the jungle. He said he was frightened, but he knew there were two kinds of fear, normal and abnormal, which we have previously pointed out. He decided to do something about the fear immediately and began to talk to himself, saying, John, you can't surrender to your fear. Your fear is a desire for safety and security and a way out. He began to claim infinite intelligence which guides the planets in their courses is now leading and guiding me out of this jungle. He kept saying this out loud to himself for ten minutes or more. Then, he added, something began to stir inside me. A mood of confidence began to seize me and I began to walk. After a few days, I miraculously came out of the jungle and was picked up by a rescue plane. His changed mental attitude saved him. His confidence and trust in the subjective wisdom and power within him was the solution to his problem. He said, Had I begun to bemoan my fate and indulge my fears, I would have succumbed to the monster fear and probably would have died of fear and starvation. He dismissed himself. The general manager of an organization told me that for three years he feared he would lose his position. He was always imagining failure. The thing he feared did not exist save as a morbid anxiety thought in his own mind. His vivid imagination dramatized the loss of his job until he became nervous and neurotic. Finally, he was asked to resign. Actually, he dismissed himself. His constant negative imagery and fear suggestions to his subconscious mind caused the latter to respond and react accordingly. It caused him to make mistakes and foolish decisions, which resulted in his failure as a general manager. His dismissal would never have happened if he had immediately moved to the opposite in his mind. They plotted against him. During a recent world lecture tour, I had a two-hour conversation with a prominent government official. He had a deep sense of inner peace and serenity. He said that all the abuse he receives politically from newspapers and the opposition party never disturb him. His practice is to sit still for 15 minutes in the morning and realize that in the center of him is a deep, still ocean of peace. Meditating in this way, he generates tremendous power, which overcomes all manner of difficulties and fears. Sometime previously, a colleague called him at midnight and told him a group of people were plotting against him. This is what he said to his colleague, I am going to sleep now in perfect peace. You can discuss it with me at 10 a.m. tomorrow. He said to me, I know that no negative thought can ever manifest except I emotionalize the thought and accept it mentally. I refuse to entertain their suggestion of fear. Therefore, no harm can come to me. Notice how calm he was, how cool, how peaceful. He did not start getting excited, tearing his hair, or wringing his hands. At his center, he found the still water, an inner peace, and there was a great calm. Deliver yourself from all your fears. Use this perfect formula for casting out fear. I sought the Lord, and He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 34, 4. 
The Lord is an ancient word meaning law, the power of your subconscious mind. Learn the wonders of your subconscious and how it works and functions. Master the techniques given to you in this chapter. Put them into practice now, today. Your subconscious will respond and you will be free of all fears. I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Chapter 20 How to Stay Young in Spirit Forever Your subconscious mind never grows old. It is timeless, ageless, and endless. It is a part of the universal mind of God, which was never born, and it will never die. Fatigue or old age cannot be predicted on any spiritual quality or power. Patience, kindness, vericity, humility, goodwill, peace, harmony, and brotherly love are attributes and qualities which never grow old. If you continue to generate these qualities here on this plane of life, you will always remain young in spirit. I remember reading an article in one of our magazines some years ago which stated that a group of eminent medical men at the DeCourcy Clinic in Cincinnati, Ohio reported that years alone are not responsible for bringing about degenerative disorders. These same physicians stated that it is the fear of time, not time itself, that has a harmful aging effect on our minds and bodies, and that the neurotic fear of the effects of time may well be the cause of premature aging. During the many years of my public life, I have had occasion to study the biographies of the famous men and women who have continued their productive activities into the years well beyond the normal span of life. Some of them achieve their greatest in old age. At the same time, it has been my privilege to meet and to know countless individuals of no prominence who, in their lesser sphere, belong to those hardy mortals who have proved that old age of itself does not destroy the creative powers of the mind and body. He had grown old in his thought life. A few years ago, I called on an old friend in London, England. He was over 80 years of age, very ill, and obviously was yielding to his advancing years. Our conversation revealed his physical weakness, his sense of frustration, and a general deterioration almost approaching lifelessness. His cry was that he was useless and that no one wanted him. With an expression of hopelessness, he bestrayed his false philosophy. We are born, grow up, become old, good for nothing, and that's the end. This mental attitude of futility and worthlessness was the chief reason for his sickness. He was looking forward only to senescence, and after that, nothing. Indeed, he had grown old in his thought life, and his subconscious mind brought about all the evidence of his habitual thinking. Age is the dawn of wisdom. Unfortunately, many people have the same attitude as this unhappy man. They are afraid of what they term old age, the end, and extinction, which really means that they are afraid of life. Yet life is endless. Age is not the flight of years, but the dawn of wisdom. Wisdom is an awareness of the tremendous spiritual powers in your subconscious mind and the knowledge of how to apply these powers to lead a full and happy life. Get it out of your head once and for all that 65, 75, or 85 years of age is synonymous with the end for you or anybody else. It can be the beginning of a glorious, fruitful, active, and most productive life pattern, better than you have ever experienced. Believe this, expect it, and your subconscious will bring it to pass. Welcome the change. Old age is not a tragic occurrence. What we call the aging process is really change. It is to be welcomed joyfully and gladly as each phase of human life is a step forward on the path, which has no end. Man has powers which transcend his bodily powers. He has senses which transcend his five physical senses. Scientists today are finding positive, indisputable evidence that something conscious in man can leave his present body and travel thousands of miles to see, hear, touch, and speak to people even though his physical body never leaves the couch on which it reclines. Man's life is spiritual and eternal. He need never grow old, for life or God cannot grow old. The Bible says that God is life. Life is self-renewing, eternal, indestructible, and is the reality of all men. Evidence for Survival 
The evidence gathered by the Psychical Research Societies, both in Great Britain and America, is overwhelming. You may go into any large metropolitan library and get volumes on the proceedings of the Psychical Research Society based on findings of distinguished scientists on survival following so-called death. You will find a startling report on scientific experiments establishing the reality of life after death in the case for psychic survival by Hereward Carnington, director of the American Psychical Institute. Life is. A woman asked Thomas Edison, the electrical wizard, Mr. Edison, what is electricity? He replied, Madame, electricity is, use it. Electricity is a name we give an invisible power which we do not fully comprehend, but we learn all we can about the principle of electricity and its uses. We use it in countless ways. The scientist cannot see an electron with his eyes, yet he accepts it as a scientific fact because it is the only valid conclusion which coincides with his other experimental evidence. We cannot see life, however, we know we are alive. Life is, and we are here to express it in all its beauty and glory. Mind and spirit do not grow old. The man who thinks or believes that the earthly cycle of birth, adolescence, youth, maturity, and old age is all there is to life is indeed to be pitied. Such a man has no anchor, no hope, no vision, and to him life has no meaning. This type of belief brings frustration, stagnation, cynicism, and a sense of hopelessness resulting in neurosis and mental aberrations of all kinds. If you cannot play a fast game of tennis or swim as fast as your son, or if your body has slowed down or you walk with a slow step, remember life is always clothing itself anew. What men call death is but a journey to a new city in another dimension of life. I say to men and women in my lectures that they should accept what we call old age gracefully. Age has its own glory, beauty, and wisdom, which belong to it. Peace, love, joy, beauty, happiness, wisdom, goodwill, and understanding are qualities which never grow old or die. Ralph Waldo Emerson, poet and philosopher, said, We do not count a man's years until he has nothing else to count. Your character, the quality of your mind, your faith, and your convictions are not subject to decay. You are as young as you think you are. I gave public lectures in Caxton Hall, London, England every few years, and following one of these lectures, a surgeon said to me, I am 84 years of age. I operate every morning, visit patients in the afternoons, and I write for medical and other scientific journals in the evening. His attitude was that he was as useful as he believed himself to be, and that he was as young as his thoughts. He said to me, it's true what you said, man is as strong as he thinks he is, and as valuable as he thinks he is. This surgeon had not surrendered to advancing years. He knows that he is immortal. His final comment to me was, if I should pass on tomorrow, I would be operating on people in the next dimension, not with a surgeon's scalpel, but with mental and spiritual surgery. Your gray hairs are an asset. Don't ever quit a job and say, I am retired, I am old, I am finished. That would be stagnation, death, and you would be finished. Some men are old at 30, while others are young at 80. The mind is the master weaver, the architect, the designer, and the sculptor. George Bernard Shaw was active at 90, and the artistic quality of his mind had not relaxed from active duty. I meet men and women who tell me that some employers almost slam the door in their faces when they say they are over 40. This attitude on the part of employers is to be considered cold, callous, evil, and completely void of compassion and understanding. The total emphasis seemed to be on youth. For example, you must be under 35 years of age to receive consideration. The reasoning behind this is certainly very shallow. If the employer would stop and think, he would realize that the man or woman was not selling his age or gray hair. Rather, he was willing to give of his talents, his experience, and his wisdom gathered through the years of experience in the marketplace of life. Age is an asset. Your age should be a distinct asset to any organization. Because of your practice and application through the years of the principles of the golden rule and the law of love and goodwill, your gray hair, if you have any, should stand for greater wisdom, skill, and understanding. Your emotional and spiritual maturity should be a tremendous blessing to any organization. 
A man should not be asked to resign when he is 65 years of age. That is the time of life when he could be most useful in handling personnel problems, making plans for the future, making decisions, and guiding others in the realm of creative ideas based on his experience and insight into the nature of the business. Be your age. A motion picture writer in Hollywood told me that he had to write scripts which would cater to the 12 year old mind. This is a tragic state of affairs if the great masses of people are expected to become emotionally and spiritually mature. It means that the emphasis is placed on youth in spite of the fact that youth stands for inexperience, lack of discernment and hasty judgment. I can keep up with the best of them. I am now thinking of a man 65 years of age who is trying frantically to keep young. He swims with young men every Sunday, goes on long hikes, plays tennis, and boasts about his prowess and physical powers, saying, look, I can keep up with the best of them. He should remember the great truth. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23.7 Diets, exercises, and games of all kinds will not keep this man young. It is necessary for him to observe that he grows old or remains young in accordance with his processes of thinking. Your subconscious mind is conditioned by your thoughts. If your thoughts are constantly on the beautiful, the noble, and the good, you will remain young regardless of the chronological years. Fear of old age. Job said, The thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. There are many people who fear old age and are uncertain about the future because they anticipate mental and physical deterioration as the years advance. What they think and feel comes to pass. You grow old when you lose interest in life, when you cease to dream, to hunger after new truths, and to search for new worlds to conquer. When your mind is open to new ideas, new interests, and when you raise the curtain and let in the sunshine and inspiration of new truths of life and the universe, you will be young and vital. You have much to give. If you are 65 or 95 years of age, realize you have much to give. You can help stabilize, advise, and direct the younger generation. You can give the benefit of your knowledge, your experience, and your wisdom. You can always look ahead, for at all times you are gazing into infinite life. You will find that you can never cease to unveil the glories and wonders of life. Try to learn something new every moment of the day, and you will find your mind will always be young. 110 years old. Some years ago, while lecturing in Bombay, India, I was introduced to a man who said he was 110 years old. He had the most beautiful face I have ever seen. He seemed transfigured by the radiance of an inner light. There was a rare beauty in his eyes indicating he had grown old in years with gladness and with no indication that his mind had dimmed its lights. Retirement, a new venture. Be sure that your mind never retires. It must be like a parachute, which is no good unless it opens up. Be open and receptive to new ideas. I have seen men of 65 and 70 retire. They seem to rot away and in a few months passed on. They obviously felt that life was at an end. Retirement can be a new venture, a new challenge, a new path, the beginning of the fulfillment of a long dream. It is inexpressibly depressing to hear a man say, what shall I do now that I am retired? He is saying, in effect, I am mentally and physically dead. My mind is bankrupt of ideas. All this is a false picture. The real truth is that you can accomplish more at 90 than you did at 60, because each day you are growing in wisdom and understanding of life and the universe through your new studies and interest. He graduated to a better job. An executive who lives near me was forced to retire a few months ago because he had reached the age of 65. He said to me, I look upon my retirement as promotion from kindergarten to the first grade. He philosophized in this manner. He said that when he left high school, he went up the ladder by going to college. He realized this was a step forward in his education and understanding of life in general. Likewise, he added, now he could do the things he had always wanted to do, and therefore his retirement was still another step forward on the ladder of life and wisdom. He came to the wise conclusion that he was no longer going to concentrate on making a living. Now he was going to give all his attention to living life. He is an amateur photographer, and he took additional courses on the subject. 
He took a trip around the world and took movies of famous places. He now lectures before various groups, lodges, and clubs and is in popular demand. There are countless ways of taking an interest in something worthwhile outside yourself. Become enthusiastic over new creative ideas, make spiritual progress, and continue to learn and to grow. In this manner, you remain young in heart because you are hungering and thirsting after new truths, and your body will reflect your thinking at all times. You must be a producer and not a prisoner of society. The newspapers are taking cognizance of the fact that the voting population of the elderly in California elections is increasing by leaps and bounds. This means that their voices will be heard in the legislature of the state and also in the halls of Congress. I believe there will be enacted a federal law prohibiting employers from discrimination against men and women because of age. A man of 65 years may be younger mentally, physically, and psychologically than many men at 30. It is stupid and ridiculous to tell a man he cannot be hired because he is over 40. It is like saying to him that he is ready for the scrap heap or the junk pile. What is a man of 40 or over to do? Must he bury his talents and hide his light under a bushel? Men who are deprived and prevented from working because of age must be sustained by government treasuries at county, state, and federal levels. The many organizations who refuse to hire them and benefit from their wisdom and experience will be taxed to support them. This is a form of financial suicide. Man is here to enjoy the fruit of his labor, and he is here to be a producer and not a prisoner of society, which compels him to idleness. Man's body slows down gradually as he advances through the years, but his conscious mind can be made much more active, alert, alive, and quickened by the inspiration from his subconscious mind. His mind, in reality, never grows old. Job said, Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me, when his candle shined upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle. Job 29, verses 2 through 4. Secret of Youth To recapture the days of your youth, feel the miraculous, healing, self-renewing power of your subconscious mind moving through your whole being. Know and feel that you are inspired, lifted up, rejuvenated, revitalized, and recharged spiritually. You can bubble over with enthusiasm and joy, as in the days of your youth, for the simple reason that you can always mentally and emotionally recapture the joyous state. The candle which shines upon your head is divine intelligence and reveals to you everything you need to know. It enables you to affirm the presence of your good, regardless of appearances. You walk by the guidance of your subconscious mind because you know that the dawn appears and the shadows flee away. Get a vision. Instead of saying, I am old, say, I am wise in the way of the divine life. Don't let the corporation, newspapers, or statistics hold a picture before you of old age, declining years, decrepitude, senility, and uselessness. Reject it, for it is a lie. Refuse to be hypnotized by such propaganda. Affirm life, not death. Get a vision of yourself as happy, radiant, successful, serene, and powerful. Your mind does not grow old. Former President Herbert Hoover, now 88 years old, is very active and is performing monumental work. I interviewed him a few years ago in his suite at the Waldorf Astoria, New York City. I found him healthy, happy, vigorous, and full of life and enthusiasm. He was keeping several secretaries busy handling his correspondence and was himself writing books of a political and historical nature. Like all great men, I found him affable, genial, amiable, loving, and most understanding. His mental acumen and sagacity gave me the thrill of a lifetime. He is a deeply religious man and is full of faith in God and in the triumph of the eternal truth of life. He was subjected to a barrage of criticism and condemnation in the years of the Great Depression, but he weathered the storm and did not grow old in hatred, resentment, ill will, and bitterness. On the contrary, he went into the silence of his soul and communing with the divine presence within him, he found the peace which is the power at the heart of God. His mind active at 99. 
My father learned the French language at 65 years of age and became an authority on it at 70. He made a study of Gaelic when he was over 60 and became an acknowledged and famous teacher of the subject. He assisted my sister in a school of higher learning and continued to do so until he passed away at 99. His mind was as clear at 99 as it was when he was 20. Moreover, his handwriting and his reasoning powers had improved with age. Truly, you are as old as you think and feel. We need our senior citizens. Marcus Portius Cato, the Roman patriot, learned Greek at 80. Madame Ernestine Schumann Hank, the great German-American contralto, reached the pinnacle of her musical success after she became a grandmother. It is wonderful to behold the accomplishments of the oldsters. General Douglas MacArthur, Harry S. Truman, General Dwight David Eisenhower, and the American financier Bernard Barack are interesting, active, and contributing their talents and wisdom to the world. The Greek philosopher Socrates learned to play musical instruments when he was 80 years old. Michelangelo was painting his greatest canvases at 80. At 80, C.O. Simonides won the prize for poetry. Johann von Goethe finished Post, and Leopold von Rank commenced his History of the World, which he finished at 92. Alfred Tennyson wrote a magnificent poem, Crossing the Bar, at 83. Isaac Newton was hard at work close to 85. At 88, John Wesley was directing, preaching, and guiding Methodism. We have several men of 95 years who come to my lectures, and they tell me they are in better health now than they were at 20. Let us place our senior citizens in high places and give them every opportunity to bring forth the flowers of paradise. If you are retired, get interested in the laws of life and the wonders of your subconscious mind. Do something you have always wanted to do. Study new subjects and investigate new ideas. Pray as follows. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Psalm 42, 1. The Fruits of Old Age his flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. Job 33:25. Old age really means the contemplation of the truths of God from the highest standpoint. Realize that you are on an endless journey, a series of important steps in the ceaseless, tireless, endless ocean of life. Then, with the psalmist, you will say, They shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Psalm 92:14. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You are a son of infinite life, which knows no end, and you are a child of eternity.